Okay. Uh, I'm not sure about the acoustic here, so if a wave is you can't view me in the back. So the topic is equanimity in the time of turbulence. And we're very grateful for the government for providing. <laughs> There's a lot of uncertainty around economically, socio political situation, and of course, it's not just in this country, it's all over the place. Um, there's always people that we can blame, there's forces we can blame, but from the Buddhist point of view, the only thing to be blamed is ourselves for imagining that this world would be peaceful. If you imagine that samsara is going to be a safe, easy place, then you start from a very wrong assumption. We're born into a realm of turbulence, <coughs> where many factors are operating together, and we are part of that operation. And so, in the Buddhist tradition, you have these various <coughs> pathways of dealing with it. One is renunciation. Try to separate yourself from the turmoil of daily life, which is pretty difficult to do. Another would be to try to control yourself, to discipline your mind, and that's also pretty difficult to do. The danger with both is that they increase our sense of duality, our sense of separation from the environment around us whether you're withdrawing because you see the object as dangerous, the object is still dangerous, you're just not in touch with it. And if you try to discipline and control yourself, you find yourself <coughs> judging yourself, evaluating how you're doing, looking for signs of progress, and that keeps you in these waves of hopes and fears. So from the point of view of the Mahayana tradition, <coughs> broad tradition, which includes Tantra and Sokshen, we're more concerned to look at how our mind actually is, rather than to focus on the ever-changing content of the mind. Because even if you manage to stabilize your mind under certain circumstances, it lasts for a while. Impermanence applies not just to external factors in our environment, but to our internal situation as well. Our thoughts are always changing, our feelings are changing, the sensations in our body are changing. And to try to stabilize this requires a huge amount of effort for very little gain. And especially as we get older and you have more aches and pains in the body and gradual degeneration of the <coughs> naive assumption that all is well in this embodied being, uh, we see that we have very little control over ourselves. We have a body, but not really. The body has us. And if due to circumstances our body functions well, it's almost invisible. But when it starts to manifest sicknesses of various kinds, then we realize we are at the mercy of many, many forces. So this raises the central concern in Buddhism, who is the one who is at the mercy of old age, sickness, and death? Who is the one who suffers? So this is our function in pursuing a path of meditation to observe how tempting it is to fall asleep in the domain of assumptions, of cultural assumptions, family assumptions, and so on, and to try to wake up to see the actual processes of the weaving of our sense of self. That we construe ourselves, we bring ourselves together out of the interaction of many, many different factors. And if we can see that dynamic process, then we, given that the self manifests as particular patternings of ever-changing dynamic factors, see, it would be impossible for this self ever to be stable that the self is not a thing, it's a way of construing, of making sense, of interpreting our experience. So, who is the experiencer of the experience? 
This is what we want to find out. On the one hand, the simple answer is, I am the experiencer of my experience. Then we have to look, well, who is the one who calls themselves I? Who says, this is me? This is, the, if I say, I am talking, these are words in a sequence. The words come out of my mouth. This is dynamic. Then I stop talking. So what happens to the one who was talking? Then we have the one who is walking, the one who is sitting. Moment by moment in our lives, activity is arising, patterning is arising, <clears throat> and then passing. However, we are aware that there is continuity, that we are still here. We can remember being children. We think, well, I've always been here. So is that continuity on the basis of a, an internal self-substance which continues through time? Again, this is a function of meditation to observe. Is there any inner essence or nexus of ourself? Am I reliably me? <clears throat> or is the seeming reliability of my felt sense of self an interpretation in which I apprehend certain factors arising in the moment and take them to be signs of me? So this is me. And then, oh, now I'm somebody else. Now I'm something else. Now I'm something else. How amazing and exciting to be me. So different and somehow always the same. So that's why it's tricky. And that's why meditation is so important. Because if you try to pursue a path of analysis and just thinking about what is going on, one thought leads to another and seems to be linear, rational, and progressive, as if you are getting somewhere. But the thought vanishes, and the thought vanishes, and the thought vanishes. How could we build certainty on things which are ever-changing? This is why <clears throat> in the Buddhist tradition they say samsara is endless. It's endless because we are trying to do the impossible. We're trying to stabilize the unstable rather than seeking to open ourselves to that which is stable. And that's the basic mistake. That's what when the, <clears throat> the Buddha says, all suffering arises from ignorance and, and uh, thirst, tanha, hunger, grasping, holding on to things. The ignorance means to imagine that something is stably there as a true essence of myself, that there are real phenomena that exist, uh, whether you see that as a, as a person, a pudgala. We look around the room, we see people, and then we see iron railings, windows, and so on. So we see phenomena, dharmas. We think dharmas are real, people are real, animals, cats are real. When we start to examine that, we can see the falsity of it. But of course, that's a conclusion arrived at through patterning of thought. And we get a moment of clarity, which, because it's true to itself, lasts just for a moment. And then it's gone. And so you have to look again. And then it's gone. So clear, not clear, clear, not clear. Waves of the ocean. As long as you're relying on a conceptual elaboration, a construction of an interpretation, whatever point you arrive at rapidly becomes invalid. And you have to do it again. And that's what makes samsara endless. Because you're pursuing a path which cannot arrive at its goal. You cannot have simple consistent clarity that is at ease, that is restful, that is just there, if you're imagining that this clarity will be produced by thought, or produced by feeling, or produced by sensation. So the normal ingredients, the usual factors of our experience that we construe, that we gather together and construct our felt sense of self out, <clears throat> they're not bad or wrong, 
It's just that the project is not very useful. The project is doomed from the start because it's asking the ingredients to produce something they can't produce. You can believe that it's possible. If you're with small children, <coughs> you could have a little tea party and you could have little cups and you could imagine little cakes and you could say, would you like some more tea? And it's very nice to do that with children. <coughs> You feel hungry afterwards because there wasn't anything to eat and there wasn't anything to drink, but you could imagine it being the case. We imagine our way into reading novels or watching films. We imagine our way into walking about and thinking we're in Macclesfield. Macclesfield is an act of the imagination. Macclesfield is not self-existing. Macclesfield reveals itself through your mode of participation. And if you live in this town, you will know a lot which will support you in the facility, the ease by which you participate in your fantasy that Macclesfield exists in itself. But Macclesfield is a revelation. Every place is a revelation. Every person is a revelation. And it's revealed through the, our mind. So our mind has various aspects. The mind is open, it's a basic clarity, but the mind is, and in that openness it's empty of inherent content. The mind has no content of its own. This emptiness allows the ceaseless flow of content to arise in our mind. Since we woke up this morning we had so many experiences. They couldn't have come if the other ones hadn't gone. So we are filling and emptying, filling and emptying, moment by moment. And as this emptying occurs, there's a little bit of space. But when we are fixated on the content, we immediately apprehend something else and apprehend something else. So it's as if we're on the beat of the manifestation of somethingness without recognizing that we are the ones who create the mood of somethingness. If you live, if Macclesfield is your town, when you walk around, you can remember going to school, you can remember people who've lived here. The, the air is thick with your possibility of projecting Macclesfieldness into Macclesfield. And if you're a transient visitor and you walk around, you see bricks and things, and these are old buildings, and these are new buildings, <coughs> your connection is much thinner. It's more transparent. It's just a place. The world's full of places. It's in these moments <coughs> that uh, we can really start to see how our mind is, is operating. This is why the basic orientation in Buddhism about renunciation, which is when the First, monks and nuns around the Buddha were set to wander. They were wandering people. And the advantage of travel and, and wandering is that you, you don't know what's going on. And then you realize the world doesn't need my thoughts. And that when I have thoughts about a place, when I know about what's going on here, I see less of what's here. If this is your hometown, when you walk around, you're probably going to be less surprised than people who are here for the first time. Because you walk down these little streets and think, whoa, okay. We don't know. Something's there. Once you know and your knowledge precedes you, <clears throat> you're projecting meaning into the situation, which on one level feels like a clarification. You feel like you're unveiling the true life of Macclesfield. But it's more opaque. It's solidified. It becomes dense with your interpretation, with your habit formation. And it becomes your hometown, the familiar. In the familiar is a kind of blindness. So again, the function of meditation, and we'll do quite a lot of meditation in these days, is to try to disentangle 
our desire for merging in the content of our mind so that we can become more aware of its transient nature and more aware of what we do with the content of our mind, how we use it as our method of filtering our experience, evaluating our experience, and editing our experience so that we highlight the things that we like and we tend to attend less to the factors we don't like unless we're people who enjoy worrying in which case things that don't go well are very very precious to us because if you can always have something to worry about then you it's quite a nice way to spend your days being anxious about your children, anxious about your grandchildren, anxious about your health, your partner's health. There's always something to worry about. It gives you an identity. So whether things are good or bad, the ego finds a way to milk some kind of meaning or sense out of it. But from the point of view of meditation, this capacity that we have to give ourselves into the content of the mind, as if this was the site of true value, this habit and this capacity is quite dangerous because there's always something to be merged in. There's always something. We never have peace. There's I something. Always this and then this and then this. And because of this confluence, this merging into <clears throat> <clears throat> the situation where subject and object become merged, we have this lack of transparency. We don't see through the phenomena, but we get blocked by the seeming truth and reality of the forms which we experience because we interpret them in that way. So Buddhism is always turning us back to the mind, if the world is our interpretation, who is the one who is interpreting? So we always have two choices. One is to focus on the content of the mind, the content of our experience, and to try to improve it. And the other is to look in a different way at what is the experience of revelation? What is this knowingness? Knowingness in its uh, simplicity is often described as wisdom or insight. It sees the truth of what is arising. It sees the truth of the impermanence of phenomena. But if you focus your attention on the content of your experience, because thoughts are very sticky, they're like sticky, sticky rice, it's a sort of glutinative effect, then thought after thought, feeling, they all merge into a seeming dense <clears throat> somethingness of experience and then there is no insight there is a kind of outside that we our attention is focused on the things including ourselves we th we can think about ourselves as if we were a thing we can like ourselves or not like ourselves criticize ourselves praise ourselves just as you would a cup of coffee so the self as an object the self as a subject both are mental formations. We have no access to the world of objects because the object is always revealed to us through our subjectivity. This is why in Buddhism they suggest if you awaken to your mind, everything goes free. The texts very often say, if you get this one point, everything goes free. Everything goes free because you realize, oh, Everything is experience. Who is the experiencer? Then you look and you find, how is the mind? And then the openness of the mind and the openness of the field of experience come together. So that instead of subject and object merging, you have wisdom, which is to see the emptiness of things, and compassion, which is uh, engagement without... Uh, blindness, which is the possibility of relating in the world to people, to be close to them, to have, be intimate, to be concerned, but without being trapped. 
compassion, from the Buddhist point of view, operates in the manner of a dream. Probably we all, in, everyone in this room has some, some people in your life that you're a bit concerned about. They could be aging parents, or children, relatives. What does it mean to be concerned about someone? Kind of worry, you know, we think about them. How are they doing? I wish that life was different for them. I wish life was better or easier. And you can feel in your body what's that, what that's like. It's a kind of constriction. It's a kind of tensing up. That's what concern does. Does that tensing up help us to be available to these people? Because it's starting to generate an agenda in me that I would like you to be in a happier relationship. So, what can I do? I tell you that. Is that helpful? Probably not. So, now you've got a shitty relationship and you've got the burden of my concern for your shitty relationship. <clears throat> so, sharing concern is probably not a form of compassion. It's a form of blindness. So, how should we relate to people? Maybe we should try to see them rather than think about them. If we let people reveal themselves as they are in the moment, we can find a way of relating to that, to the unfolding of their lived experience, rather than approaching them through the, the lens, the probably distorting lens, of our imagining about who they are, our mental con construct of who they are. And the more we know someone, the thicker our uh, opaque screen is. As, it's like if you had a, a camera lens and you put a thin layer of Vaseline on, then you thicken it up and thicken it up, it becomes very, very hazy. So the more we know about people, the more we worry about them, the more we think about them, there's a <coughs> we think we're getting a knowledge of them, but what we've got is more knowledge of the content of our mind, our construct of them. And we know that uh, when parents do that to us when we're children, it's really, really annoying. We are not who our parents think we are. They think they know us, but this is not true. And so many children go out of their way to show their parents that who you think I am is not at all who I am. So I'm going to nick something from the shops and then the police will come round and they will knock on the door and tell you that your lovely child is a thief. See, fuck you. Because that's you know very often how child, children are trying to say, don't put me in this box, don't put me in the wrapper of your assumptions about who I am. Because we all have a lot of potential. And how can that potential manifest in a healthy way. So from the Buddhist point of view, the openness of the mind gives us the greatest access to the potential of the mind, which then lets us respond to different people in different situations in different ways. That we are not a fixed entity and neither are they. So that what we call knowledge of the other or knowledge of oneself is not helpful if it's concerned with a, a kind of content which becomes definitional, where I think I can predict how you're going to be. That, that then becomes a great foreclosure. We're locked into some image of ourselves. So that's why stepping out of that is useful. So the first practice we do is <clears throat> one many of you are very familiar with, basic shamatha or shine, which means to become peaceful, to stay quietly, which means not to be disturbed by the flow of the content of our mind. Very often we don't know that there is a content of our mind or there is a stream of experience because we are so identified with it that whatever is occurring feels like me. So this is just how I am. So <clears throat> to do the practice, uh, we sit in a comfortable way with our spine supporting our weight, particularly the weight of our heads. You want to balance your head so that you're not 
the muscles in the neck are not being strained, breathing easily through the diaphragm. Uh, our head is slightly tilted down, the gaze is down the line of the nose, the tongue is on the hard upper palate, shoulders are open and relaxed, hands are usually in the lap, right hand on top of the left. So when, you, when the gaze is down the line of the nose, we're not staring at the, the marks on the floor. The, it's just to uh, allow the, the light to come in through the eye that keeps a, a basic uh, wakeful attention. And then we bring the focus of our attention onto the sensation at our nostrils with the air going in and out. The importance of this is that the air is always moving. Breathing is activity, it's dynamic. So we have an object which is there in terms of sensation, but it's, the sensation is generated by movement. You can also do this practice fixing on a small disc, painted mud, or put it on a stick, or a, or a letter, or a statue of the Buddha, or a plain stone. <clears throat> and there are many objects you can use to stabilize your attention. But the benefit of the breath is it's ungraspable. <clears throat> and you can't think about the breath. Sensation is very, very helpful for meditators because sensation is completely ungraspable. If you run your finger down your arm, something is arising, arising and passing. You can't say what that sensation is. It's just undeniable and ungraspable and inexpressible. So to, to focus on the sensation at the nostrils is very useful because it means that we have to be light and fresh to be there with that sensation. You can't kind of fall asleep on the job. You can't do this on automatic pilot. You have to be there with it. So we find that difficult because we're used to being carried away by our tendency to merge in the thoughts, feelings, and sensations which are coming and going. We lose ourselves into the flow of our dualistic experience. We think, oh, I know what's going on, <clears throat> but that's a, that's a comment on it. We think about life. We talk about life. But to be simply alive and present gives us nothing to talk about. There's nothing to say about this kind of meditation practice. What you can talk about is how you can't do the meditation practice. You can talk about being distracted, being lost, being tired, being angry. That's something to talk about. But actually staying present on the sensation, silence. So that's what we want, is to come back to this place of peaceful, open silence. And the more we have a, a sense of that, the more noisy, the more disturbing becomes the experience of being distracted. We really think, oh, I'm getting lost. Now, at first, when we do the practice, we're used to being lost. We like being lost because being lost is the confirmation that I exist as me. I am who I am because of the f my familiarity with my own particular patterns of lostness, the kind of thoughts I entertain, sensations in my body and so on. So this practice, although it's very simple, is a way of radically shifting the modality of our self-experience, the paradigm through which we experience being alive. I'm now just with this sensation. My attention is on the ungraspable. And then some thought is there and we can grasp onto the thought and we go off. And we are not with the breath. But as soon as we realize that, without any negative thoughts, without any conclusions or definitions of ourselves, we very gently bring ourselves back to the sensation. Any thoughts or questions about that before we begin? Okay, let's do that for a while.
Okay. <coughs> so there are many styles of sitting practice. In many traditions, people sit for very long periods of time. In the tradition that I uh, belong to, we don't do that so much because uh, a lot of meditation is formulates around struggle, struggle to control the mind or direct the mind. And struggle is by definition uh, dualistic. I am struggling with myself, I am struggling with my habits. And the danger is that it you know, points to a path of mastery, that you should be the master of your mind and in charge of your mind. And who is the one who is going to be in charge of your mind? Your ego. So it's very difficult to transcend the ego with this notion of mastery. Masters, uh, what would it mean to be a master of oneself? We don't know what's going to happen. Nobody knows what's going to happen. So we don't, we're not masters of the future. We're not masters of the past because we have selective memories. And we're not masters of the present because we wander around in a vulnerable body. So the whole cult of mastery which pervades many forms of Buddhism is unhelpful. You can be a master of something. You can be a master carpenter. You can be a master baker. And you could be a master of the techniques of Buddhism. But technique is not really what we're concerned about. We're concerned about being present. So how could you have mastery of presence when you are not present? Presence shows you you as a transient patterning of energy within presence. The question is ownership. So in Buddhism they talk about attachment, ahamkara or dakzin. So dak means a self. Jin means to hold. We take hold of ourselves. We apprehend ourselves. I am good at meditation. I am not good at meditation. This is a set of statements. These are conclusions. I have got hold of something. It's always a lie. I'm good at meditation today. Tomorrow, we don't know. Who has a stable mind? The mind is unstable. The mind is unstable. Is that a problem? Only if you believe that it's stable. If the mind was stable, you wouldn't be able to talk. Because when you talk, different things are occurring. If different things are occurring, it means there is movement. If there is movement, it's not stable. Mastery is a delusion. Mastery means to be in charge. Who is in charge? Nobody's in charge because there's nobody. This is the emptiness of the self. So we have to be a little bit careful because cultural formations which say, oh, the Lama knows this or the great bhikkhu knows this, maybe that's just kind of reassuring. My dad's really strong. My mom's the best cook. My guru knows everything. This is story time. If you look at your mind, you realize that all these stories are only stories. These are constructions. There's no end to storytelling. There's no end to construction. What we need is to give ourselves to experience <clears throat> and try to see the nature of experience what is occurring so when we do this sitting practice and our mind wanders off although the basic form of this meditation is not to be at all concerned with where the mind has wandered but to just very gently bring it back onto the object of attention this sensation at the nostrils If we relax a little bit and allow the fact that there is sometimes focus 
and sometimes no focus. Sometimes I'm here, sometimes I'm lost. Both of these are experiences which arise. Both are the potential of the mind to be focused and then to be gone. Now, if we say focused is good and gone is bad, we want more of the good and we want less of the bad. That means no equanimity. Equanimity means even. Both are okay. But they're not okay because I want to be very clear. I don't want to be lost. If I don't mind being lost, why am I here in this room? I've come here to practice more being here. But you are here. You're here lost. Wherever you go, your lostness goes with you. So can you see, it's a slightly different orientation. Our focus is inclusivity. If you have exclusivity, then you say, I am a man, I am not a woman. Being male excludes being female. So we have category. If I'm drinking coffee, I'm not drinking tea because coffee is not tea. These are two different things. The fact that the cup has coffee in it means there is an exclusion of all the many kinds of tea from my cup. My cup is a coffee only zone. Please do not introduce tea into this. So that's what exclusion means. So, the point of the, I mean, the basic direction that we're going in, of course, is always Dzogchen, which means like the great completion, or you could say the great inclusion. And when you have inclusion, everything's on the inside. There's no inside and outside. And if there's no inside and outside, there's no need to judge. And if there's no need to judge, then you don't have good and bad, high and low, and all the many polarities. And we'll slowly move in that direction. So it's very important not to be harsh towards yourself. Because when you become harsh and critical towards yourself or towards other people, what I think you will find if you observe yourself in that moment is that you have taken up a position. You have a set of criteria for evaluation. You know that this is good and that's not so good. However, things are what they are. This is how it is. So if you stay with how it is, all you can say is, well, this is how it is. But if you take up a position and you start to think, what is this? Then you have objectification, reification, a kind of solidification of the arising experience into a formation that it is something. Then that somethingness can be pulled into comparing and contrasting with other somethingnesses. And then we say, this is better than that. I'm happy with this, I'm not happy with that. This and that. That's duality. Why is duality bad? because it's exclusive. You cannot have something whole and something left out. Most religions move in the direction of inclusion. So you have this parable in the Bible about the shepherd who gathers all his flocks inside the compound and he realizes that one is missing and he goes out to find that lost sheep because all the sheep must be there. All the thoughts must be there. All the feelings must be there. Now, if your mind is like a, a bunch of sheep, some of the sheep are white, some are black. Some of the white sheep have black faces. You get many kinds of sheep. So you have happy thoughts and sad thoughts. You have egocentric thoughts and generous thoughts. Is one thought better than another? Only in its whatness. 
when your focus is on the content and that's important for engaging in this world but we also have the thought as a process the thought comes and goes it's there and gone so in its evanescence how can you say this is better than that you can't catch it if you can't catch it how are you going to compare it if you go to the sea and you watch the waves rippling along ceaselessly 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 this wave's better than that one on the basis of what oh I'm a surfer I like big waves this is a good wave for me if you're not a surfer why is one wave better than another it's just waves the wave becomes better because of your agenda because I am a surfer this is a good wave it's a good wave for surfers or this surfer but it's not intrinsically a good wave ah so maybe the thoughts that I like are good thoughts for me because of my agenda because of my way of discriminating because of my prejudice well that doesn't sound so nice but I am prejudicial I say this is good this is bad on what basis I like this and I don't like that so the center of the world is me maybe that's not so surprising for us we may be reasonably honest people it's all about me it's always all about me you can't go shopping without it being about you you look at the, the goods in the shop the clothes the shoes whatever it is and it's about you I was very happy this morning because I saw that there's an old-fashioned um, shoe repair shop and I wanted to buy some laces for my boots and I went in and this this shoemaker is fantastic he is really really a shoemaker it's all he's done in his life he really knows about it he said every pair of shoes I repair I repair it as if it's my own which is a man of great dignity anyway he had a little case with many many kind of laces inside so he got out his measuring tape to show me the different possibilities of the of the laces and so on and I chose some laces on the basis of my boots there are many laces there all of them are perfect as laces for someone else's shoes but my boots require laces of a particular length we are always self-referential in our embodiment whether it's our clothing or our food or the kind of mattress we like this is relating to our constellation the particular patterning of ourself and of course that changes over time but if we can see that we see that my embodied being brings me into an editing relationship with the world this has value for me this has no value for me so the great potential of the world when I engage with it through this prism of myself especially my ideas about who I am my memories about who I am my notion about who I am gives me a very biased take immediately many things are not for me so I went into Marks and Spencer's yesterday the front of the shop is full of women's clothes because I have no tendency to transvesticism I'm not very interested in buying women's clothes what would I do with them but the women are looking at the women's clothes it's like that irrelevant for me not, not for me so uh, then we see oh but maybe we could just be interested in the colors and the shapes so women's fashions are quite interesting so you can see the particular patterning that they're doing the kind of cutting Marks and Spencer clothes are fairly predictable in the kind of line that they do and so on they have a particular price range they aim for they're not wanting to be too startling but not too dowdy either so there's kind of middle of the road and your eye can track all these things 
so we can see the clothes in themselves as shape, color, texture and so on or we can see them as for me so in terms of shape and color this is how they are in terms of what they are we're immediately taking it more in relation to ourselves does that make sense? because that's quite an important thing that if we can relax our self-referential fixation we are returned to the phenomena in themselves the phenomena just as phenomena and at that point everything is interesting because everything is just shape and color smell, texture and so through the five senses we have a relationship with everything but as soon as we go into a kind of judgment which is based on our position then it's more difficult so you might have a buy a, a little house and then somebody op wants to open a nightclub next to your house the nightclub might be quite nice might play nice music but you would prefer it not in my backyard because it will be disturbing for me so the fact that the nightclub is an interesting place a good venue for music is wonderful but please put it somewhere else so I can go there and enjoy it but I don't have it every night bang 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 through my wall so there we see how oh, liking and not liking Brexit yes Brexit no hopes and fears these are all based on people's positions and agendas and you see how difficult it is to negotiate around Brexit because it's not a flat open rational playing field there's almost no discussion in detail of the implications of this decision it's all fantasy and projection liking and not liking and you watch the news for a bit and your mind starts reeling around just you want to say shut the fuck up you know do your homework before putting your hand up in the class who are these people god was there ever so much wanking it's a really non-productive but it shows us the truth of the human situation we are all intoxicated by ideas so the, again the function of meditation is to give us the space whereby we see an idea is an idea and therefore the question is not to say no completely to ideas no concepts that would be an, an extreme view and in Buddhism we don't like extreme views or the other extreme of that would say always concepts all we have is concepts we need better concepts that would again be an extreme view we want the middle view that says use concepts when concepts are required and when concepts are not required please don't use them so the mind can be peaceful relaxed and open and mobilize as required this is the beginning of freedom because if you are habitually over involved if you feel it's necessary to wander after every thought every stimulus which arises you're just a puppet and if you go to the other extreme and say I want complete silence and isolation I want to be uninvolved you may be very peaceful but you're completely useless so the middle way is to have wisdom which is to see the space the openness the relaxation the clarity and compassion which allows you to be connected to be in interplay with other people to receive and to respond but without getting lost so this is the two things that we try to bring together not either or but both and simultaneously so that we have calm a calm which promotes clarity and we have warmth we have responsivity otherwise life would be very deadly so we know about being involved being caught up in things going round and round the first stage is to get a little bit of separation but separation is not the goal because integration is how it is so if you separate too much you lose the the felt sense of inclusion but merging and separation are two extreme polarities which disguise 
the open space in the middle which is the space of integrity of the always already integrated the inclusive so the reason we're doing this practice this basic sitting practice is so that we start to we start to see the huge resources which move through us all the time that we can be kind that we can be selfish that we can be altruistic in our thoughts we can be completely self-referential we have a huge range of thoughts arising in us oh these are tools these are skills these are modalities of manifestation because you might be sitting in the meditation suddenly remember oh I haven't spoken with Joan for a long time I wonder how she is so that might be a very kind thought then afterwards in the break you phone her up and you say hey listen sweetie how are you doing and she says oh it's very painful that's a compassionate connective thought it might be a, a good human thing to do it's not exactly enlightened but it's warm and friendly and supportive therefore thoughts of connectivity are certainly something we wouldn't want to have but if you keep in the meditation if you keep thinking oh I have to phone Joan what was last time I talked to her da 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 and you start to elaborate many many thoughts then it's not very helpful because you're now not here you're in the past remembering the last conversation you're jumping into the future thinking a lot about where you have to do where you have to be and you're not exactly precisely simply here so it's it's not about blocking the thoughts it's not being the servant or the slave of the thought but also not trying to be the master of the thought because that would again bring it back to me the thing is that our resources are about connectivity we speak with other people to other people when you go out to the shops you're thinking oh I need to buy some cheese but what you're doing is you're giving money to the person who runs the shop because they have cheese in the shop because they've ordered this particular kind of cheese from the cheese maker and so the cheese maker now is getting some money back so they can buy in more milk or they can employ someone to help develop their cheese making and so on what you're doing in commerce is participating in a network of cause and effect it is the integrated field of experience of dependent co-origination that everything manifests together with the other so I'm buying cheese because I want cheese we can take that thought which of course is my motive for going to buy the cheese but it also is niched within this wider framework of connectivity on the basis of people making cheese I'm able to buy cheese so when I buy cheese if I hold in mind thank you to the people who made the cheese so that gratitude helps to open up the bubble of self-reference and I become aware of the people who make my shoes, who make my clothes, who drive the trains that will take me, brought me here and will take me back to London. That my life is always connected with other people. And therefore, I need to work out how to be with other people. So who is the one who is going to be with other people? That's the inquiry of wisdom, to, to try to find what is the self? Is there a self? How is my mind? And the other aspect is I exist in interconnectivity. I am interdependent with other people's lives and that's the domain of compassion. And these two need to be brought together. So again and again we're increasing our, the brightness of our mind on a general level by curiosity. Isn't it amazing? this building it's been refurbished and they've spent a lot of time and energy and money on it they've repainted the, this old cast iron really nicely and so on and there's already a, some water leakage it looks like in through the ceiling these things happen you repair and then you despair because <laughs> buildings are never completed for long 
they always need repainting or this goes wrong or that goes wrong and that's how it is but we can be attentive to the details of existence which again is a way of taking us out of the bubble of self-reference so that we can be surprised so that even if Macclesfield is your hometown you can see it with fresh eyes every day fresh is good we like fresh food why wouldn't we want to have fresh ears fresh nostrils fresh eyes fresh sensation the world is alive we have this miracle of snowdrops the crocuses it's fantastic the world is the earth is shining out well we know that every year it's the same ah but this one this one <coughs> how is it it's, it's amazing you can't say this amazement is freely available so this is a major part of our awakening and bringing us to equanimity because if we can give <coughs> excuse me if we can give our attention to how things are then we see the ugly and we see the beautiful at that point we say yes but the beauty is much nicer for me than the ugliness now I'm in prejudice what is the ugly? It's an experience. What is beauty? It's an experience. What is pain? It's an experience. What is sickness? It's an experience. What is health? What is vigor? These are all experiences. So it's very helpful when we have fluctuations of experience to see, oh, what's being revealed to me is my prejudice, my bias, that I want to be selective I want only the good, only the nice, and I don't want any of the nasty. There's a lot of nasty around. So I've constantly got to be sifting out the wheat from the chaff. Both are useful. The chaff, you can use it to, to light the fire, you can put it into pillows, you can, there are also things you can do with chaff you can use it for polishing it's quite abrasive as a, as a surface but if you only think the wheat is good and you throw the chaff away now we have all these problems with recycling trying to encourage people there's something to be done with the things you don't want old clothes they're saying tons and tons millions of tons of old clothes are being thrown away when I was a kid your shirt's old your mother gets the scissors out and now we've got a little polishing cloth everything was recycled because everything had value because people could see the value in it that is to say oh what is this mm -mm, it's an old shirt it doesn't get any further than that it's a worn out shirt get rid of it how is it oh it's cloth it's quite soft now because it's been washed many times what could I use it for for polishing or drying it's all kind of functions you can give to it if you see how it is so this is essential thing if you sit inside your assumptions the world gets dried and hard and limited and if you soften the assumption by going through the directness of the senses then something which looks ugly can also look interesting as a basis of modern art so many modern artists are concerned with ugliness because it's also an aesthetic experience this is something oh let's attend to it ugly colors ugly shapes ugly images we stay with the ugliness with the sadness at the end of the road there there's this amazing memorial probably from the first world war uh, beautiful beautiful image this sad figure and on the top and then there's a, a soldier a dead one and someone putting uh, crown a laurel wreath down for their head honoring the dead it's very very poignant it's very very poignant and it, it's it's shocking when we see something like that it's really shocking thing. all these people died for war they died it says on these kind of places it says they died to give us freedom what am I doing with my freedom they're dead I've got a life what is it what does it mean to be alive anything can be a reminder to waken you up anything 
an old building, rubbish thrown away. Anything, anything will bring, make you fresh if you see with fresh eyes. So this is why we do the meditation practice. It's not just to calm the mind, but it's to refresh the mind. So maybe we have a refreshing cup of tea. Okay, I'll just say a little bit more about some of the background idea and then we'll do some more of that practice. So in the uh, Theravadan tradition, uh, there's quite an emphasis on the five skandhas, or the five heaps, the five components of what make up a sentient being. And this analysis of the, the five components is used as the means of deconstructing the idea of inherent existence in the person. So we look around the room and we see people and then we can consider what, what is the basis for my thinking this is a woman. So the first of these uh, skandhas is um, form, that is to say something is there. And this manifests in terms of shape and color. So I see a shape and a color. Secondly, I have <clears throat> basic feeling tone response, which is positive, negative, or neutral. So I can really like the person or not like them, or they're just a person. That, of course, is quite important in terms of hooking my interest, because if you really like someone or you really don't like them, you probably pay them more attention, but if, you, if you're kind of indifferent, they don't get so much attention. So on the basis of how my, uh, the, the feeling tone that I have to that shape and color, I then have an interpretive perception. Um, I'm gathering features in the experiential world and mixing them with my own likes and dislikes. So the, the form was what is out there and then the feeling tone is on the subject. So this third one is where the subject and object start to merge together. So now I can say, oh she is she is. So it looks as if what I'm feeling is an accurate account of who is there. Then the fourth uh, level, you know, the samskara, it means the, the associations or the elaborations or the conceptual interpretation means that memories arise. Uh, you might think of what purpose could I have for this person. Uh, how will I, um, you know, what, what more rounded picture do I have of them? And then fifthly, you have uh, what's usually translated as consciousness, which indicates seeing, seeing something. So in, in Tibetan, it's a nampa shepa. Nampa means like a form so, <coughs> or, a, or a formation. So it's seeing the formation. It's essentially coming to a conclusion. So we see someone says, oh, I've met you before. So you go, oh, now I know where I am. Oh, I, last time we talked about this. So that conclusion creates a sort of solidification. You've come to the end of the process. You've arrived at something. And these five happen very quickly. So now I think, oh, I've met this woman before. So there's a definite knowledge which has brought up some memories, some attitudes, and so on. I'm getting clearer about who she is by not attending to her. Does that make sense? 
my attention has gone more into me to my assumptions and memories and so on so my conclusion is really a conclusion about me not about the person so that's that's our ordinary consciousness it's a way of stabilizing and confirming my capacity to see the world as meaningful and so I'm sitting in the domain of my interpretation so if we go back to the first one <clears throat> shape and color that's where it's fresh because that's where there is the least of me each of these other four steps is adding more of me more of me so here is oh and now add four one part her four parts me and what do we get I know who you are <laughs> Which, of course, is more truly, I know who I think you are. But, of course, you are not who I think you are. But you are who I think you are for me. And please don't disturb. Because I, it's quite nice for me to feel that I know who you are. So we all want object constancy. Because that gives us the, the fantasy we can predict the world and we can know what's going on. And the way I achieve that is to think about you but not attend to you because if I attend to you the movement of how you are will disturb my idea of what you are or who you are does that make sense which brings us back to the meditation <clears throat> in the meditation we're trying to stay with the howness you know the breath is going in and out sensation is arising so how is it? Well, I've got to be there to let it be revealed to me. Life as revelation requires a recipient of the revelation. If life is a gift, something given, we have to be able to receive it. Now, if I put my hands out and they're full of my thoughts, there's not much space for me to receive the world. So if I empty my hands, I can get more. If I empty my mind, I get more of how it is and less of how I am. Does that make sense? Which is why in meditation we are concerned with the aesthetics of existence, with the world as revealed through our senses rather than the world as imagined. There's nothing wrong with the imagination when it's applied, when it's useful to be imagining. But if you're imagining who other people are and then you're holding on to your image of them and not being able to revise it in the face of the facts, then it's quite difficult. Brexit means Brexit. That's an idea. That's an idea. The people have decided. Well, from a Buddhist point of view, on the basis of causes and conditions at a certain time, a small majority of the British people voted in favor of Brexit. Since that time, a lot more information has arisen which might put into question the wiseness of proceeding in this direction. But Brexit means Brexit. So all the process is about maintaining the truth of the conclusion of the outcome of the referendum. No further information should cause us to modify the decision because we're hanging on to what has been decided. So that's a very helpful way of perceiving what we do ourselves. We get hold of the world in a particular way. We come to a conclusion about people, about our children, about work, about politics, about environmental change. And we sit with our conclusion. <clears throat> and we see the people who disagree with our conclusion as the enemy. And we say, therefore, want to hang out with people who agree with us, who have become our friends. So now we've got a, f a splitting into friend and enemy. And there we're living in this world of conceptual elaboration. So what we're doing in the practice is to come back to the senses. We have sensation. It's not so much shape and color but if, if you thought of it in the I mean shape and color is talking about sensation through the eye so sensation at the nostril is just this because even if you say shape and color 
well, let's stay with that visual thing. So, if I hold up my hand, you can see the shape and color of my hand. What color is it? You have to think. You have to give color to my hand. Because the color that you see is the color that you interpret. And we know that people, some people have so-called color blindness. They highlight certain features in the, in the color spectrum and others are, are more dulled. And the shape then would depend on how you identify. You think, oh, this is a hand. I'm seeing a hand. That's an interpretation. So what is the shape of what you are looking at? It's like maybe a very bumpy mountain peak. or But that's again an idea. So what shape is it if you don't think what shape is it, it is? can't speak. You see, it's, it's manifest, it's here in front of you, you are receiving the shape, but if you don't shape your mind, your mind goes empty. When there's nothing to think about, oh, like sometimes if you're out in the country and you suddenly there's a beautiful view and you're just, oh, just looking. And all of that vista <clears throat> comes into you, comes available to you because you have opened to receive it. Because you are empty. When you are empty, you get more. When you are full, you get less. But usually we think, I have to be full because I have to make sense of what's going on. Now, of course, there is a time for processing the world, for analyzing, for distilling, but probably 5% of the time. When you be, are overactive in that, when you're always making sense of what's going on, the space of receptivity goes right down. So, in the practice, what we're doing is we're practicing receptivity. Sensation is coming here at the nostrils. I have been delegated by all the Buddhas of the three times to head the reception committee for the sensation. It's a very important task. All the Buddhas are saying, it's up to you, please. Don't be distracted. Welcome the sensation. The sensation is offering itself to you. The breath is going out of your body in order to create the sensation. The breath is sacrificing itself, dissolving itself in the great wind of time. Blown away. This one moment of sensation is given to you. And where are you? Thinking about something else? I have to tell you, this is very, very rude. This is very rude. The breath has come from very far. Look, it came from outside, went in, went all around, going into the bloodstream, everywhere in the body. <gasps> no! It's coming out, and in a brief, brief microsecond, it's giving itself to you. And you? You don't care. You sad, sick people. If the breath wasn't there, you'd be dead. And the breath is giving you sensation, and it's quite nice to have sensations. So you're getting two good things. You're staying alive and something's happening. So that's what we're going to do. We're just going to give ourselves to the sensation. What could be better than this? Oh, some habitual thoughts. Something I've thought about before. Something stale and old and unhelpful. But it is helpful because it helps me be me. It answers the question, who am I? I'm the one who has this kind of thought. I'm the one who can't meditate. I'm the one who's sort of interested in Buddhism, but not really, actually, most of the time, because I'd rather watch the telly and gossip with my friends and maybe do a bit of baking and go out in the garden, because garden's quite nice. And when I'm doing the gardening, and my mind's just sort of remembering lots of things, thoughts come and go. And 
that's my that's my life and it's been like that for a long time cloudy vague hazy drifting and death is coming I don't want to know that I think I'll just dither some more dithering's good dithering and blethering what better way to spend your life so this is generally this is what we do but from a Dharma point of view there's other things to be discovered I'd like to have more freshness I don't want my life to be covered over by assumptions predictions mental constructions so this very simple practice is very helpful because if we want to have equanimity we have to find a place of balance in ourselves which is not drawn towards liking and disliking so you can see how the second skanda as soon as it comes in positive negative neutral but the neutral is not a harmonious equipoise it's a kind of indifference it's a sort of dull non-registering so that's not a great place to be but then if things are registering they're either I like or I don't like positive negative positive negative in the object and positive negative in my response so we're now starting to pulsate but it's not an even attention because we want to give more attention to the good and less to the bad so to free ourselves from this entrainment into I have to look after myself I cannot survive too much bad I need good I need nice things otherwise what's the point of being alive that's the very understandable position which arises <coughs> once you see yourself as a vulnerable person open to hopes and fears to joy and sadness and I want more joy and less sadness I want the fulfillment of my hopes I don't want the activation of my fears and therefore I'm going to be pulled into endless selectivity inside my mind and my feelings in terms of how I operate in the world with other people that is to say I'm trapped in interaction trying to get the best deal for myself and maybe for the people I care about but if we go back to this first point shape and color or pure sensation or pure sound it's just this if you hear a sound like a car or there's a church bell or something like that if you don't think church bell you just have reverberation or a car's going or a plane or a dog barking if you hear sound as sound in its simplicity it's very freshening so we know what it's like if you're out in the country and you hear the wind blowing through the trees and there's that sowing noise that sighing you just hear that oh, oh. because you're giving yourself the chance in that moment to hear sound as sound there's nothing to do with it so you don't have to interpret it or construe it it's just but then we think oh no but there's a dog barking or people are talking or what are they saying why do they make so much noise most sounds once you can put a wrap around it and apprehend it you start to you know you're you're stuck in me in relation to that sound and so you're not receiving sound as sound or sensation as sensation or light or color so on a day like this when the sun shining it's very nice you go outside you stand in the sun and you feel this warmth and then you, you go into the shadow and you feel cold and you can feel directly how you want more of one and not of the other and you go back and just relax oh I'm cold oh, this is cold I got it. this is warmth when it's warm you notice there's a relaxation when it's cold there's a kind of tensing up 
You don't need to have any good or bad or I like or I don't like or oh, thank God it's spring and summer will come. None of that. It's just, oh, it's like this. How is it? It's like this. You don't need elaboration. So this is what we're trying to do is to take off, off this unnecessary covering, this unnecessary set of identifications so that the freshness can refresh us. Because to be fresh in the world, to be full of surprise and awe and wonder in every situation, whether it's going to the dentist or doing your tax return, whatever it is, this is just a, a rising and passing, a rising and passing. It's the narrative that makes us stupid from the point of view of wisdom, but it's the narrative that makes us intelligence, intelligent from the point of view of surviving in the world. It's not an either-or situation. Clearly, we need to survive in the world. You need to do things like tax returns and all sorts of life survival things. But we don't need to spend much time doing them. If you just do them, they're done very quickly. It's the thoughts about them. Why should I? I don't have to. This is awful. I hate doing this. What? Where does I hate doing it come from? You just do it. You just do it. You have a bath, you clean the bath. Oh, I hate cleaning the bath. This is an unnecessary thought, which then makes it so much more difficult to do it. I hate doing that. It's awful. It's terrible. Really? Oh, God, every time I have to do that. <laughs> Moaning, gurning. What a way to live. Actually, it's just this. And how is it? What is it? It's awful. How is it? Oh, it's not a big difference between these two words, what and how. But if you turn to the how, it's fresh. You turn to the what and it's stale. So, let's do a bit more of the sitting. And so you can add a little bit of um, warmth into it by thinking... Okay, I'm now going to sit and let my breath refresh me. My breath is going to welcome me back, back to being here and not going anywhere else. So if I give myself to the sensation, the sensation will return me to me. And if I give myself to the thought, the thought will take me far away from me. It will take me into constructions about me. And about is never the same as me. It's always a parallel universe. So we want to leave that and just be here. So, <coughs> what we were doing this morning was... <coughs> developing more sense of impermanence that all phenomena are impermanent because what were called <laughs> phenomena are appearances that phenomena everything which appears into into light which can be seen and these uh, experiences are all arising and passing <clears throat> Which means, as the texts very often say, even when we have good things in our life, we don't have much ability to hold on to them. And if bad things come, they also usually change in time, or our opinion or view of them changes in time. So, in terms of equanimity, this means uh, we're not in control, but neither are we out of control. That what we can do is work with circumstances, and work means work, it means you have to engage. But if you engage in the hope that you will be able to stabilize your situation, then you're going to be discomforted again and again, because that's impossible. On the other hand, you can influence it, because if everything is moving, then it's not so much that we're trying to push over a wall or 
remove heavy roadblocks. It's more like there's a flow of experience and we can influence, we can experience ourselves as fluid so that we are flowing into the flow of life. We're not standing apart from it. And when we go take a path of control, dominance, mastery and so on, we often want to take up a position and then act from where I am. But when we start to look, especially through scanning through the body, being aware of the ever-changing contents of the mind, where is this place that we're going to stand? We're not standing anywhere. We are moving in a field of movement with the circumstances. So as long as we have a sense of being present in flow as flow, surrounded by flow, that's what's going on. This is a movement of activity and we can be part of that and make some changes and sometimes being changed. So sometimes we are the shaper and sometimes we are the shaped. And there's usually a, a fairly balanced movement between these two positions. And the key thing is always to push where it moves. If something is very stuck, rather than pushing against it and trying to change it, we can find the parts that are moving. That is to say, in terms of energy, Buddhism is extremely pragmatic. Rather than, if you start from a dogmatic, defined position before you begin any activity, then you are very often frustrated because you have to work with the particular conditions which arise for you. Therefore, having a general idea of what you might want to do, and then you, we engage with the circumstances. So if we've got no idea at all, we're likely to be blown hither and thither. And if we've got too tight an idea, we're going to meet many obstacles. So it's always about being relaxed, loose, pliable, and able to rebalance ourselves again and again. Balance is dynamic. You never get to a point where your life is going to be completely balanced. We see that in our body, that the, <coughs> the heart is always at work, the lungs are always at work, the endocrine system is always at work. Our embodiment is dynamic. The problem is our fantasy of stasis, of stability, of fixity, of knowability. So, the practice is really a practice of staying with how things are and using the direct experience of that as the basis for dissolving our fantasies about how we think things are and how we would like things to be. Because these are both the ways in which, by being immersed in our mental construct, we separate ourselves from the lived moment. And if you want to act, it's always best to act in the hot moment of something emerging. If you want to be in a conversation with someone, you've got to speak into the moment of the speaking. So if you're out of time, you're going to have extra work to do. So what we want to do is to be present. Present just means to be present in the present, not in the past, not in the future, but allowing things to emerge as they emerge and work with that. So if we do a little bit more of that Vipassana sitting, because it's a very, it's a very uh, helpful way of getting the experience of being present without trying to make something happen. So in the sense that it, it's active, that you have to bring your attention to bear on what's there, but we're not trying to make anything in particular happen. We're going to be a, if you like, a proactive attender, that, that our energy, which we often mobilize into activity, into engagement and response, is here being, if you like, taken into its more yin mode, its more passive receptive mode, so that we are vital and alert and present, but not poised to do anything. We're just alert with what is moving. So as I said before lunch, 
let the movement move and keep the attention just calm and clear and focused. Okay? So, if you're practicing this on your own, <clears throat> doing a sitting of maybe 20 minutes is quite useful. You can lengthen it as you get more experienced. But the main thing is we want the freshness of clarity. And in particular, as we are tracking through the body, because the focus of our attention is the arising of sensation, the internal sensation, an experience we call proprioception. We want to be very attentive to the subtle ways in which we take hold of the arising of sensation. So, <clears throat> if you have, uh, as I indicated earlier, it, once you conceptualize something as a pain, you, you can do something with that. But if it's just, ow, oh, there's less you can do with it. So the closer you are to the raw emergence of the sensation, the less of your conceptualization there is, and also the less stickiness on the arising for any adhering to occur. And then we start to see, oh, when I grasp hold of my life, my thoughts, my memories, and so on, and more subtly, my feelings, my sensations, what I take hold of is a concept. So, whenever we catch something, we never catch the first presentation, the first blooming. We catch a skin which forms on it. And that skin is not skin like if you let a milky coffee cool, a skin forms on the surface. It's not, the skin is not emerging out of the, if you like, the object side. The skin is projected from the subject side. So it's much more like a mountaineer going up a, <clears throat> a rocky slope and hammering in pegs that he can link the rope into. The, what, is being, what the rope is tied to is the, is the metal nail or peg which is, is put into the rock. It's not the rock itself. So you're climbing, as it were, on your own insertion. So we are holding on to our conceptualization and believing that the projection is somehow a true disclosure of the intrinsic. Does that make sense? So you feel a sensation in your body. Let's say it's pleasurable. I think, oh, that's nice. Well, that's a commentary. So what is this? Ooh, some maybe light, fluffy feeling. Oh, light, fluffy. That's already some kind of interpretation. Sensation itself is there, like we looked before. It's undeniable occurrence. But it's not the occurrence of anything. It becomes the occurrence of something when we put the mystical essence into the occurrence. We say, oh, oh, my back feels really good today. No, that's a series of ideas. Maybe if you have, often have back pain, you're used to something being there, now it's not there. So, oh, this is good. What is good? Your conceptualization, your interpretation is what is good. The actual 
absence of the pain or the, the presence of a pleasurable sensation, if you try to see it as it is, you can see it but you can't touch. Hmm? So this is like Jesus after the crucifixion when he says, Noli me tangeri, don't touch. I'm here, here you see me, <laughs> don't stick your finger in it. Hmm? It's like that, you can't touch it. When you touch it, what you touch is your mind. You think your mind is going on to what's there, but it's like a boomerang. So the, the concept goes out and comes back to you. You're catching hold of your own conceptualization. Does that make sense? Like in the Zen tradition, they say, when the mind moves, the 10,000 things appear. So all that you say about yourself, this is a process of conceptualization. There is nothing there, but that, remember, it's always the middle way. It doesn't mean there's nothing at all. It's not some kind of abyss, some nihilistic nothing, nothing, nothing. It means there's no thing to be apprehended, but there is, whatever we call it, happenstance, occurrence. So you walk down the street, the light's shining, you see the people's faces, you see the car. So many occurrences are happening, and you have, running in parallel with it, your interpretation, your narrative, your story, in which you take some of the elements and bring them into a coherent pattern. This is what we learn to do as we get older. As we've touched on in previous times when I've been here, you know, if you have children, they're five or six, and they're out playing, and they come in, and you say, what were you doing? And they say, playing. Yeah, but what were you doing? They say, playing. That is absolutely intelligent. It's not possible to say what you were playing, even if what you were playing could be given a name like, I don't know, robbers or cowboys or something. It doesn't catch it. You cannot catch play. Play is here, luminous, shimmering. You're in it. But there's no doggy bag. There's nothing to take away. There's nothing apprehendable in it. The children are alive when they're playing, but just like the Buddhist texts say, in the manner of a dream. It's an illusion. It's make-believe. We're pretending. We're not actually doing anything. Children are very clear. We're not doing anything, but we're doing something. But what we're doing is not what you might think we're doing. And we know it's not what we think it is. So even if we tell you what it is, it won't be what we said. So it's just play. But we've gone beyond that. We've made ourselves more stupid in order to be more intelligent. So we build up our stories and then we think somehow the story is the true account. And essentially what Buddhism is trying to do is just to separate these as two domains. You by all means have the narrative possibility, the storytelling possibility as required, but not all the time. There's something about a balanced diet. Some things are best raw and other things are best cooked. So raw potato is not great. Raw carrot is pretty good. So you could have more raw in your diet, but cook what needs to be cooked. Because there are certain situations, like at work, where you have to cook. You have to show people what you're doing. Everything that you're doing, in a sense, is ungraspable, but it is as if it can be grasped. So. When we do this scanning through the body, this is what we have an opportunity to see, the, the raw moment of the emergence, and then sometimes you just go into a little riff about it. You put a wrapper, a conceptual wrapper around it. Oh. But the wrapper doesn't actually catch what was there. It's not a true account of what is there. It is, a, if you like, a parallel account, which could be a very misleading account of what is there.
And again, as we've touched on sometimes, in, you know, when if somebody goes to the doctor and says they have a pain, the old-fashioned doctors would ask lots of questions about the pain. Is it always the same? Is it the same in the morning and the evening? Is it does it get worse if you're taking exercise? Does it get less if you're taking exercise? Would you describe it as hot or cutting or burning? They're wanting to get into the phenomenology of the pain because that gives much, two things, it gives more sense of the, the signs which could lead to a diagnosis, but it also lets the person start to have some sense of the transient nature of the emergence. The conclusion you can come to is my back soul was sore, but if you like, how this soreness shows itself has many different flavors. And so, are we concerned with the um, overall notion of what's going on or with the particular moments? So, you know, we have apples and then we have kinds of apples like a pink or a Granny Smith. And then we've got this particular apple in my hand and this one that I'm biting. And the fact that I can say I'm eating a Cox's Pippin and a Cox's Pippin is a kind of apple. And so I'm eating an apple. What I'm actually eating is this thing in my hand. So whether I call it an apple or a Cox's Pippin or a British apple, whatever I say about it, and the thing I'm actually biting into is a sensory experience. So we could see in that example how the two things are co-present. It's sometimes helpful because you, you like this apple, so you want to order another one. You want to know what it's called. But the apple that you're eating is not its name. In, in the moment that the apple's in your mouth, its name is irrelevant. So when you're eating it, if you give your attention to the apple, to the sensation and the way your saliva goes and it's mushing in your mouth and so on, that has nothing to do with the name of the apple. But the, the apple can be named and the name can be known and shared and it's a cultural phenomena. So you, did you get the point there that there are two streams going on simultaneously? But because we have been educated, and we also have a bias towards it in terms of our particular karma. We've been educated to rely on the conceptual interpretation. That often becomes the very expanded bandwidth that we are mainly operating in. And so even when you bite the apple, you say, this is a really good apple. I like these coxes. So we, we go out from our mouth instead of going into that, which is an amazing thing, because if you're really with the apple as you chew it in depth and silence, as it dissolves, it will dissolve you. Eating is a very deep practice. It's why most religions have some kind of eating together or consuming. Because here, something is becoming nothing. And something is showing itself in that moment of becoming nothing. It was a potential. And the potential is released in its vanishing. Does that make sense? So if I say, good afternoon, Gareth, then there's words coming out of my mouth. So good afternoon is vanishing. Good afternoon. The, the meaning is just, it's manifest, but ungraspable. Hello, how are you? You look a bit tired today. Are you feeling better? What we're doing is meaning is emerging and dissolving like a wave in the ocean. We're not establishing anything. We are in an incredible infinity of wave pulsations. So somebody speaks to us and we reply. Their words come into us in through our ears, and then we find ourselves replying. So just pulsing and pulsing and pulsing. And the content, the semantic content, in a sense, is the excuse for permitting the pulsation.
because we are trapped in conceptualization. So we, we pretend we're talking about something important, but we're just doing kind of nice little strokes to each other. It's just an excuse to look at someone and smile, because if you just walk to someone and look at them, they go, okay. <laughs> but the words allow you to enact that proximity and intimacy. So what, it's again not about blocking concept, but not having concept as the starting place. So in, in Buddhism when they're talking about ignorance, they're meaning there's t various ways that ignorance is understood. But the first one is the emergence of the first subtle sense of something. So. If you're looking at the sea, the surface of the sea is going, seems to be going up and down. In fact, it's going like this. We see, we imagine somehow waves are moving along, and the water is going up and down. Flow. What's flowing? The mind is flowing. We say the wave is coming. That's our understanding. There is no need to give the interpretation or the commentary to the sea. So when we're scanning through the body and the sensation is there, the impulse or the habit, the tendency, is to apprehend it and put the wrapper around it. And our work in the practice is always to release the wrapper and release the wrapper. It is what it is. Yeah, but what is it? It is what it is. Or, or rather, it is how it is. Just this, just this. So what bit of us gets anxious about that? I mean, you probably remember being in school. I don't know what they do nowadays, but by the kids are always sticking their hand up to tell the teacher, I'm a smart arse, I know what it is. So the idea that you should be quick to tell other people that you know what's going on was a large part of my education. Not, that not only do you have to know, but you have to demonstrate what you know. And the capacity to demonstrate what you know, whether verbally or in a written exam, is how people mark you out as, as reasonably intelligent. And then doors open for you. So my capacity to not leave the world that is as it is, but to piss on every lamppost, every word, every number, means, Mum, look, I'm quite good at maths. I can demonstrate my ability to cover the world. Because we are world coverers. We are not world leave aloners. And the more we have developed this attitude, of course, we've done many, many alterations to other people's cultures and to the natural shape of the world, or the, the shape of the world we find when we're born. So our very capacity to conceptualize, and of course I'm saying this again and again because it is so vital, this capacity to conceptualize <coughs> is valid currency in samsara but is actually covering the door to nirvana. So it's useful in the land of obscuration, but if you want to have clarity, it's not very helpful. Because what looks like clarity in samsara is obscuration in the direction of awakening. So I don't need to know, and if I don't know, I won't be stupid. Now, when you're a kid, people always are pushing you. Do you not know what that is? Are you really stupid? You know, they're really, you know, you get a lot of that when you're a kid in the playground if you don't know the name of this band or football team or whatever. It's quite a competitive environment that you should be able to catch all these things and make the right package of it. But in this meditation, we want to not know. We want to let the experience show itself in its raw form. So if you like, it's just salad. It's just fresh leaves. 
crunching into fresh leaves. It doesn't need any dressing on it. It doesn't need to be warmed. It doesn't need to be cooked. It's just crunchy, fresh, and then it's gone. But what would be the point of that? Surely the point of life is to build up knowledge and power and experience so that you're able to do more. That's the normal trajectory of our education and our culture. And it's fine to have that ability, but if we want to see how, th how appearance is in its immediacy, we have to be stupid. But a particular kind of stupid, the intelligent stupid that says ordinary intelligence is really stupid, but my intelligent stupidity is actually pretty good. I want to be intelligently stupid the way the Buddha is. The Buddha is pretty stupid. He's not getting a career, he's not worrying about his pension. He says, do less. Remember that. The story of the Buddha, he leaves home, he spends six years in the Naranjana River, hot Bihar, unpleasant, doing all these kind of ascetic practices, yoga, breathing techniques, many, many things he does. And then he gets tired of it and he says, I've had enough. I've had enough. I'm going to get, make myself a comfortable seat. So he gets, collects this kusha grass. I want comfort. I'm tired of having my bum on sharp rocks. I don't want that anymore. He's not doing anything. Trying hard doesn't help. So he puts this grass down and he sits down and he says, I'm just going to sit here. I'm not doing anything. And then we, in the traditional descriptions you say that the Maras come, these kind of demons, which are actually the impulses to be busy. So he sees horrifying things <gasps> go away. He sees these beautiful images, erotic images, and so on. <gasps> give me, give me. Not pushing away the bad, not hanging on and trying to get more of the good. So I'm just here. I'm not moving. And does this touches the earth? The earth, you are stable. Validate my stability. I'm going to be like you. I'm just sitting, not doing anything. And on the basis of that, he has his first deep awakening. So that's that's the function of the practice. That he got more by doing less. And when he was trying to do more, pushing himself, striving, he wasn't making much progress. And this is because Buddha nature or the potential for awakening is intrinsic. It is not created by human effort. It's not spoiled by all the accumulations of karma and bad habits and so on that we have. It is always fresh. But if we want to find the fresh, we have to be fresh. Because the fresh reveals itself to the fresh. So when our mind is relaxed and open and fresh, we see, oh, as we're scanning through the body, we're just observing. We're just here attentive to what is being disclosed. So there is, as we track through the body, there's a disclosure or an uncovering or a revelation of this and then this and then this. Oh, and the more that the more what is disclosed is fresh, the more attention is unwavering, because we're just with the freshness, moment by moment by moment. Because attention isn't being distracted in interpreting or building up pictures, or coming to a conclusion. It's just fresh. And what's left at the end of it? Freshness. Not cognitive accumulation, not conceptual elaboration, but just freshness. And it's quite nice to be fresh. You, you go for a walk in the country. I was out in the fields just outside Macclesfield yesterday afternoon and you see the, the first daffodils coming up. And you saw lots of <coughs> geese out on the, on the canal. And you turn the corner and it's beautiful. And it's just fresh. And there's nothing to say about it. There's nothing to do about with it. 
It's just fresh. You're fresh, the world's fresh. And you're more alive. That's not a bad thing. So when, when we have words like awakening, that's what it means. is to be awakening out of the dream of conceptual interpretation into the freshness. It's not a stupid freshness. It's very, very intelligent, but it's non-conceptual. And that's again the paradox that if you want your mind to be bright and quick and responsive, easing out of the addiction to concepts will be better. Less white bread, less sugar, less saturated fat, good for the body's health. Less conceptual thickening. If you, you know, deep fry everything in concepts, imagine a big vat of concepts bubbling away, and you take each moment of your life and you dip it in as if it was chips. We, we are saturated in concepts. <laughs> The cholesterol, the mental cholesterol, uh, the arteries of our soul are clogged because it's too thick. We loosen that up and it's just wow, oh, amazing. It's just walking around, lots of the teenage girls have got their midriffs out already. It seems to be a sort of Macclesfield thing. All these little girls holding on. And it's just like, like really sweet, like little angels suddenly pop out. Oh, look at me, look at me. They're, they're so excited. Hey, I'm young and pretty. Ooh. And you go, oh, amazing. Something to do. It's just, oh. And little kids offer us the same freshness. So it's, fresh is quick, fresh is direct, and it makes the world bright. So this is what we're doing when we do, the reason we do the scanning is to get more allow ourselves to be closer to the point where the cover-up starts because if you go to the end of it if you if you suddenly aware that oh god I keep thinking about things I have to stop thinking I have to stop thinking it doesn't really help because you're already now you're thinking about thinking I, I think I have to stop thinking but I don't know how to stop thinking so I have to think about it some more Maybe I should read a book about how to stop thinking. So it's just concept after concept after concept. And one of the very simple things my teacher said to me is, you can't think your way out of samsara. When you stop thinking, you are already out of samsara. But not, not thinking in a dull, sunken, depressive way, where no thoughts are arising. The thought is arising, but it's not touching you that's the whole thing that as long as you're in duality you think well either I'm in it or I'm out of it that's all there is I'm either caught up in it or I'm keeping it at bay but when we come into the teaching on non-duality that we'll do more of a bit later then we have like form and emptiness emptiness and form where it is both and not either or so you can have your clarity the fresh open mind and the concept but because they're arising together, the concept doesn't dominate the situation. The concept is restored to its proper status as thinking is linking. It's about communication. Thought is in the house of compassion. It's not in the house of wisdom. Does that make sense? So when you think about things, you think about what you have to do or who you have to meet or remembering someone's birthday or whatever it would be. It's a, you're thinking about the world, which is absolutely appropriate. I'm linking myself to, oh, what will I do at Easter? You know, maybe you've got grandchildren or whatever, you've got to do something. So that's what thinking does. It is, it is compassionate and, and linking. But wisdom is not about that. Wisdom is about the simplicity of revealing what is there. So compassion is movement and wisdom is stillness. So in the traditional example the mirror is, is the site of wisdom or awareness and the mirror doesn't move but reflections move inside the mirror. The movement is in the mirror, it's not other than the mirror. It's not that you have a mirror in the one hand and the reflections in the other and you put the you have to somehow stuff the reflection into the mirror. 
if you have a mirror you always have reflections if the light's on so <coughs> thoughts are in the mind and if you only look at the reflection and you forget there's a mirror the mirror is taken for granted and it's as if the reflection is then something self-existing so you look in the mirror and think oh god I don't look too well what's going on as if that is me but that is a reflection so the mirror is always empty and the reflection is always full full of the radiance of the mirror full of the radiance of emptiness reflections aren't full of themselves so then we see oh people aren't full of themselves so it starts to get a little bit more difficult when we get into this area because non-duality goes against the grain of everything that you learn and everything that you function with in daily life we're in a binary world of if it's this it's not that if it's that it's not this so if we maybe look a little now at the four immeasurables sometimes called the Brahma Viharas may all beings be happy and have the root of happiness may all beings be free from soft suffering or sorrow and the root of suffering may all beings have the happiness which is unalloyed with any suffering not mixed with any suffering and may all beings rest in the um, the balance the uh, equanimity the non-bias of being equally open to friends and enemies so they, they, they flow in a kind of logical sequence may all beings be happy and have the root of happiness well we, the first bit is quite easy may they be happy yeah why why not I mean, may they be happy but then what is the cause of happiness we have relative causes you know, most kids you give them some ice cream and they get happy for a period of time so that's a, a an interactive briefly adjusting of the patterning of the world that allows happiness moments of happiness to emerge but the second bit of the phrase is more difficult and have the root of happiness so what is the real root of happiness it can't just be endless little causal pulsations the root of happiness is if we just before we get to that if we go back to think of the Buddha's teaching on the on the Four Noble Truths he teaches suffering the cause of suffering the cause of suffering is ignorance and attachment and uh, craving or hunger desire which includes desire for the, what we like and desire to be free of what we don't like so the root of happiness would be to be completely free of suffering so to be completely free of suffering we would need to end craving attachment and ignorance that's the root of it the situational causes that, that pulsate in our lives that we we become unhappy because we get a new boss at work or we fall in love with somebody who lives far away from us or your kids do things you don't like there are many causal things that make us agitated and ill at ease but that's not the root of it so the second one is may all beings be free of suffering and the root of suffering so we have hospitals and all kind of medications now in order to reduce suffering and that they on a relative level they can be quite effective but they don't take away all suffering because they don't remove the root of suffering the root of suffering is exactly what the Buddha said in the Four Noble Truths ignorance attachment craving so that's what we need to deal with may all beings have the happiness which is unmixed with any suffering what would that happiness be because happy sad 
they kind of go together. They are a, a polarity. They, they, they exist back to back as mutually exclusive categories. If I'm happy, I'm not sad. If I'm sad, I'm not happy. I'm either one or the other. So these are relative positions. So the happiness which is free of any suffering would need to be one which could not be contaminated by suffering. So what kind of happiness would that be? Everybody can get disturbed. The disturbance comes because something gets to us, either about ourselves, people say things that make us unhappy, or we feel close to people and something bad happens to them, so we're troubled and we're worried. I couldn't get to sleep last night because I'm thinking about somebody who's in hospital. If somebody said that to you, you would understand immediately. You'd say, yeah, well, I remember that kind of thing. It's, it, it, it gets to you. And that's part of our uh, shared humanity, that, that we are touched and moved by events. Which means that our happiness is always vulnerable. So what would, what would be the nature of a happiness which could not be contaminated or disturbed by suffering? It wouldn't be ha ha hoo. It wouldn't be something light and frivolous. In the uh, Sokshin text, it, it's described as contentment, as in Tibetan is simba. It means a, a kind of satisfaction which is not in need of anything more and is not requiring anything to be removed. It's fine as it is. So, this is the meaning of uh, Dzogchen, the great completion that it's fine as it is, it's okay as it is. Nothing needs to be done to change it or shape it in any way. So earlier this morning we were looking at briefly at aesthetics and the question of could one freely give one's attention to something which is deemed ugly and could one do it in the same way as one gives one attention to something that's deemed beautiful. So we have attention and I'm opening myself to receive this but I don't there's a resistance which is arising me. Oh so just going out the front door, if you turn into the church gr grounds and you walk through the church, on the left hand side outside a the door there's old sleeping bags and blankets and all kind of rubbish. Maybe somebody's been sleeping out near there. It looks pretty awful because it's dank and wet and so on. But that's associations, because what arises in me is, oh shit, how, imagine having to sleep in this dark, cold place. Where's the suffering coming from? My thought production. So if I return just to the aesthetics of it, and I see shape and color, without any imputation, without putting anything of my interpretation into it, imagine that you had a sketch pad and you're just sketching some of the shapes training your eye, eye and hand work together, eye, hand, mind shut the fuck up. You know eyes are okay but it's the other bit that's the problem because you want to draw what you see not what you think. That's what makes drawing very very hard as a discipline to return to things as they are not to your interpretation. So in that attentiveness to how it appears, this is how it appears. So ugly, these are all lines, these are lines, you follow the logic of the line. Whether the line, an, an ugly line is as interesting as a beautiful line. If you think of some of Goya's drawings for example and his prints they are, some of them are really horrible from the time of the Napoleonic Wars. You see all kinds of tortures, people impaled on tree branches and so on. And they're 
you could look at them for hours. I personally have looked at them a lot. They're very, very beautiful. There's a whole collection of them in the Geneva print gallery. Very, very beautiful. And if you keep looking at them, the horror, which is the emotional response to them, goes down. And you just start to see patterns of lines. And the line is a simple truth. So that's what we're trying to do, is to take our projection of value out of the situation and to see the value that is implicit in the immediacy. So if you read books on Sokshin, they're always talking about clarity. And the clarity there means the how it isness, not the what it is for me-ness, but how it is in itself. That's the clarity of seeing as it is. The interpretation can come later if necessary. But if you can't see the how, then with what we looked at earlier about the five skandhas, the second skandha of the feeling tone, positive, neutral, negative, arises. So when I walked first into the churchyard and I saw this pile of what we fair enough to call rubbish, I think, wow, what the fuck? Get rid of it. That's the second skanda. I see a little, but I feel a lot. So if you relax out of the feeling then there's space to see more does that make sense so that's what we're doing in the vipassana we're re trying to return to the first arising and when the temptation comes in to package it to interpret it to make more of it than it is we release that and that's why it's done as a scanning because the scanning is always moving you're not taking time to take up a position so this is really horrible right maybe I need to see an osteopath this is quite serious you're not doing any of that you've gone on to the next and the next and the next and the next and then you go this 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 so you you're not locking into the location you're not encouraging uh, the development of a notion of duration by staying with it and then you find each time you go through the body is different it's always fresh it's always different oh so the more you take away the layers of projection and identification, the adhesions of your attached mind is fresh. Oh, so we could apply this to everything. So if you've got a horrible boss, that's your thought. That's your thought. Who's making the boss horrible? Me. I'm, I'm, I only think they're horrible because they are horrible. Let me tell you about them. Does everybody think they're horrible? No. I'll give you an example of my prejudice. I was, went for a walk up the town. This big bloke's coming towards me with very strange, baggy, cut-off trousers and kind of really weird tattoos. Big guy, big bald head. Okay, you want to look like that? Good luck to you my petty bourgeois sentiment <laughs> but in his hand is his little girl she's looking up dad dad it's midterm I'm out with my dad <laughs> she's not seeing what I'm seeing <laughs> hmm? so if I could see through her eyes that would be the world reborn and what's so good about my eyes so that's the beauty of life, isn't it? To just suddenly catch, oh, they see more than me. They see differently from me. So let me drop into their vision. Let me see through them. And then we realize I took up a position due to my family background and judgmental Scottish Protestant orientation and so on. Because these shadow formations rush in very quickly like vultures around a corpse. And we have to relax out of them again and again you can't sort of rub them all away these are tendencies these are pulsations but what you can do is try to catch them in the moment think, Ooh. just as it, it sort of see, starts to drape over you just flip it, oh, flip it up okay should we do a little bit more sitting and then have a break
So if we keep practicing this, we start to get more ideas, more, more sense that two things arise together. And this relates to the first uh, aspect of ignorance called uh, simultaneous ignorance or co-emergent ignorance. There is some ungraspable, fleeting thisness or hereness. And arising with it is the idea of what is there. They don't touch. They're not the same. The fleeting moment vanishes as it will and it leaves no trace in itself. But the idea of it <coughs> creates a kind of shadow or stain or thickening or opacity. There's some kind of trace, a bit like a snail leaving this uh, slime trail. And the more of these trails that there are, there's a more of a thickening and, and more of a sense of the density means something. The density represents the truth or the depth or the reliability or the substance of what is there. And so that's what I relate to. Now, if we imagine so <coughs> there's somebody there behind the chair <coughs> and they're moving because experience is always moving and changing but I'm starting to develop in this chair formation my idea of who or what is there so <coughs> the more I start to relate to my idea of what is occurring, as we were looking before, we come into a mutually reinforcing relationship. The more thoughts I have about this, the more I'm confirmed as the thinker of the thought. So I'm the smart guy who knows something about what's going on. What's actually going on is becoming less and less visible to me because I'm speaking to a ghost. The freshness is there, but I've somehow chosen to relate to the shadow or the ghost or the echo. And here's the strange thing. The more I listen to the echo, the more it seems to be direct speech. So I'm now taking this simulcrum, this kind of doppelganger, this ersatz form, this false form, I'm taking this to be real and true and reliable and what is actual but ungraspable is less and less impinging on my awareness. Does that make sense? So now in parallel I become less aware of my awareness. I become more aware of my consciousness which is the, the thickened version of awareness. So you're making gravy. So you have the nice juice, which is fairly thin, and you maybe add a little port into it, and then you add corn flour. And the corn flour thickens it. You could thicken it into a roux, but if you just want to thicken up the gravy. Hmm? So this is what we're doing. Life is flowing, but I've got the gravy boat. Very tasty. Huh? So I try to flavor the gravy with the flavor that I like to find in gravy. More of the same. This is fresh. This is reliable. This is reliable as a ghost, which I pretend is, is real. Does this make sense? So you're tracking through the body, ungraspable but immediate sensation, and then storylines you can do something with the storyline. You remember, oh, I hurt my back before. Ma-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Thickening, thickening, thickening. 
the moment is gone because now you've scanned to somewhere else except you haven't gone down you're imagining you're scanning but still the thought stream is saying the past and the present are the same in terms of the scanning as soon as the present as soon as you move from this present to this present this one's gone there is no past, there's only present, present, present in the tension. It's always just present. But in terms of the accumulation of the storyline, the past is recruited. The past is the cornflower of the present. <laughs> so that's why it gets glutinous, why it's sticky, and we get stuck in the sticky. So what we're doing is we're thinning this out. We're thinning it out by seeing I fit in it by my accumulation, by my grasping, my holding on. This is what the grasping means, building up the picture. And the more I allow myself to be in touch with the freshness, less accumulation, more in the moment, more direct, less trace. So that's really at the heart of what we're doing. So the first level of ignorance is these two possibilities are there. The idea, which, because it's an abstraction, exists outside time. And the direct experience is always time itself. It's not, as it were, in time. Because each moment is just this, this, this. So that's what's flowing. This, 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 this. Oh, what is this? As soon as you've got, what is this? You've left this, the thisness of this, and you've pulled this into time as a something. So now you can take up your wonderful question, but what is it? You know, and little kids are doing that all the time. Oh, what is that? Oh, that's a da 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 So kids are getting layered and layered with interpretations and stories and understanding. And they become more solid. Three-year-olds are bopping around. Six-year-olds have now got a school bag. By the time they're 14, <laughs> I'm bored, I'm bored. No wonder they're bored. Where did the freshness go? It was layered out of them. So that's what we're trying to do. We're going right, this is, what, this is the link back into what we started with this afternoon about happiness and the root of happiness, <coughs> suffering and the root of suffering. The root is ignorance. And we directly come to this that fulcrum point, that tipping point, that crossroads where we have the freshness, the openness and the level of abstraction and interpretation and densification. So that's always available. The door to awakening is always open but in order to go through it you have to lose yourself to find yourself. Because if you're hanging on to the self that you know, it's going to be this accumulative form of the accretions of conceptualization. Does that make sense? Which is why in the practice we try not to merge into the conceptualization. Because it just gives more of the same. The same old story going on and on and on. So every time you let go of a concept and you realize, I'm still here, but I haven't a fucking clue. Ooh, that's fresh rather than ooh, ooh, I'm stupid what would other people think if they knew that I didn't know well they would have their thoughts that's okay because you want to get rid of your thoughts so if the fact that you don't have any thought about what it is gives them more thoughts that's pretty good you've pumped it over to them it's like having a sibling and when your mum's out of the room you stick the thing you don't want to be off your plate and you pop it on there you eat it No, we want to stay fresh. We want to stay fresh. And freshness is always there. Who is the enemy? I, me, myself. I, me, myself doesn't exist as a substance. We are aware. Awareness is not a self. The self is the thickening, the coffee skin on the top. So it's like if you've been roasting some meat and you take... I don't know why I'm so hungry these days. <laughs> and you, you pour out what's at the bottom of the pan, you put it into a cup, 
and you let it cool a bit and you put it in the fridge and then you can scrape the fat off the top and then you get to the, to the juice underneath that you need for your cooking. It's very important, isn't it? Because too much fat is not good. But we don't want to throw the fat out with the delicious, delicious juice. So we want to separate these two. Hmm? So the fat is the conceptualization. The delicious juice is always flowing. Yeah. Time for a cup of tea. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, if we go now to the fourth of these immeasurables and look a little bit at it because it's concerned directly with equanimity. So may all sentient beings abide in the great equanimity which has no bias in favor of friends and against enemies. Clearly in the world we experience some people doing things which we regard as abhorrent and other people doing things which we regard as wonderful or virtuous. <clears throat> we have to have some capacity for discernment to see the difference in the uh, utility of certain kinds of behaviors. Discer I'm going to make a distinction now which you know, maybe not everyone would agree with, but it's a kind of functioning distinction between discernment and discrimination. So I would take discernment to be uh, an attention to the details of the unfolding situation that allows you to see the differentiation of the modes of appearance. You look at somebody's shawl and you can see gradations of the color red, some bits a bit orange, some bit more cherry, and so on. So you see this. With discrimination, you come more you, to that, you bring in a value judgment. It's more about uh, the attribution of a particular <coughs> value to what you see. So that's a really nice shade of, of red. Uh, There's a highlighting of liking as against not liking. And that seems to be a statement about some enduring characteristic that's present in the object. So when you come into discrimination, you have the idea of abiding essences, whereas you can have discernment without any notion of an abiding essence. Does that make sense? So you might say, Scottish people are mean. So that's something we can definitely know about all Scottish people. It's a, it's a prejudice. And you can project prejudices on race, gender, age, and so on. And it is as if there is some essence to Scottishness, or to blackness, or Jewishness, or Catholicness, or Englishness, which somehow allows this definite concrete knowledge to adhere. This is, I, I know something about what they are like. But with discernment, you wouldn't have that. You'd just be being aware of patterns of behavior. And because you're looking at the flow of behavior, you can see sometimes this person's generous and sometimes they're not. They are moody. They are labile. They, they expand and contract. They're more available, less available. And we all have these pulsations. This is what it's like to be alive. You get a bit of a cold, you don't feel so social, and so on. So if you stay with discernment, you can't come to a conclusion. In fact, it protects you against making conclusions. So in the tantric system, the purification of desire attachment, of wanting more of this, is called the wisdom which discerns 
precisely what is occurring. Because what is occurring is shifting and changing due to circumstances. So you, you have the clarity of the, the detail of what's emerging without consolidating it into a fixed entity that could be known forever. Which means you have to be aware. In an ever-changing world, patterns are emerging and going down. So if you're not going to go take the lazy path of coming to a conclusion, all these kind of people are like this, because you know that actually each one of them is moving, you've got to be in the dance. You've got to be with them, attending to the movement. So that would be discernment. So in relation to equanimity, it's not that you, you put everyone in the blender and say all beings have equal value as manifestation. What we have is the sense all beings are equal in their Buddha nature or their Buddha potential. All beings have the capacity to awaken because they are not an entity. They live in the obscuration of reified um, essentialization. I am James. I was born in Scotland. I, 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 I. You can layer it up and layer it up. <coughs> when you start to see that, oh, this is an activity, that when I meet someone and I tell them about me, I'm telling them about who I may have been or who I wanted to be, but I cannot tell them about this lived moment of meanness. I can show them at least some aspect of it. I can be a bit transparent or visible, a bit honest in my here I amness, and they can get more or less of that depending on their availability and dispensation. But when I tell them about me, I'm giving them what I had before as the chair. I'm giving them food for their idea about me. So I'm going to feed your idea about me, but I can hide in my idea, which we see in politics all the time. Mr. Trump is very uh, unguarded in his presentation of himself and yet, amazingly, he's kind of invisible at the same time. It's very difficult to nail him. With other people, if we knew half of what we know about him, or have seen half of what we see about him, they'd be nailed to the wall. But somehow he slips away. You know, he is a master of disguises because he hides in the, in the floodlight. It's like Edgar Allan Poe's story, The Purloined Letter where there's a whole searching for this letter which seems to have been stolen and all the time it's in the middle of the table, in the middle of the room. It's hidden in the spotlight. So <clears throat> there are many ways in which our ego constructions can lead us a merry dance. But if we return to this precise issue about, well, who's a friend and who's an enemy? And on the basis of what? It could be blood ties, religious ties, economic ties. They are my kind of people. My kind of people. Well, kind, the word kind in English is linked to kin, to family relatedness. And we know in the general Mahayana, we adopt the idea, all sentient beings have been my mother in a previous life. So I have a kinship bond with all people. They are my kind of people. And if we look to think, if we did it on the basis of essence, what is the essence of all these sentient beings? It's emptiness. They are devoid of inherent existence. They are uncatchable. Well, we all share this. <clears throat> However, they show, they manifest, <clears throat> the diversity of the manifestation because it has no essence, cannot be ultimately definitive of who they are. Does that make sense? That is to say, we emerge situationally. People here have different roles. Some people may be school teachers or bus drivers or gardeners or doctors. 
you have a permission to behave in a particular way because of your role. You speak in a, in a particular way, you're entitled to encourage people to do things according to, to your role. Someone encountering you in that role may feel that they know who you are, but it's a situational revelation. It's not ultimate, because each of us shows many, many different aspects of ourselves. So there is no knowable, enduring, always valid essence to anyone, but there are many aspects of us which are slightly repetitive in their modality because when we're in role, that's the bit of ourselves we are gathering together and, and bringing forth. So a school teacher has to learn how to control a class. So they have a particular kind of authority, which if they don't have, it will make their life hellish. They have to bring a certain dignity and uh, impact to the classroom situation, but they're not going to be like that all the time. It wouldn't be productive in their ordinary social life. And yet the children will know, oh, you better not mess with that one. They're like that. So the, the predictability is the predictability of fulfilling a role according to certain kinds of scripts. But fulfilling a role is dynamic and changing. So there is a mood of that's a strict teacher, that's an easy teacher. The mood can be known but you cannot predict from that knowledge exactly how they're going to behave because the manifestation is always relational and situational. So if you look within, you don't find any real essence. Uh, we'll look at <coughs> in more detail about emptiness a bit later. But you know, when we look into ourselves, we all know that we, we have many voices, that we have many moods, many ways of presenting ourselves. So. Who is the true me? Well, it depends. I, what we do know is that we can be authentic or inauthentic in the different moods that we show. So you might be in a work role, but you're in a bad mood for some reason, and you can't get into role. Maybe you've got some shitty things happening in your personal life. You turn up to work. You don't want to be there. You're preoccupied with the stuff at home. And you're inauthentic in your role. And on a good day, you leave home and you leave home. So you arrive at work and there you are and you ring true. Is that that's something we can know about ourselves? But even when we're being authentic, that's a quality of revelation. That is to say, there's no contradiction between the depth of me and the surface of me in that moment. Does that make sense? It's just, it's flowing through. And at other times, there's various barriers or road diversions inside ourselves, and it's a bit convoluted. <clears throat> it's not quite straightforward. So if we see this complexity of our own self-formation, that might give us pause for thinking about, I know who you are, you're my enemy. I know who you are, you're my friend. You're my friend, you'll always be my friend. The Buddha said, friends become enemies, enemies become friends. It's absolutely circumstantial. Absolutely circumstantial. <clears throat> Britain is saying to Europe, fuck off. That's essentially what we're saying. Fuck off. We don't want to be part of you. You're rubbish. We are better off on our, on our own. Normally, if you want to have friendly relationships with someone, you don't slap them very hard. But we're going to slap them very, very hard and then say, and we'd like to be friends. <laughs> I mean, that is kind of stupid. That really is kind of stupid. We, we're so self-absorbed that we don't realize that to say we don't want to be with you because you stink is not friendly. It's not nice. It's called rejecting. We read it as we want freedom. Freedom to go this way. Fuck you. That's what we're doing. And, of course, many people in Europe are saying, well, we can do that one too. 
Why would we be nice to you? Why? You're being horrible to us. You've caused all this trouble, all this misery, and then you imagine that we should take care of you and give you all that you ask for. You are insane. And we have a mad leader, so that's a very accurate diagnosis. We are insane. We are not healthy. So, friend and enemy, we define them as enemy in order to break free, and then we want to give them a hug and say, new best friend. Probably not going to happen. But it shows the insubstantiality of it. You know, remember this famous uh, American, I, think, I don't know whether it was a president or a foreign secretary, saying, America has no friends, only interest. You know? The situation changes and you go closer or further away. We are protecting our own interests. So what, what I'm trying to do here is to show that when we use a term like friend or enemy, we would like these to be stable because we want to allow our anxiety to relax on the basis that we can make accurate predictions and have definite knowledge about the world. But it's a moving situation. So people's moods shift. So who is my friend and who is my enemy? So the person I want to give more to today because they're my friend, if they're not my friend tomorrow, why was I giving them so much today? On the basis of a temporary, transient interpretation, which was taken up by me as essentialized. You're my best friend. I really want to be with you because I know who you are. Well, that's good. I have no clue who I am, but if you know who I am, write it on a letter. Good. Okay. I can read it every morning just to remind myself. You like me because I'm, gosh, that's amazing. Is that really me? Who, who is this? This is an image in your head. You're changing and I'm changing, but the conceptual elaboration, the imago, the image that's been built up is enduring through time. And so we, we, we alienate ourselves from freshness. So when we say, may all beings develop this equanimity of being equal in all directions to all beings, have a sense that all beings have been our mother in a previous life, is to say that the ground connectivity where we are arising from the same source with the same openness of awareness is truly reliable, although it's ungraspable, and the facets of you that I identify as a basis of liking you or not liking you are situational and always shifting. So if I behave towards you on the basis of my current interpretation of who you are, in the belief that now I know exactly who you are, I'm really deluded. And this is why we go to war. You know, we, we, we Britain, we have invaded so many countries on the basis of our interests. And we've run away in the most cowardly way. You know, when we left the Indian subcontinent without managing the partition into Pakistan and so on, it was appalling and tr truly shameful. We quick to jump in and quick to jump out, not taking responsibility for what's occurred. Why would we do that? Because we see advantage. We are great Britain. We are great people world leaders in the top league and therefore we are entitled. That's been the British orientation. It's immediately disparaging of other people. I'm better than you and therefore I'm entitled to take what you have and treat you badly because of my race or my culture or whatever it would be. In fact, basically because I've got better guns than you. I can kill you more easily than you can kill me. So we start to see, oh, the basis for deciding on differences between people is 
actually a lot of fantasy is involved in this. A lot of strange prejudicial invention. When I was a kid, growing up in the 50s, we spent most of the time playing war games, you know, blowing up German this and German that. And everybody knew the Germans were the enemy. And I knew I hated the Germans. I had never met any Germans. Never, never, never. And then I started to meet German people much later. I think, oh, the, the actual German out there and the German that I grew up believing in didn't exist. I mean, they're, they're just chalk and cheese. They're, they're, they don't fuse into one thing. So there we, we can understand prejudice. Prejudice of various kinds. Lots of Polish people work in Germany, but they say, oh, we hate the Germans because of da-da-da and the war and so on. People carry prejudices while living in a country where they're getting quite a good pay. And of course, because everybody carries the prejudice, the possibility of fresh encounter becomes veiled in the mental accretion. So this is what is, the, the really central thing is, the outer situation is always fresh and open, and our mind's potential, our awareness, like the mirror, is always open and empty, but we've got this middle layer. You've got two pieces of fresh bread, and you've got a moldy bit of cheese in the middle. Well, cheese is quite nice, but throw it away shouldn't be eating that cheese just have the bread it'll be all right just have the space but the filler the filler is our ideas about who other people are so we start with assumption definition fake news as true news and on the basis of that we don't see the other person because we project onto them our image and we project onto ourselves and they project onto us and they project onto themselves. So we're in this endless hall of mirrors, real sort of smoke and mirrors territory with everybody fantasizing illusions about other people and not actually looking at the ground of where somebody is. So I'm speaking just now where am I speaking from? The words come out, the air comes up from my lungs, goes through my throat, through the voice box, comes out a sound which you hear. <coughs> what you hear and what you understand from what I say may well be quite different from what I imagined I was saying to you. That's always open. But where does it come from? It arises because of how we are together. It's not coming from me to you. It's us together. Because you're here, I'm speaking. I have no reason to speak like this if you're not here. So the words are arising from you. That's the really important thing to see. That's why we, we are group creatures. The group helps us speak. We speak in the group, of the group, on behalf of the group, as the group. That's how we're speaking. So when we speak to another person, they are speaking through us because it's the look in their face, the quality of eye contact that we get with them that gives us the permission to speak or not to speak. Do you think that's right? If, if we're in any way interested in communication, we might just be monologuing. But if we actually want to have connectivity, then we have to have a felt sense of who we're connecting with and therefore their presence is evoking us. And we, we can each observe that when we meet in the breaks and chat or if you go out this evening and chat with people. So that gives us a sense that we are each a potential, a potential which is evoked according to the potential of the moment which is manifesting through the evoked potential of the other person we're interacting with. Yeah? So, if we imagine, <coughs> you know, if we take the Buddhist view as a workable hypothesis for the moment, it's suggesting we all have Buddha nature, and on the basis of that, we can be available to help other beings. So, if you like, the arc of our ground potential is vast, that we can show many, many different ways of being with other people. But in this particular life, with our 
age, the generation we grew up in, our education, the kind of work we've done, our social life and so on, we, we tend to inhabit a much restricted arc. So we, we could have access to all of this, but actually we're inhabiting something like this. And then with particular people, it gets smaller and smaller. And with some people, we have almost no receptivity at all. This is relational manifestation. It's not that I, I find I don't have much to say to you because I don't like you. It could be for whatever reason I just find I don't have much to say to you. In this room, people will find it easier or more difficult to speak to other people. And it's not even really a, a case of easier or more difficult. It's just it happens or it doesn't happen. It's just, it's just like that. So it's not, <clears throat> if you say, oh, that person never speaks to me, maybe they don't like me, that's a self-referential conclusion. It could be just you don't click. It's a, a kind of karmic thing that your potential and their potential at this moment, in these circumstances, they, they just don't quite dovetail. So you might smile, but that's as far as it goes. You might give someone a hug and then there's nothing much to say. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just... This is how it is. So we stay with the how it isness without trying to interpret, yeah, but what does it mean? Maybe it doesn't mean anything. It's just how it is. So if you don't try to distill some final conclusion about it, it's just that's how it is today. So the next time you meet them, you've got nothing then to import. And think, oh, last time we met, it was really difficult. God, I hope I'm not sitting next to you because I wouldn't know what to say. You don't know what the person's going to be like. So the lighter we hold things, the less you kind of intensify it and, and make it dense with your own interpretation, each time you meet can be a new beginning. And you'll see how it goes. You'll see what unfolds. Because that's how it is. So all of this is just to try to put into question the notion that you could have a definite knowledge of who is a friend and who is an enemy. That if there is no inherent existence or true existence as this form, then it's up for grabs according to the situation. So up for grabs means you can apprehend me according to your proclivities, your tendencies. You get hold of me according to your interest or non-interest. But if you think, oh yeah, I, I know what he's like. I was there. Oh my God, that's not good. I don't want to do that again. Then you've come to a conclusion. But if we think, oh, due to causes and circumstances, what was evoked was easy or pleasurable, made me seem to be help, yeah, and seem to be life-affirming in some way, or not. Then we got more sense of that was a pattern. And patterns are impactful. They touch us. Somebody smiles at you or they frown at you. You, you feel it in your belly. You think, well, okay. No permission to go forward. They're glowering at me, okay. Don't know why, but anyway, it's, that's what we do. We just... But there's no need to have a conclusion from that. What happens then is, I don't like feeling this way. You're making me feel bad. I don't like you because you make me feel bad. But you might have a headache. You know, you might have your period. All sorts of things would be happening to someone that have nothing to do with me. But they affect how you are. And if I'm very self-referential, I will distill it. Oh, you're like that because of me. And so I'm mis misreading, misconstruing the situation. That happens quite a lot. I think we know that. So again and again, what would it mean to have equanimity to everyone? To say to ourselves, to be in touch in ourselves with the fact that however people are, they're okay. Or it's workable and if it's not workable in a direct 
interpersonal way, maybe it's workable in a more internal way. So, say you get really pissed off with me, don't want to speak to me, I can still think, oh, anyway, I love you. You think I'm a shit. Good luck to you, but I love you. There's no reason that I have to go into retaliation. But if we are in a world of winning and losing, I love someone who thinks I'm a shit. So doesn't sound too good, does it? They think I'm rubbish and I love them. That's a bit sick. Come on, they're putting the boot in, they're pissing in your mouth. What the? Come on, it's a bitch, fuck off. Oh, but I love them, I love them. Oh, for God's sake, grow up. But I love them. I don't have to retaliate. I love them though they hate me. Look, Christians have spend a lot of time reflecting on this, turning the other cheek, that love is the way, that you should not retaliate was the basis for the early behavior of the martyrs in the, in the arena and so on. That you can love those who persecute you, it's in the Beatitudes and so on. What Buddhism would, would kind of want to bring to that, though, is, a, is some sense of there is not a person there that hates you. Hate arises as one of the five poisons that arises from ignorance. So the mind itself is not a thing. The mind itself is a luminous awareness. So we're in this room together each of us can be aware or in our consciousness. When we're in our consciousness, we're apprehending people and things. And when we're more aware, we just experience the flow of experience running through. When we lose the openness of the awareness and we're more in the apprehending consciousness, we're formulating people, not just in terms of their reified existence, this is a man, this is a woman, a woman is not a man, a man is not a woman, so definite distinctions. And then onto that we attribute qualities of, and with that we elaborate our sense of I like, I don't like, which is not discernment, it's discrimination. And so now I have this partisan, this biased view about who people are and what they're like. This is arising from not seeing or not being in touch with the open awareness where everything is luminous and transparent. It's now becoming dense because you really exist and I know what you're like. And your solidity is reinforcing my sense of solidity. So that solidification is the first of the five poisons. Um, it's a kind of mental dullness and it's dull because it's, it's taking the path of heaviness, of definite knowledge. Uh, even if it's a, in a fairly neutral formation, you are a man. And as soon as, it's a bit like the five skandhas, you are a man, so the next level is do I like you or not like you? Because we, we'll have no contact if you're just neutral. But as soon as I come into more contact, spending time with you, I'm going to tilt one way or the other, either into desire or aversion. So these are the first three poisons. The mental dullness of the rarefied entitiveness of the other person. You exist in and of yourself. You are someone. Do I like you? Do I not like you? So I'm trying to work out where I stand with you. I, I want to know what sort of position I'm going to take up with regard to you. And then, falling from that, you get the next two, you get pride and jealousy. Either I'm better than you, or I'm proud that you want to be with me. Pride, pride can take all kinds of formulations. Or I'm jealous, I want to be with you, but you keep looking at other people. Why don't you want to be with me? Why am I not special for you? And this is all coming out from the sense that you are an individual, you are an agent, and you are choosing to be this way with me. Why? Many lovers have midnight conversations about this. But why do you do that? 
Why do you do the things I hate? Why? Nobody wants to be asked that question. <laughs> because the, the real answer, of course, is, I don't know. You have to take responsibility for how you are. How do you, how do, you do that? Because we appear not just to other people, but we appear to ourselves. I don't know what I'm going to say before I speak. I am revealing myself to myself as I reveal myself to you. I'm not a thing inside me. So how will I take responsibility? I can respond to the consequences of what I've said or done in the sense that I can move from this moment into the next moment and think, oh shit, I did that, I'm sorry, or whatever. I'm responding to your irritation at what I've done. And that requires me to be flexible and undefended to be, if I'm going to do it in a reasonable way. But how can I take responsibility for something which emerged? Because it's as if there's a James factory inside me pumping out Jamesness. And I need to go and accept I am the CEO of this factory. I'm the manager. I'm in charge. So if we're overproducing this line and the people don't want it, then we're not stuck in these biscuits anymore. Give them ginger nuts. That's what they want. They're good for dunking. Give them ginger nuts. So you should modify your personality in order to make yourself more agreeable. But in order to do that, you have to find the lever on the self-machine. With outer machines, it's more easy. You press the button or you turn the dial. So where's your button and where's your dial? I usually know that I have buttons when someone else presses them. <laughs> I don't think I'm pressing my buttons. <laughs> so other people get to us and they ah, oh, I'm sorry. But I'm sorry because I did it. But I did it because of you. So who really did it? If you hadn't done that to me, I wouldn't have done that to you. So, who is the doer of the deed? This is a fundamental issue. And again, we always have to remember, we're concerned with the middle way. A strong sense in the consumerist capitalist culture of individual agency. You have the individual, the indivisible person, somebody who exists. Because modern economics cannot operate without the idea of people in a, in a, in a marketplace making decisions. So there has to be a rational person making their own decisions. They are an individual agent. They decide things. But of course we decide things according to our group belonging. So we know that you get, now in London, there's ever-increasing knife crime. And you know, 10 years ago, there was ever-increasing uh, cutting going on with girls. It still goes on, but it, these things arise as waves of group activity. There's some kind of zeitgeist or some kind of something in the air that takes people over, and people are drawn into doing what the group's doing, not even as a conscious decision. They find themselves infected with that kind of mood. So who's doing it? If everyone at school's carrying a knife, you carry a knife. And then you get stopped by the police and say, you decided to carry a knife? No, I didn't. I'm just, I'm just doing what everybody does. No, but you're doing it. We've got you this knife. It was in your bag. You did it. Yeah, but I... I you know, you see how confused we become. Because I made it as part of the group. The group did it through me. That's what we're all doing. That's what we do. Yeah, but I'm arresting you. I'm going to go with you to tell your parents. Well, don't tell them. But you did it. And that's what's very terrifying. That you're held to account as if life was some kind of spreadsheet. 
and everything was set out and the accountant could go up and down and say, oh, this column's wrong, you're trying to hide something in there. Speak the truth. It, you, you could give a, a demonstration of why you did what you did. And this is why modern life is so confusing because people are burdened with the responsibility of individual decision making when actually we don't know how to do it or why to do it. Which electricity company should you use? Which gas supply company should you use? Which telephone supply company should you use? How would you know? Who cares? Who cares? It's, it's a social phenomena. Water, gas, electricity. It belongs to society, but it's been turned into individual choice. So you get more and more and more individual choices as if you would know what you really wanted. And so you're all the time being pulled into the idea that you are the, an image of yourself. And if you get some just as you can a plastic surgery on your nose, you can do a kind of psychic surgery on the shape of your personality to become a better sort of person. One that would be more socially acceptable. So we have all kinds of things now. We're wanting to ban therapy that would stop gay people being gay, but we're getting more and more money going into gender reassignment, which may be some another kind of strange direction for human beings to go in. Because one thing is a rising, acceptable mood, and the other is not such an acceptable mood. It, these are cultural formations that arise in time. Who is it who decides what they are, what their gender orientation is? Should we give credence to it? Is my feeling about me something that I should trust? Or should I talk with my mum and dad or talk with someone else? How will I know that I'm being the best I can be? What would that mean, to be the best you can be? It's the sort of thing that Miss World might say. I want to help children and to be the best person I can. I want to give something back. Well, you give something back every day. You eat and then you shit. You're giving something back. It's, the problem is we don't know what to do with human shit. Many cultures in the world put shit into the fields. We in this country don't want to put human shit in the fields. We don't know how to give something back. But, I mean, this is madness. Who am I? I'm lots of people. I'm a complex, emergent potential and if we could all be more tender to ourselves more tolerant of ourselves more tolerant of other people we could have a much softer more tentative connectivity that would have more passive receptive reception of the other and then more attuned responding but the, the obscuring part in the middle is our image of ourselves but I can't. I'm not like that. What does it mean to say you're not like that? Come on, you just try. I drove my parents mad when I was a teenager because I was very shy and withdrawn. And my dad would be saying, come on, just, just come out with me. We'll be fine. Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I can't. I don't. I can't. I won't. I can't. Inside that, I remember very much what it was like. It's like living in a room with no doors. Big windows, you can see everything that's outside, but there's no door, you can't get out. Because I don't know how they do what they do. My dad said, well, you just do what you do. Yeah, but, but how do they do what they do? Until I can do what they do, I'm not going out there. Because what they do is what, what people do, and what I'm doing is sitting in my room and not wanting to get out there. You get that kind of impasse situation because you have a, a, you're stuck with an idea of what other people are. And teenagers are often deeply persecuted by this. And then after a while, we're just in life a bit more. And somehow the imago, the image, dissolves a bit. But if you, if some people spend their whole life trapped in that image. But we all do it on a more subtle level. So if we want to have equanimity, part of that is tolerance, 
It's not that we are neutrally equanimous towards whatever is occurring. It's more that we see with discernment the various fluctuations of how we are, but we are inclusive and tolerant of them so that we can say, sometimes I'm selfish. Not as some guilty confession, though that might be necessary at first, but just to acknowledge, sometimes I'm selfish and I can't be bothered. I can't be bothered. Oh, but I thought you were a Buddhist. Well, I'm a bad Buddhist. <laughs> you can have a bad hair day, have a bad Buddha day. So we can be selfish, we can be greedy, we can be bored, we can be all of these things because that's what's occurring. That's how it is. We're not that forever. So if I say, I'm selfish, it's not an eternal definition. It's not some kind of revelation of the toxicity of my inner self. There isn't an inner self. It's just an acknowledgement that there are many varieties of moods and behavior patterns and from time to time, due to circumstances, I'm more with one than with, a, with another. So what you can work towards is a kind of phenomenological honesty. I can speak about the phenomena or the emergent phenomena of what, what we generally call myself in this moment. This is the patterning which I, I, as an awareness, have to acknowledge will be taken as I, as a self. But I have to keep de-selfing the I so that it's available to be something else. So, with, to continue that example, for me as a teenager, because I, as a potential, was trapped in the idea of myself as kind of shy and just overwhelmed by some kind of social anxiety. All I wanted to do was get on my bicycle and cycle out of Glasgow and go out the hills and sleep at the banks of Loch Lomond. I like that. Sitting in the little tent, looking out over the water. It's nice. Nobody's there. Nobody's saying anything. The gulls don't judge you. It's quite nice. Come back into people. Who are they? What do they think? Who are they? I'm trying to work out people as a problem. There's a lot of people. So there's a lot of problems. What's going on for them? What will they think? What will they think? What will they think? I mean, that's what social anxiety is, isn't it? Where instead of opening to the potential of the situation, and let's see, although my parents were always encouraging me in that direction, I got into, yeah, but how will I be? How can I be the right way? What do I have to do? And there's no end to that. There's no answer to that sort of a question. You just become more and more abstracted inside yourself. So, if we want to have equanimity, which is functioning, it's always about relaxation and inclusion. So, because if I had been able to say, I feel anxious, and I had gone to talk to people and said, I feel anxious, quite possibly 80% of them would say, well, I feel anxious too. And then you would have been able to talk about being anxious. But because of this kind of self-referential Scottish Protestant shame, it would be impossible for me to say that. Because I would feel that you were going to look down on me, because I was looking down on me. So it then becomes a kind of sealed world. Does that make sense? So equanimity, again, is not everything through the, through the blender and all being of one taste. It's like how can I accept all these flavors of myself and all the flavors of other people and work with that? Because it's, it's not about this is right and this is wrong, but it's finding workability. So when we read about the Bodhisattva, the person who has decided to work forever for the benefit of others, it says in the text that they take on whatever form is required. That is to say, they are in touch with the infinite ground open potential and in terms of their manifestation, they always have a sense of plasticity that I'm forming myself in this way to be with you. 
And then if I'm going to be with someone else, I will form myself in another way. And both will be authentic if I'm concerned to, to meet with you. But they won't be authentic in terms of an essence. Does that make sense? That manifestation is about connectivity. It's about whether the connectivity rings true or not. Not that I am showing you who I really am, because I'm not really anybody. I, I don't exist as a thing. You might find a stone and be able to examine it with all sorts of tests and come to some, you know, geological conclusion about it. But people are not like that. Living creatures are not like that. Dogs and cats are not like that. that they show themselves in different ways. And the thing about we human beings, we have the greatest labile potential we can move in so many different ways with different moods and different attitudes but we're not quite sure what to do with that because we carry the burden that we should be reliable and we're not reliable we're responsive and so if we privilege responsivity more than reliability our world would be warmer coming up from London is very nice to be in Macclesfield because when I was on the outskirts every time I passed someone I smiled and we said hello to each other and you cannot do that in Kilburn it's not possible it can't come out of your mouth <clears throat> because there's no social permission the, the, the field the experiential interpersonal field is so cold that there'd be nothing to it just it dies in your throat so responsivity is such a rare commodity in the big cities now where everybody's trapped in their lonely isolation and being true to themselves, putting in their little Facebook and this is who I am and this is what I did and I, 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 I. And I'm going to be really intimate with people who are far away, but I don't want to say hello to someone walking past me in the street. Now, this is <clears throat> a real tragedy. So part of our work if we can't do it externally is always to include other people in our hearts and minds so we never reject people no matter what they do whether they're torturers or rapists or they were in ISIS or they're multimillionaires and they're selfish or they're arms dealers whatever people do how, that is to say however they manifest is never grounds for fundamentally rejecting them because there is no one there to be rejected. We can, of course, have discernment so that we know making your money by selling bombs is not an ethical thing to do. You're increasing unhappiness. But we probably know what it's like to give someone else a hard time in our life, in a relationship or with a sibling or what, so on. So cruelty and selfishness probably are not strangers in our own heart. So the more we see our limitation, the more understanding we can be of the limitations of others that it doesn't mean that they're another species so we need to use our knowledge of our limitation as an effective way of relating to them does that make sense and therefore our job <clears throat> is to try to become more skilled at relational potential at releasing ourselves in different ways with different people so that we can connect with them because if we're always just doing a number, being ourselves, that's going to call the other person into doing their number. And so you just get a reverberation of two numbers going off, and it's a, it's a kind of set-piece interaction. So, how can I be equally open to the, my enemies or the people I'm afraid of The starting point with that is there are truly dangerous people and because they're dangerous, I'm afraid of them. That would be our normal interpretation. So from the Dharma point of view, living a lie as I do, believing myself to be an independent, autonomous self, when in fact I am enworlded in a non-dual participatory way with everything else which is occurring,
because I am part of the world but position myself as a separate individual I have the anxiety of bad faith I'm being untrue to how it is I'm living a lie and because I separate myself from other people I look at them across this distance of separation and try to work out who are you what kind of a person are you but I only have two categories I've got friend and enemy so if you're enemy then I'm afraid of you and one way I can deal with my fear is to attack you first to have a preemptive strike you're rubbish you're horrible I hate you aversion and the other way would be some kind of seduction if I'm very very sweet to you then maybe you won't attack me so you get the defensive movement of attraction desire and aversion hatred and then we see oh this is what I do and this is what other people do as well all <clears throat> in the Buddhist point of view all negative action all the nastiness the horribleness of the world arises from belief in reified entities so the people who are cutting down the, the rainforest in uh, Papua New Guinea in the Amazon and so on when you read interviews with these people they are concerned with giving their daughter a dowry I want my daughter to have the best wedding I want her to have gold jewelry we're going to have a thousand guests that's why I have to cut down another hundred hectares it's logical what they're doing inside their frame of reference they are being good people very few people set out to be really bad. I mean, psychopaths are usually they, they, they lack a compass for good and bad. But people who really, really want to be bad, that's a bit unusual. People are good to their own lights because they're wanting to get money. Drug dealers are wanting to get money in order maybe to send their kids to a better school, and, you know, have a nice house and holidays abroad and gold bracelets and get a BMW and all the rest of it. This is what you need if you're a dealer. I want to be a dealer. I need that. But why do you need it? Because I'm a dealer. So you get a little circular thing. doesn't mean that they want to be bad. But don't you know you're harming people? Listen, I've got my family to look after. I've got my family. I've got my family. Hmm? Why do we need to get rid of all these uh, Jewish people in Eastern Europe? Oh, it's because Aryan people need to expand. We need more land for, for the pure-blooded Germans. That was the logic of it. The move to the east. There are a lot of people there. What kind of people are they? Slavic people. For God's sake, get rid of them. The war didn't last long enough. We'd get rid of the Jews, then we'd get rid of the Slavs. Burn up the Russians too. That, that was the master plan. Why? Because we're the good guys. We're entitled. We are the ubermensch, we are the superior people, and the other people, down the hole. Rubbish. That's what we see. So there you've got definite knowledge. All wars are started by definite knowledge. So what we can see today, and it's a very painful thing to, to have to think about these things, is just the power of reification. I know what you are, and on the basis of that knowledge, I can kill you, or I can rape you, or I can give you gold. Because you are my idea. That's essentially what it is, isn't it? We know what these people are like. We don't know these people. We don't want to speak to them because they're shit. And we know they're shit. That's why we don't speak to them. That's why we just kill them. Who would want to speak to shit? But how will you know that they're shit? Well, we just know. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. So that's what we, that's what we see. And we, we have this in our own mind. We, we don't do it on such a disastrous level. So, you know, we'll have time to unpack this more tomorrow in terms of emptiness and do meditation related to that. But what you can do this evening, if you like, is... Whatever you're doing, be aware of prejudice arising in your mind. Be aware of the quick snap judgments that you have walking down the street about how people walk or how they look or whether you like them or whether you don't like them. And just see 
as a kind of figure ground highlighting people that you pay more attention to and people you pay less attention to. Some people are fixated on danger, some people are fixated on erotic attraction. Whatever uh, mood is infecting your biased perception, just be aware of it. Don't judge it, but just think, oh, there's a lack of equanimity here. I'm not seeing these as all sentient beings have been my mother in a previous life. I'm not seeing them as all having Buddha nature. I'm not seeing them all as manifestations of the Buddha mind. I'm seeing them as real people with really different qualities and I like this one and I don't like that one. So that's really the first thing. See, oh, this is what I operate in. And this is the same paradigm as all the wars and all the torture camps in the world. It's exactly the same prejudice. We have it in a milder form, a softer form, but the basic structure is the same. So, oh, other people are not worse than us because we are trapped in the ignorance of believing in inherent existence in people and in things rather than seeing these are forms arising in connectivity and by engaging with them in a lighter more heartfelt more contactful way we can bring some amelioration to the rigidity and density held by others does that make sense so there is something we can do. It's not a done deal. It's not finished. But we have to become softer. So first of all, we have to see how harsh and judgmental and critical and frozen our mind can be. How opinionated we can be. I remember my mom. I grew up in a place in Glasgow that was very quiet. There were almost no cars. But as more cars arrived... After my dad died, we didn't have a car. And people used to park their car in front of our house. My mum would be tapping on the window. They'd be looking at us and thinking, what, what, what is this? It's a, it's a road. You park your car on the road. She's thinking, it's the road in my house in front of my pavement. No. Mum, I can't do that. But why are they there? It's mine. And I think maybe I told you before of this endless feud she had with the neighbor's cat that would come and shit next to her rose bush. <laughs> endless. She had all kind of chemical things that she'd put all around the roses. Why is that cat shitting in my garden? She shit in its own garden. <laughs> Shout at the cat. Go next door. And these things, are, they're so poignant, they're so touching. The world is not the way I want it to be. It's heartbreaking. And we all do that in different ways. As the Buddha said, what is suffering? It's getting what you don't want and not getting what you do want. And that can manifest in any manner of ways. And when that pain is linked to power, we can be cruel and vengeful and malicious. So it's always looking to this basic position that I think I should have the kind of life that I want. I am the agent. I should be able to make my life the way I want it to be. And this is a fantasy. We can work with our life, with sicknesses that we get, with family troubles we get. We can stay alive inside that, relax and open to it through our meditation practice. But we can't magically transform the, our life into a different kind of life. So if you're going to work with circumstances, you have to be close to them. And you can't get close to them if you're afraid of them. So first of all, acknowledging that we are selfish or mean or lazy, whatever is in our portfolio, we have to just know this is how I am from time to time due to circumstances. But it's all me. And if I can know that this is all me, I can probably accept you as you are a bit easier. And then we can say, oh, we're all moving as manifestation, as behavioral pattern, 
but the ground out of which this manifests is still, silent, infinite. This is the awareness, the mind of the Buddha, the Dharmakaya that we all have. So tomorrow we'll look more at the relation between these two aspects. So have a very good evening and see you in the morning. So to briefly recap for people who weren't here yesterday, we focused uh, on, because the topic is around equanimity, we focused on the nature of impermanence and the difference between immediately presenting experience and our conceptual interpretation of what is going on. So, for example, I've been coming to Macclesfield for a while, and so if I go out walking from the travel lodge, I know my way about a little bit. What do I know? I know how to get to different streets like Chestergate. So I come out of the travel lodge, turn right, do this, do that. I know that. What I can't know is what I will encounter on my way to Chestergate. Because what I see, what is revealed to me in the immediacy of being present, being alive with what is there, depends on whether we have sunshine or not, depends on how cold it is, depends on whether it's a weekday or a weekend day, how the buildings look, how the people look, who is going to be there, which cars are parked there, what appears is unknowable because it's being transformed moment by moment and it's also being transformed in its revealing of itself to me through my senses according to my mood or my health or my preoccupation. So we have two almost parallel worlds here. We have the world of what shows and the world of what I imagine. And my imaginal world is predictable, reassuringly uh, settled in how it will be. I know how to get to Chestergate. That's definite, unless some bomb goes off. I just go round and up the hill and along the road and turn left. That's what I do. I know how to do that. That's an idea. So when I know how to get to Chestergate, I'm walking in the labyrinth of my mind. This is imagined, this is conceptual construction. And there is some kind of resonance or parallel with what is appearing. But when I try to uh, give an account to myself or to someone else of what I encountered on the way, I'm transmuting the immediacy of the experience into a narrative. I'm going to tell you about what I encountered. What actually appeared for me, I can't say. I can't say. So much happens. You go outside and you see the brick wall. You look at the wall, there are thousands of bricks. In the moment that you see it, all these bricks give themselves to you. But if you try to describe the wall, going into the different coloration of the bricks, the quality of the cement that's between the different bricks, the shadow, the lighting, and so on, that would be an endless story. It could not be done. So the immediacy is inclusive. Everything is there and given freely. But our account is always selective, that we are highlighting features and pulling them into a particular patterning of the structure of the narrative. So that's a really essential thing in terms of meditation. Because two aspects here, the direct, immediate actuality of what is revealed is ungraspable. 
you get it if you're there with it, but you can't take it away. It is beyond appropriation. And on the other hand, the stories that we can tell about it, in the moment of the telling, they are also dissolving. So as I'm speaking with you, the words come out of my mouth, the sound goes through the air, it comes into your ear, so it's dissolving as it comes out of my mouth, and it's dissolving as it comes into your ear. There is the impermanence of our connectivity, but somehow, somehow we manage to generate some degree of density and consistency and solidity through this conceptual apparatus. This is a kind of negative alchemy that turns gold into shit. So the freshness of the world is transmuted into the tedium of our own <coughs> dreary conceptualization. And as we were looking yesterday, our own knowledge makes us dull. On the level of efficacy of moving concepts around, it has power, it has analytical power, it has a power that can be rewarded in a work situation, but we are dulled towards the freshness of what's occurring. Moreover, once, we, once our experience of the world is mediated through concepts, because of the linear nature of conceptual expression, whether it's as an internal thought or speaking or writing, things are laid out in sequences which easily, uh, <coughs> easily allow the analysis of what's occurring to be done in terms of cause and effect. So we, thinking is linking. We join the world together into particular patterns. Which means then that I can make sense of the world. And I believe that what I encounter is how it is. That's how it is for me. But the blessing of abstract conceptualization is because I'm extrapolating my certain features of the environment to make my story you are able to comprehend my story. And when we do that, we are meeting in the domain of abstraction. We're not in it together. So if I tell you what it was like walking along to get here, you can comprehend it, you take hold of it, and it gives you a, you're able to grasp it because we grasp concepts. The actual experience of walking here was beyond grasping. So this is the most important point for a Buddhist understanding. What we grasp is not concrete, it's abstract, but by grasping it, it is as if we are grasping something really reliable and true. So we are grasping at shadows, but because of the intensity of our grasping, we formulate these shadows into some vibrant truth about the world. The importance of this for meditation is that the door to freedom is in the palm of your own hand. This is your, it is your mind that is doing this. So if you were to have to sort out the world by going outside and getting information, you would find that there is always more and more bifurcation. So, for example, in universities, subjects which uh, used to be quite simple, like history and later sociology, diversify into social history, economic history. There are many, many kinds of history, so people specialize in a, a modality of historical inquiry and into a period of historical inquiry. In the same with sociology. The same with uh, uh, 
physics and so on, there's always, the more we learn, the more we go into the detail, which means a new discipline develops with a new professorship and so on and so on. So this multitude of departments, which was not there 50 years ago. So conceptualization leads to an expansion of the idea that we can get hold of what is going on, but we never quite arrive there. It's always over the hill in the next valley. We're always approximating to something. So although, at least in science, people are honest enough to say, well, this is a hypothesis, a working hypothesis, because new information will always put the hypothesis into question, we don't proceed in our daily life as if this is the case. We proceed as if we've arrived at some definite knowledge. And if you're a lawyer or a forensic scientist or a school teacher, you have to produce results. People want you to, to speak and say, it is this. And I know it's this because it's not that. Okay, now we know how to proceed. <coughs> so the world of concepts is very tempting because it gives us a kind of reassurance that we know what's going on. But when we stay with the experience of the senses, we, we do not conceptually know what is going on, but we are present and everything is rich and full in its immediacy. So these are two kinds of knowing. One is knowing about and the other is directly knowing. So in the Tibetan language, they have a lot of words which show the difference between these two. For example, they say yeshe. Ye means original or primordial or intrinsic, and shepa means, as a verb, means knowing. So it means the kind of knowing which is there from the beginning, which is always there. So conceptual knowledge is not like that. You don't know something and then you learn it, and now you do know it, like learning a foreign language. I didn't know, I'm learning it, and now I know it. So that's apprehensing, uh, an apprehensive, an appreh no, not apprehensive, uh, an apprehending kind of knowledge. I'm getting a grip on something. I'm making this information which was out there, I'm taking it to inform me so that that information now becomes part and parcel of me. And by using that, I can express myself in a way that's comprehensible to other people who have also internalized things of a similar kind. But when you go for a walk on the hills and you climb up, climb up, and you get to the crest of the hill and you look out and this big vista opens in front of you, it's there. It's a kind of knowing, but it's not a knowing of something. It's a non-analytic knowing. It is a receptive knowing. You know what is being given to you. You know what is occurring, what is happening, and it's an unfolding, a happening. You don't need to know the names of any of the, of the flowers that you see on the hill. You don't need to know the names of any of the birds. It appears you're there, and then you think, yeah, but what's that? Oh, I've seen these before. What are they? And so we're back in the realm of what? Of, of giving a definition and an identification which takes us away from the immediacy of what was given. Because if I'm trying to, to work out what that is, that's coming from me towards the object. I've looked at this particular flower. Somehow it's caught my attention and all my analytic apparatus and my memory and so on is, is struggling to bring up some phrase that will explain to me what this plant is. From self to other. But when you're just looking and seeing and knowing in that fresh sense, which is often translated as clarity, there's the clarity that everything is here revealed it's coming to me. And who am I in that moment? There's always two possibilities. I can be very relaxed and open, in which case I get the optimal receptivity of everything that's being offered. Or I can be veiled or 
obscured or preoccupied in various ways. I could be thinking about something else. I could be, have a, a bit of a mood. I might be a bit depressed. And so it's as if there's a kind of muffler between me and the world. Yes, it's all very lovely, but anyway, and off we go in our mental world. So that's where we understand what it means in Buddhist texts by obscuration. What's being obscured is what is revealed, and what is revealed is ourselves. Because we, in our ignorance, live as a subject on the inside. I live in my skin bag, looking out through my senses at a world that is out there, a world of fixed objects, noble objects. But is that true? In the moment when you're standing on the hill and the wind is all around you, there's feeling, which is experience, things arising, sensations in the body. There's a sensation of the wind on my face. There's the movement of the clouds. There's the wind blowing through the grass. All of this is arising at once. It's all at once. So, conceptually, I can say, this is happening to me, or I am experiencing that. But the sensation in my body is arising and passing, and the wind on my face is arising and pa passing, and the movement of the clouds is arising and passing. What we have here is an integrated field of experience that I am part of. I am participating because I am a participant. It's not that there's some liminal edge, some inside to outside threshold that I can cross over. I am always already in the world as part of the world, but my own conceptualization establishing me as a separate self, an individual, puts me into my skin bag, looking out in sometimes amazement, sometimes horror, confusion at what's going on. It's all these people, what do they think? How do they live? What do they do? Can't solve it. How shall I live? How would I know? The fact is we are alive. We are living. Living means you walk when you have to walk, you eat when you have to eat, you sleep when you have to sleep. It's not all enormously complicated. Dogs know how to do it very well. But we, when you get into the conceptual interpretation, we, just like university departments, we bifurcate and bifurcate and have these endless little rivulets of possibility opening up. <coughs> maybe this, maybe that, perhaps I could do this, perhaps I could do that. This is conceptual elaboration. It's concept, feeding more concept, more concept, more and more <laughs> finesse of detail. And now life becomes problematic. I'm not sure what to do. There's the problem of choice. Basically, it's kind of simple. If you need money, you need to get a job. And you go to this job. If you don't like the job, you try to get another job. If you can't get another job, you have to live with the bitter taste of doing a crappy job. But at least you know why you do it. I do it for the money. So on a basic level, life is not so complicated. But we think, oh, it shouldn't be this way. It should be other than it is. Well, what should be other than it is? If you go for a walk on the hill and suddenly it starts to rain and it's very, very cold, you're getting cold and wet. I don't want to be cold and wet. That is an irrelevant thought. You are cold and wet. So you can continue walking while you are cold and wet, or you can try and scurry back to where you can warm up. There are not many choices, but you are already cold and wet. This is how it is, but I don't like it. I wish it wasn't like this. We see how we cannot even allow ourselves <coughs> the simplicity of being cold and wet. Oh, I'm shivering. Yeah, that's because you're cold and wet. You are an integrated person. It's not surprising. <coughs> Now you suddenly need to pee because when it gets very cold, you tense up and that puts pressure on the bladder. So that's what happens. 
We know these things. Our thoughts about it are functionally irrelevant. But what tends to happen is we have a lot of narrative, a lot of commentary about what is going on. And that's where we lose the sense of equanimity. Because in the commentary, we are evaluating what is going on. We're attributing value and significance and meaning to transient experiences rather than being with them. When you're cold, be cold. This is what it's like when you're cold. You might shiver a little bit, or the skin tension changes, your breath might change. I'm cold. Now I'm wet. I feel the rain trickling down the back of my neck. This is what it's like to be in heavy rain. Oh, so I can stay with the phenomena. It's just like this. But we usually don't do that. We go into the story. And the story abstracts us, extrapolates our sense of individual self from the continuum of experience that we are participating in into an individualized, separated subject. This is happening to me. Well, this is happening, and I'm present in the happening. It's only happening to me when I conceptualize me. So this is the difference between, in, traditionally between awareness and consciousness. Consciousness ha carries a self-reflexive, self-referential movement inside it. So if I'm eating and I'm cutting something with a knife and fork, not only am I mobilizing my energy through the tension of my muscles and pressure and so on to cut into, say, the potato. So I'm, a potato you cut in maybe in a different way from uh, a baked onion. You've got a different ease of getting the fork into an onion from into a potato. So you're, you're attending to the particular sensation as you cut into it according to the circumstances. You're, you are engaging with the potato in a joint activity because the potato is showing you the possibilities of cutting because usually the, you can cut into the potato quite easily. If you were trying to cut a raw potato, maybe the knife that you are using to eat it once it's cooked wouldn't be sharp enough, so you need to get another knife. So the potato will determine the kind of knife or the kind of fork that you use. That is to say, our world is relational. And if we attend to the, the shapes, the textures of what we encounter, and we have reasonable access to resources, we have an interplay between what is appearing in front of us and how we move with it. So we're living in a world of attuned pulsation because we're just flowing into the, the happenstance of how these momentary events come together. But if we conceptualize it, I am cutting the potato. This potato is not quite cooked enough for me. That's an addition onto the moment of the cutting. Because the, the feedback that's coming up my arm from the pressure that I'm exerting on the potato is telling me something about the potato. I mean, we know that in your boiling potatoes, you stick a fork into them to see if they're done. And the resistance that you get shows you whether it needs more boiling or you can take it off the heat. So that kind of feedback is, is very important. But the feedback is telling me about the potato, subject to object, but who is the one testing the potato? That's me. So that's a secondary isolating feedback. The first feedback is connecting me with the potato. So there's the revelation of where I am in connectivity with the potato. But when I have the sense that I'm doing this to that, I'm separated out. So a lot of the reassurance of the continuity of myself as an individual, as somebody who is a part, comes about 
through the confirmation to myself that I am the agent, I am the doer of the deed, I am the knower of the knowledge, I am the speaker of the words, I am the hearer of the sound. So there's not just hearing, but there's a kind of secondary gain, a kind of skimming across the surface where there is a confirmation of the centrality of my role. This is happening to me. So from the point of view of a more open awareness, from the notion of clarity, this is happening. I am a participant in the happening. It's not that this is happening to me, but this is happening because I'm present. My presence and the presence of what is arising are absolutely inseparable. So in the traditional image, we have the mirror and the reflection. The reflection is in the mirror. Within the open mirror-like mind, this field is disclosing itself. The reflection is me and the world, me and the potato. We are arising together as an unfolding or a display of the current content of experience. But you can construe that, you can make a reading of that that says, I'm cooking the potatoes. No, don't, don't interfere. I know how to cook potatoes. This is how I do it. So people often fight in the kitchen about because we've got our bit of knowledge. I don't know what your mum was like, but I <laughs> certainly haven't learned the wrong way. Why, do, why would people fight like that? Because we're fighting about our identity. It's not about the potato. It's about the fact that I know how to cook potatoes. This is the tragedy of the fragility of the ego self. Because the ego self has no fixed content, has actually no inherent validity at all, it's a fragile illusion which has to be confirmed and repeated and reinforced again and again and again. We could relax and just be part of what is going on. Do you want to cook them? You cook them. I'll make myself a cup of tea. Why not? But I'm cooking it because I know how to do it. That's unnecessary. Would you rather stand over the stove with all the steam and everything? Or make a cup of tea. Let the other bugger get on with it. No, because I, I, I. This, the I is a kind of intrusion which is like a wedge. Every time we say it, it... <coughs> It seems to be an assertion of my involvement and my connection. Hey, I'm doing the cooking. So I'm putting myself into the cooking. But I'm also, as a wedge, it's separating me from what is going on. Because I've now taken up a position, a position of agency, mastery. I am the one that is doing, and I'm doing it my way. Which, in fact, is how it should be done. And I'm happy to teach you if you're willing to learn. <laughs> the joys of pomposity. <laughs> so, this is, this is a Buddhist understanding of what the self is. It's an unnecessary addition to the unfolding of the play of experience. If you see it as an illusion, as something which is part of the process of unfolding, it's not so problematic. It's just, if we're going to talk, we have to refer to me and you. It's just part of our linguistic frame. And the thing about language is that all, we need all the words. All the words in a language collaborate together to make the language. There are no special words. You know, you, we've got this system of having dictionaries, so you look up words in the dictionary. But when you look up a word in the dictionary, what you have to do is read other words to find out about the word you want. <coughs> so words are always telling you about other words. Words are interwoven, interconnected. They do not stand alone. A word by itself has no inherent meaning. You might believe that some kind of onomatopoeic word like buzz, you know, has some resonance with the sound of a bee. But that's very, very thin. What we know is that actually language is a system of conventions. 
it doesn't have any direct correlation with what it's referred to. Um, so the addressee of the speech communication is picking up according to their own conceptual uh, interpretation. Language speaks to language. Language never speaks to people. People use language as a mediating tool. And we are all immersed in the semiotic web. We are immersed in conceptual identification. That's how we proceed as human beings. Dogs don't do that. Cats don't do that. We as human beings are able to do that, which means that we have huge skill for analysis and for thinking about things, which can be useful. So you can think about impermanence. You can think about the nature of the self. You can think about meditation. And these are <coughs> proximal steps. They take you closer into some proximity of the thing itself, which is your mind. But at a certain point, we have to allow the dissolving or the impermanent nature of language and signs and interpretations and just stay with the presence of the primordial knowing, the clarity which is there prior to conceptual understanding. Conceptual clarity and direct clarity are not the same. They're not back-to-back -back in opposition. It's just that when you have the conceptual clarity, because it's so seductive, so entrancing, you get pulled into it and it's as if it is the only game in town. And the more open clarity is not there. So for example, you go into your bathroom and you look at your face in the mirror. Now, you know that if you look at the wall, you won't see a reflection. So you can tell there's a difference between a mirror and the wall. But as soon as you look at the mirror, what you're concerned with is the function of the mirror. So the mirror shows you its reflection, and that's enough. So I have no fascination with mi the mirrorness of the mirror. I'm only asking it to show me my reflection. So when I look in the mirror, ah, I've got what I wanted. So what is a mirror? How is it operating? How come my face is suddenly in that and not in that? Well, that could take us on a conceptual story. Or there is the immediacy of the empty mirror is full of me. This is my face in the mirror. My reflection is in the mirror because the mirror has no content. The mirror is empty of self, and so it can fill itself with other, and it is as if the other is the self of the mirror. Because when you look in the mirror, you see, oh, it's me. You don't see anyone else. You see, oh, this is me. So the other, me, is now there in the mirror because the mirror has no content of its own. If you look at the wall, because it's got paint on it, it shows you the wallness of the wall. It's just an impenetrable fullness of paint. It's full of its being green or yellow or cream or whatever. So you see somethingness, but the mirror shows you, oh, there is an emptiness or an openness or a receptivity which by not being determined in and of itself allows the possibility of showing. So when we read Buddhist texts and it talks about the absence of inherent existence, this is what it means. That the mirror is able to show many, many different kinds of reflection because there's no selfness to the mirror. The self of the mirror is the other. Which is quite an amazing thing to, to recognize. So, on a, on a soft level, we have the notion of altruism, which is a similar territory. If you are for the other, then how the other is fills you up. 
you know, if, if you've got a small baby and the baby's sick, there's a, a, a huge amount of filling of yourself with this baby. You look at their face, you see how they are, and you're just full of love and concern, and you want to hold them. You're full of the baby. You can't think of anything else. You don't want to do anything else. So the other, the baby, is you in that moment. You merge into the baby, the baby merges into you. That gives us some relative sense of what the mirror as an image of the, as a metaphor for the mind would be. That the more empty I am, the more there's the possibility of compassion. Because even if we just take the, the, the derivation of the, our English word, compassion means to suffer with. To, to not resist the suffering of the other person. Not to say, well, that's your story, it's nothing to do with me. It means we allow the situation of others to, to touch us, to move us, so that how they are is the shaping of how I am. And I can only do that if I'm willing to allow you to, form, to formulate me, that I am becoming me with you. So that's the big move from a very self-centered thing, a self-centered position. I am myself. I'm, I will decide how I want to live. I'm going to decide <coughs> excuse me, what I'm going to do. That's me being me. Or I'm with you. And how you are is part of my life. And in fact, that sometimes how you are is my life. But that's only possible if I give space to you. Now, very often we do that in some loving or romantic relationship, and it may only last for a while, that we are able to relax our self-concern and let the other in. But you know, Buddhist orientation is to try to ease out the prefigured the f seemingly fixed and continuing sense of self and see it not as an assertion of the truth or vitality of my existence, but we start to see, oh, actually, this is an obscuration. It's obscuring how I am and how the world is. How I am, when I look at the mind, which we'll start to do in practice soon, how I am is open and empty. I have no fixed content. How the world is, is what's revealed here and now. So the world is the revelation of the clarity of this moment. So the emptiness of the world and the emptiness of my mind meet together as the co-emergence of my participation in this unified field. That might sound like an awful lot of words, but it's quite meaningful when we get into it. <coughs> the obscuration is the self-referential feedback looking, looping of this is happening to me, I want to do this, I don't want to do that. So equanimity is the quality of being relaxed and open to everything which arises. It's the dissolving of selectivity. Now, <clears throat> we may feel that we have to select. We have to make some kind of evaluation. Otherwise, we would be overwhelmed. Well, let's go back to that image of being on a hill, looking out over a vast valley. In an instant, you see millions of appearances. You can look, turn and look at a big tree. If it's summertime, the tree is full of leaves. In an instant, there's maybe a million leaves appearing for you. You're not overwhelmed because in that moment, you're just open to the tree. The, we get overwhelmed because 
of our evaluation. I don't want this to be happening. This shouldn't be happening. <coughs> I remember years ago, the first time I traveled on an Indian train, and I got onto it at the last moment. It's completely full of people, and it, the journey was 30 hours, and it spent most of it standing just outside the toilet. I couldn't even sit on the floor. It was just completely crammed. And at first, I started to think I'm going crazy. What the fuck is this? What the, what, what, how is this possible? And then gradually you realize, oh, this is possible because this is what's happening, you know. I can't get off the train because I don't want to be in some little tiny station in the middle of nowhere. I'm in this. And there's only two choices. I'm trapped in this or I'm just in this. And I look around and all the Indians, they're just <coughs> standing, looking, smoking a BD. Just, okay, this is it, this is it. Yeah, but how can they tolerate it? How can they tolerate it? And you look at them and think, oh, they're taking it easy. I have a mental construction which says, this is not how it should be. This is intolerable. This is, this is, this. This is me vomiting my mental constructs onto the world. And then the world's covered in vomit, which is not very tasty. So if we relax and we just think, this is how it is. I have to find my way to be here. Now, who will guide me? The thoughts in my head? My notions from my own country about how things should be done? That just gets in the way. I have to tune into this kind of experience. And so, if I let go of my rigidity of interpretation and judgment, I experience more of my plasticity and I can find a way into being in that situation. And then it's not so bad. So that's, we, we've all probably had experiences like that. And then we start to see the enemy is not out there. It's not how Indian trains are that's the problem. It's how I am. Indian trains are just the way the Indian train is. It's just like that. What, why are you complaining? Because something is the way it is. That would be ridiculous. It's my limited capacity to allow things to be the way they are. So the problem is not out there. Blaming the object is quick and easy, <clears throat> but it obscures the locus of control, the site where control actually is, which is in me, which is I can loosen up or I can tighten up. And if I tighten up, I suffer more. And if I loosen up, it's easier. It's just like that going to the dentist. You go to the dentist, you give them your mouth. They do whatever they do. They poke about. <laughs> you have to give it. You have to just trust. Let them do it. This, my mouth, is now my gift to you, dentist. And have a good look up my nostrils while you're at it. Who would want to be a dentist? But you have to give yourself. Otherwise, it's very difficult. And when people become phobic about going to the dentist, <clears throat> they are filled with anxious thoughts which actually don't pertain to what the dentist is going to be doing, but has to do with their own fears. Their anxiety is their anxiety. It's not based on what dentists do. Sometimes you meet a cruel dentist or a bad dentist, but generally speaking, they're not going to be causing a lot of pain because they don't want to get complaints, they don't want to get trouble and so on and so forth. So I am filling the space with my fear and my anxiety. And I believe dentists are horrible. I hate dentists. So I've now taken my anxiety <clears throat> and disowned it and put it into the dentist, which in some way means I can avoid going to the dentist. I still have the pain in my tooth, but I avoid going to the dentist because I know that they are bad. They are the ones that cause the trouble. But the pain is in my tooth, which is in my mouth. And these are my thoughts. So the paradox is if I take the anxiety back and own it as mine, I can start to dissolve it. But as long as I project it out into the other, it becomes difficult. So this takes us back to equanimity. Believing that some things are intrinsically good, 
other things are intrinsically bad, these are mental formations. And as we touched on yesterday, when we look around, we see that other people don't share our patterning of mental interpretation. They don't share our feelings about kinds of cars or football teams or where to go on holiday or what's the best restaurant or what's the tastiest kind of apple. They have different ideas. Therefore, the truth status of my concepts is quite small. Due to causes and conditions, due to dependent origination, to my family, my culture, my socioeconomic st status and so on, this particular patterning of experience arises for me and seems to me to be relevant and definitive. But it's not relative, I mean, it's not definitive for other people. So it's only definitive for me because of the patterning of the factors that I use to make sense of the world. Oh. It's all about me. This is a very tedious kind of narcissism. It's all about me. Let me say, oh, I am the one who limits me. The world is quite open, but I cut myself off from the world by adhering to my beliefs, my definitions, even although I can see that other people don't share my definition. But it feels absolutely true for me. So as long as I fuse myself into the sensation in my body, my feelings, my memories, this is how it is. This is how it is. This is a limit I cannot go beyond. But other people are all the time. Thunderbolts don't come from heaven. They don't get arrested. Life goes on. They do what they do with more freedom than I have. So how is that? Oh, they're just lucky. Oh, it's astrological. Ayurveda explains, I have too much Peter, that's why I'm like this. The endless numbers of explanations, but actually it's limited for me because I believe in the limit. I believe in the limit. I imagine that I am this person. And if you imagine again and again and again, the imagining becomes solid. It consolidates. So we know this very clearly with the development of obsessional compulsive disorder. Somebody has some kind of anxiety about cleanliness, start to wash their hands a bit much. Then every time they wash their hands, they need to have a clean towel because what's the point of washing my hands if I dry it on a towel that's been used maybe by someone else? But now I'm not sure if this towel is really clean because since I took it out of the washing machine and went out to work, I've come home, someone else might have touched it. So now I have to wash my hands and take the towel out of the, uh, the washing machine because it could be dirty. It could really be dirty. I could get a disease. Nobody can tell me I won't get a disease. People do get diseases. And this might be really dirty. We don't know, but I believe that it might be dirty. So everybody's saying, you're getting a bit tense here, darling. Just relax. It's all right. Don't worry. Why are you telling me not to worry? I have to do this. I have to do this. And when the OCD really locks on, people become like a tank. They just push through everything. Endlessly, I have to, I have to, I have to. Because the thought that arises in me is true for me and it is the truth of the situation. So it, it moves from being relative, it's just my opinion, different people have different notions of cleanliness, to being a completely blinkered, totalized vision and I am the prisoner of it. And that's why it's quite a, a difficult um, condition to treat. But we all probably all have at various periods in our lives been a bit obsessional about things. We get carried away by it. We have to. It has to be done. Other people are saying, just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But I have to. I have to. I think, oh, this, this is the mind intoxicated by an idea. This is an idea, which is something you could move towards or away from, 
but the idea has now caught you and you have caught the idea. So your mind and the idea have merged together and this becomes the functional limit of how you are as a person. This is why it's quite useful as a general uh, practice to, to do things that you wouldn't really like to do. So if you never wear red, buy a red T-shirt. You know, if there's some kind of foods you never eat, eat them. Go over the limit, see what happens. I can eat this, I can wear this. I don't feel comfortable. What's comfortable? Comfortable usually means familiar. I know how to do this. So now I'm doing something that I don't really know how to do. So this is a growing edge. This is an opening out of possibility. So now your repertoire that was quite small expands. And then you have more expansion. So the key point here is for us to observe ourselves. Observe our prejudice. Observe our limits. Observe the kind of choices we make in daily life. What appeals to us and what doesn't. Because if, if you want to have the experience of the panoramic vision that you have on the top of the hill looking out, where you allow everything to be there, that can coexist, be non-oppositional to, or be non-dual with selectivity. Of course, in the world, we do have to select things. But what is the basis of the selection? If you're really hungry, you'll buy a crap sandwich in a, in a motorway cafe because you're hungry. So your hunger is now overriding what you would like to eat or what you would usually eat. It's, oh, God, anyway. So now we see that. It is contextual. It's contextual. But because of the structure of our culture where we are quite wealthy and, and you know, we can make predictable decisions, we can repeat the selection that we make of life until without noticing it, we've cut a groove in the world and we're always going down that groove. At first it was just a choice. Oh, let me try this. Oh, this is really good. I'll get some more of that. I'll get some more of that. Oh, I always buy this one because it's the best. And then you stop trying the others. How would you know that it's the best? So that's what we can observe for ourselves. How we blind ourselves, how we obscure ourselves by overprivileging a particular reading, a particular identification. We do need to choose. In a capitalist economy, there's always more choice than you could. You couldn't take everything, so you have to be selective. It's what is the basis of the selection? So again and again, the Buddhist texts they say that you should act in the manner of a dream, that you have to act, you have to make choices, but not too seriously. It's not a matter of life and death. It's not going to be awful if you buy the wrong kind of potatoes. Oh, these ones aren't good for roasting, but I wanted to roast something. Well, then they'll have to be boiled, or you can sauté them. There's endless things you can do with it. Oh, these tomatoes, the skin's really horrible. What can I mix tomato soup? If you don't want to eat it now, you put it in the freezer. I mean, there's always a way of responding to things if we can be flexible. But if, if the template in our mind has become rigid, well, then we say, I don't want that. That's no good. So that's, if we want to develop a, a capacity for equanimity, particularly given it as if it looks as if uh, the world we're living in is going to become more rapidly changing, more complex, with all sorts of situations imposed on us that would not be our first choice, we will have to inhabit environments which are, for us, not what we would have chosen. And the freedom that has been around since, you know, this economic revival in the 1960s, with its, all its ups and downs, that frame of reference may be changing. We may be coming into a very different world. So if we import the frame of reference that we've had for the last 20 years into changed circumstances, it's going to be difficult. Just as we experience as we get older, the body can do 
uh, fewer and fewer of our habitual activities. Not only the body, but we don't want to do these things. We have become other. But if the template for attributing value continues while the body's health and flexibility and so on goes on, then we have a crisis because you, you feel frustrated. You can't do what you do. I remember as my mum got older, she, there was, she got ripped off a bit from builders coming around to the house. And my brother was saying, you know, it's, you shouldn't have a checkbook. You can't, you can't do this. And then there's a situation where she was allowed a £20 note in her purse and not more because she was into giving a lot of money away to people. She would say, well, I don't need it. Well, why they could have it. Yeah, but well, you might need it as well. And then there was a thing about not having any money because it would always be lost or go there. And she said, why, why can't I have any money? I'm your mother. You're not, you're not functioning that well, but I'm your mother. And in these moments, they're terribly poignant. So there's the, the conceptualization. I used to wipe your ass. I cooked for you. I cleaned. I did everything for you. And now you won't let me spend my own money. What is this? But mum, you, you lose everything. You forget. You walk down, you know, with the purse hanging out of your pocket. You keep the money in your hand. You can't do this. You can't do this. But I'm your mother. So in these moments, you see how the conceptual frame of reference, the identity, this is who I am, this is who I've always been, is now dissonant. It's, it's contrary. It's in contradiction to the actual capacity, the performative capacity for functioning. And that's heartbreaking. But we may well go in the same direction. So what helps is to keep relaxing your template. This is what I used to do. It's not who I am. Rather, I'm not going to merge my sense of self with patterns of activity. The more you change the, the, the tense in your sentences, the more you see, I used to do that. I was like that. And that chapter is finished. So how will I live now, given the health of my body, given the, that I'm living on a pension or whatever it would be? These are new circumstances, and I can become connected with these circumstances just like learning how to travel on an Indian train. But I can only do that if I recognize this is my life now. So if you're living under the shadow of an idea, which is actually out of date and non-functional for you, you're then persecuted by your own notion of who you are. As we see with Brexit, we are Great Britain. We're not so great. We're a small, piddly country with lots of potholes in the roads with falling down hospitals and so on. We're not great, but if you hold on to great and our place in the world and our position, you beggar yourself by trying to have an army and a navy that you can't afford. Oh yes, we need battleships and cruisers and the latest planes. We can't afford it. We can't afford it. But we have to afford it because we are an important nation. Well, maybe we're not an important nation. Maybe we're a small, poor island. Stop talking Britain down. Remember Margaret? She knew what was good for us. Because she was in love with the idea. And if you fall in love with an idea, you get difficulty. And as we looked yesterday, most wars start on the basis of ideas, not of actual phenomena. So the reason we do the meditation practice to scan through the body, to focus on the breath, is to calm our intoxication with ideas so that we can start to see the actual status or truth of the idea. So, we'll have a break in a minute. And go into the kitchen, you have a cup of tea, and there's a plate, and on the plate there's some biscuits. So the thought comes, oh, I have a biscuit. But then we're going to have another thought. I don't need a biscuit. I want a biscuit. I'll have a biscuit. 
I don't need a biscuit. Three thoughts. <laughs> Which thought will win? <laughs> it's, I mean, that is meditation. That is the contemplation, which is the reflection on how your mind works. In every situation, you have a chance to be present with the formulation of yourself, the coming into formation of your patterning in this moment. And then you have an urge, I'll have one, but I don't need that. But I want that. So then we see, I am multiple. I am not the first person singular. I am a variety of voices. I am a house of impulses, of tendencies, of habit formations. And their relative status is shifting and turning. So we're driven by one voice that says, right, oh, Lent's coming. Maybe I can copy the Christians and t take a month and I won't have any alcohol and I want this and I want that. And that might be very useful. But why? I'm not a Christian. I think I'll have a drink. <laughs> so there we see how we lie and cheat to ourselves. We play these games. I'm definitely going to do this. Uh, but I'll start next week. So there, that's, how we, that's how we can lead ourselves into understanding why meditation is important. Because I get carried away by ideas. The tail is wagging the dog. Why am I falling into this idea? If I merge into the idea, I eat the biscuit, and one is never enough. So now I'm eating a lot of biscuits that I don't need. Why? Because of the idea of the biscuit. I've had breakfast, I'm not really hungry, but I'll just have one because they're nice. But I don't need it. It's the power of the object, the biscuit like the sirens is luring me onto the rocks of calories. <laughs> so there we say, oh, that's exactly what it means by attachment in Buddhism. It's, it's the momentary fusion into the pattern which is arising. So it's not that I consciously am attaching myself to something, but I find myself fused with the idea and in that fusion, my body, speech, and mind are moving in that direction. So, time for a 20-minute break, and good luck with the biscuits. <laughs>Okay, so we can start with some practice, <clears throat> and we can do this as an open sitting style. So we just sit in a comfortable way you can do this with your gaze open in the space in front of you or looking down you can explore what works for you because the <coughs> we've just been looking at how our life can be dominated by an idea but uh, life can also be dominated by techniques, and there are many, many meditation techniques and styles of practice. And the reason there are many is because of the creativity of people who've done practice in the past. So which is right for me? Well, you have to find that out. So Dharma can be presented in a very dogmatic way. This is the truth. This is what you have to do. This is our holy tradition. But in the end, there is you. And if you're going to do it, then it has to be something that works for you. So, again, whether the gaze is open into space or looking down the line of the eye, of the nose, try it out. See what is most supportive for you at this moment. Because <clears throat> it, it could be that if you come home from work and you're agitated, uh, you might need to kind of gather yourself in. And so having a more focused gaze could be useful or it could be that you're so full of stuff you want to open yourself out the thing is we're when we have a term like working with circumstances this is what it means we can't know precisely in advance what is right and what is wrong because the first thing is how am i 
how, how is this embodied being? If you're feeling very tired and sluggish, it might, might be helpful to put on a bit of music and dance for five minutes to shift your breathing, or if you know some yoga, pranayama breathing, do some of that. You have to think, well, this is my situation. This is my situation. Am I able to relax and open? If not, what gets in the way? Should I have a hot shower? What would work for me? In monasteries, because everything is so highly choreographed and everybody has to do exactly the same thing, uh, this is a, a kind of group attunement exercise. But we don't live like that. You might be living on your own or doing your practice by yourself. You might not have other people to practice with. So it, it's absolutely vital that you tune in to my current situation and on the basis of what you've learned, get a sense of what is optimally useful now. The goal is always to be able to attend to how it is, not to tell myself how it is, not to apologize for how it is, not to change it into something else, but just to see how is it. So we need to practice doing that again and again. And whenever we get an anxious thought or a controlling thought like, I must try harder or I should do more, be aware, oh, that's a thought. Maybe it has some validity, some of the time, in some circumstances. But if I turn it into an omnipresent driver, I must do this, it's very crude. It's very crude. And the mind is very subtle. So if you apply the crude to the subtle, you're not going to get in touch with the subtle. We have to be soft and gentle and tender and ease our way into being open. You know, if you if you got to dig a hole in the garden or loosen up the earth or prune, that's you know it's quite active. You can you can do that if you're in a shitty mood, you can put your anger into it, whatever. But something which is subtle, very different. You're finding the finesse of your mind. You're fine-tuning your mind. You, you, you can't have that quality of attention without being on your own side. You have to collaborate with yourself. If you try to drive yourself by pushing yourself, by making demands and coercions, it's not very helpful. You can observe this for yourself. When you give yourself a hard time, it may help to make a resolution, but then it's got to be carried through. And if you're imposing something on yourself, I am forcing myself to do this because I know it's good for me. That's one big stupid sentence. I know it's good for me. How do you know that? But I, I know if I don't force myself, I won't do it. Okay, so what's missing? What's really missing is getting used to resistance. I am lazy. Okay, well, that, that's a good starting point. So I'm going to sit in a comfortable armchair and be lazy and be aware of laziness. I'm going to let my laziness speak to me. Now I'm really understanding what it is to be lazy. But that's very difficult to do if you don't want to be lazy. If you feel that it's a moral fault and you don't want other people to know that you're lazy, there's a lot of invitation to cover up and pretense and disguising then or beating yourself up. But if you just say, like yesterday, if you had a sense, I'm lazy, or I'm jealous, or I'm proud. What is this? What is it? Then you get closer to it. You're not being hostile towards it. And then you can collaborate with this emergent pattern so that it doesn't get in the way of opening. So today the sky is lovely. And, you know, after lunch, when there'll be a bit of free time, you can go outside and maybe get a sense of the open sky. <clears throat> Clouds come in the sky. It is as if 
the blue sky vanishes when the clouds are there. But if we really see this infinite openness of the expanse of the sky, we become more aware, oh, the clouds are in the sky. In the moment that the clouds are in the sky, they are, as it were, uh, they are showing us the generosity of the sky. The sky is not afraid of the clouds. The clouds are there for a while, the wind blows, the clouds vanish, and the blue sky is there. The blue sky is there even when the clouds are there. The clouds don't destroy the blue sky. So if you can really see that externally and then take up this metaphor, the mind is like the sky. So various moods come, laziness, anger, self-pity, hopelessness, joy, all kinds of things arise in the mind. If you like, these are just clouds. Some clouds are light, fluffy summer clouds. Some are dark storm clouds, but they arise and they pass. So... If you just open to them, you are returning yourself more to the openness of the sky, and they pass through. But when we misunderstand the structure and we think, oh, the, the cloud or the mood is contaminating me, therefore I have to defend myself against it, the very action of pushing the mood away binds us into it. Because if you push something, you connect yourself with it. And you give it your energy. You're pushing your body energy into the thing you're pushing away. That's why it's moving. You're charging it up. So if you charge up your mood, the mood will become more redolent with energy. It won't dissolve. It's like this. It's like this. It's like this. This is not giving in. This is not hopelessness. This is not powerlessness. It's just hospitality. This has arrived. Welcome. Oh, you're leaving. Goodbye. How, how can we have the confidence to do this? Because everything is impermanent. If you look back in your life, you've had good periods and bad periods. And inside these bad periods, you've had lighter moments and darker moments. And when you had a darker moment, how long did it last? Maybe an hour, maybe a day, but then it changes. <clears throat> and if you really practice attending to your mood, you find it's variegated. There's many little different tonal qualities in it. Oh, where's the enemy? Where's the enemy? This is an aspect of my current experience arising and passing. It comes and it goes. It comes and it goes. And the more you see, and this is not a belief, it's something you can directly see, the content of my mind changes. Therefore, I can't, and this is just a fact, therefore I can't hang on to the good experience and I don't need to get rid of the bad experience because both are coming and going, coming and going. So just stay open to it. So if you're prone to binge eating or addictions or getting lost in something, you can just be there with this impulse and allow it to fill you without bringing it into activity and you can just feel it. And then it goes. Oh, I survived that. The cloud is in the sky. The cloud doesn't kill the sky. But when you go into your ego formation, which is a form of cloud, a cloud hits another cloud and lightning comes and you have a big storm inside. So relaxing the cloud of ego identification into open spaciousness means that the clouds of the object side go free. The self is a, is a formation, it's a shaping. It has no essence to it. Otherwise we couldn't say sometimes I'm happy, sometimes I'm sad. If your ego self was a fixed entity, you would either always be happy or always be sad. But since you woke up this morning, so many variations and fluctuations of mood, feeling, sensation, memory, and so on have been passing through you. All of this is you and gone. You and gone. 
so you can allow it to be there without either fusing in it or having to push it away. It's just there, in the same way that the reflection is in the mirror, and then it's gone. And it doesn't leave a trace in the mirror. When the cloud goes out of the sky, it doesn't leave a trace on the sky. But what is marked is our ego self, because we are impacted. My, the constellation of what I take to be myself, the pattern of my self-identification, is marked. I have happy memories or sad memories. Or, oh, we're going to part, I'm going to miss you, whatever it would be. Some feeling arises inside us. And we seem to be shaped by that. And this is who I am. So what you've got there is a condensation. We're becoming more dense. Like the, the steam of the moment, this ungraspable mistiness of the moment, condenses into little droplets. And now I'm feeling this, and this is really true for me. But then it's gone. Then it's gone. But because I believed it is eternally true for me, every time something similar arises, I join the dots and think, see, I'm always like this. This is me. This is how I am. It's not true. This is a tendency, a pattern, which may repeat and then goes. So we might say, I am aware that from time to time, this feeling arises in me. Or this feeling arises for me. Or this feeling arises. And then it goes. If once you move to the third way of stating it, this feeling arises, without referring it back to the owner or the, the target of the feeling, it's just there, like a cloud in the sky. But when you make it self-referential, this is happening for me, and I don't like it, and I wish it wasn't happening, and I'm going to try and to make sure it doesn't happen. You enmesh yourself in a tussle for control and organization, and, and it just gets more and more entangled. So the practice we're going to do is we just sit in a relaxed way and allow uh, the breathing to come and go as it does. We don't have any uh, predetermined focus for the meditation. We're not trying to do anything. We're just going to be with whatever occurs. So whether it's sensation in the body, or you hear a sound outside, or you see you're aware of other people's bodies moving, whatever is occurring, it's occurring. Just stay open to it. Don't follow after it. Don't wait expectantly of hope for something else. We just stay with whatever's occurring. Any thoughts or questions about that before we begin? Okay, let's do it for a while. Okay. <coughs> so we'll do this kind of sitting a lot. Usually you do it for quite a short period of time because you don't want to be struggling in it, just open. And if it gets cloudy, then you can take a break and go back into it. So we tend to have two main modes with this kind of practice. Sometimes we're a bit spacious and we can have experiences coming and going, like the clouds in the sky. And sometimes we seem to merge into a cloud and we're just in this uh, obscured state, this enmeshed, engulfed state for a while, and then there's a release, and we're here again, and then we get caught up again. So these two are like this uh, first level of ignorance, which is described in the Sokshin text, the co-emergent ignorance, in which the openness of the mind is present, because it's always present, but arising within it is this uh, enclosure or this fixation on a point, the, the sense of something. And when you have something, 
if you go into the something, this something is all there is. So this is what we call being lost or distracted because you're sitting in a more spacious way and then you're off on a little tunnel or a journey and there's thoughts or memories or whatever, you're inside that and then that dissolves and then it's a bit more spacious. So it looks as if I go from one to the other, that there is openness and there is closure. And that these are back to back, these are oppositional, it's either or. So I'm either relaxed and open and free, or I'm trapped in some kind of enclosure. Which brings us back to this image of the cloud in the sky. Because when the cloud is in the sky, is the sky trapped? The sky is still open. It's the very openness of the sky that allows the particular patterning of the cloud to be there. It's the openness of the mirror that allows this reflection, that reflection, all the different reflections to occur. The reflection and the openness of the mirror are not two separate things. They are connected. They are operating together. So they're not contradictions. They are, well, the, uh, the arising is an aspect of the openness of the mirror. If the mirror wasn't open, you wouldn't have these uh, reflections arising. The reflections are the display of the clarity of the mirror. Does that make sense? <coughs> in the same way, in our mind, many different kinds of experience arise. Where do these thoughts come from? If we are sitting in our isolation, then we start to feel, oh, this is happening to me. I am the one, either I am the one doing it, or this is happening to me. Which is, again, a dualistic reading. There's me, and there's what's happening. I go towards it, or it comes on to me. So then we have the question, well, who is this subject? What is this subjectivity? That what I take to be the enduring presence of myself. And we recollect, oh, there are so many ways in which I can be. Sometimes I'm happy, sometimes I'm sad, and so on. That is a particular interpretation or construal. There are so many ways in which I can be. Or we can take the same events and we look at them in another way. Happiness, sadness, expansiveness, contraction are emergent experiences which I can catch or with my sense of self or invest with my sense of self. The arising is arising, and I say this is happening to me, but the arising is arising. So if there's sadness, there's sadness. Who is sad? Well, there's sadness. When you ask the question, who is sadness, there's a tilt or it's, it's the sort of thing you're not supposed to do in a law court. You're not supposed to ask leading questions because they're kind of entrapping. So who is sad? I'm sad. It's kind of set up because the ego wants to insert itself into these experiences. So if you formulate the question as who is sad, I am. But if you say, how is sadness? Oh, well, then we have to, we're not, it's just how is inviting a description of the facticity of the, the, what is there, of how it shows itself. It's not inviting a conclusion. Who is sad? I am. Full stop. No more inquiry required. How is sadness? Oh. 
then you have to kind of tune into it. It's falling through your fingers. Something's there, but it's uncatchable. How am I, how sadness is there, how is it revealed? It just shows itself. Where does it show itself? In this space. What is this space? I say, what? I say, oh, in my mind. What is this space? Oh, it's a space of showing. Oh. So maybe when I say I am, this is a shorthand way of saying I am the space of showing or the space of showing is something that I call I, me, myself. And when I call it that, it makes it more limited, more knowable, more predictable, but also it isolates itself. Sadness arises and passes. Happiness arises and passes. Memories of what I did last week arise and pass. Memories of what I need to do next week. Uh, thoughts of what I'll do next week arise and pass. The past, the future, all kind of things arise. Some of them seem to carry a content of self-reference, of it's about me, or it's about you, and then they vanish. So what is this essence of me that seems to be in them? The thoughts move seamlessly, one after another, with feelings and sensations. Everything is just showing and vanishing, showing and vanishing, a kind of seamless display, I can't get any purchase on that. I can't get any leverage because I, there's, no, there's no way to get hold of it. But if we go back to what we looked at uh, earlier today, by naming it, by identifying it, we stick the handle on the moment. This is happening to me now, I can apprehend it because I've given it an edge or an angle which allows me to say, this is me. So, who am I in this moment? I'm sad. Well, sadness is there. I am sad is added on. It's an interpretive schema which is being applied to the open field of the display. Does it indicate that there is a true, truly existing, inherently existing individual, I, me, myself, who is continuing through time? Is that the starting point? I am the irreducible essence of myself, I am, and because I am, on the basis of my I amness, I am happy, I am sad, I am this, I am that, but it doesn't matter what the flavor is, I am. Or, many different patterns are arising, each of which can be covered in this patina, this thin veneer of I amness. They can be appropriated. They can be taken to be me, and other things are taken to be you. So I am aware I am talking with you. That's an interpretation. Words are coming out. Sound is moving through space. Who is speaking? We can say James is speaking. The words come out of me because I am here with you. This is our co-emergence. You are listening and my speaking create the field of experience in which this is occurring. As we looked yesterday, the quality of your listening facilitates my speaking. If you're not listening, I'm not going to be able to speak. So your, your listening, your capacity to hear allows the words to move through 
what we can call me. But where do they come from? There's si <laughs> silence, then there's sound, then there's silence. As speaking and as hearing. Who is doing it? I am. Who is this I? Well, I is the I is me. Well, what does it refer to? Well, it refers to the one who's speaking. And are you always speaking? No, sometimes I'm walking, sometimes I'm eating, sometimes I'm laughing. Okay, so I is used to refer to the one who seems to be doing the activity. But when we attend to the unfolding of the activity, what do we see? We see walking. We see listening. We see eating. Do we need a sense of an agent who is doing it? So this is, this is central if, you know, to enter into the, the meditation. Because again, the texts always say, in, it's in the manner of a dream, or it's like a mirage, or like a rainbow. When you see a mirage on a hot summer's day, it is undeniable that you see something. But is it a thing? Because as the car gets closer, the mirage vanishes. So you see a rainbow in the sky, you can never apprehend it. So you have an appearance, which in the tradition we call it, an appearance inseparable from emptiness, an empty appearance. That is to say, an appearance that has no inherent self-existence. It's not true from itself. It doesn't start from the essence of rainbow, which then manifests rainbowness out of some essence. There isn't an essence of mirage. What you have is factors coming together. The heat, the way the... the air is, is uh, shifting with the heat, the way the light is bending, gives rise to this illusion of the mirage. It is produced by the movement together of many factors. On the basis of these factors, the mirage appears. It's a dependent origination. There's no essence to it. In the same way, I'm here because of an invitation, because of the trains, because of liking to be with you people, because of many different factors come together, the fact that we're here. You could tell the story in a different way. I'm here because I decided to be here. That's the very short, quick answer, which turns it into a definite conclusion. But when we think about it, well, why am I here? How did it come about that I would choose on a beautiful day like this to be sitting in a room with all these strange ideas? Why, why, how, is, how does this come about? And we think back in our life, oh, to a certain point I became a bit interested in Dharma or I had some trouble in my life and I couldn't make sense of it. Many different pathways arise, pathways of movement, of experiences, of getting more ideas, and these patternings come together and they constellate, they form a, a new pattern for a moment so we find ourselves all together in a room in Macclesfield. It's not driven by an essence. It's an arising which forms us in this particular moment. And then something else forms us and something else forms us. So the absence of inherent self-nature, which you read a lot about in the general Mahayana teachings, means all the phenomena that we see, including ourselves, are not established on the basis of an internal essence. They are not internally generated or internally defined. They manifest in the congruence of many, the, the kind of <coughs> meeting together, the movement together of many different factors, which in a shorthand way we describe by addressing the shaping or the manifestation as if it were a thing. So, Here beside me there is a table, 
in the table is kind of aluminium tubing with some plastic. And we know it's a table because it has that function. So a description could be a, plat, a flat surface with four legs supporting it. And the, the, the four legs can be detached from the flat surface, and so it can be packed away. Or they can be screwed in, and it then seems to function as a table. It functions as a table as long as the legs are attached to it. If you detach the legs, which are detachable, then you have a flat surface and four legs, which is not a table. The, these factors, the four legs and the flat table, have uh, table potential, but they also have uh, violence potential. You beat the shit out of someone with it. You could smash the windows with it. You could do all sorts of things with these parts. Their tableness is not inherent in these constituent elements. It becomes a table due to the juxtaposition, the placing together of these factors. And when they're placed together, you have tableness. A table is a table. It's obviously a table. When we look at it, we, it, it seems absolutely evident this is a table. What is it? It's a table. But it's not a table. It only appears to be a table because of the particular placing together of these factors. And it's a table because of the floor. If there wasn't a floor, it would fall through a big hole in the ground. So what you actually see is table plus cloth plus floor. And the floor is resting on the foundations. And the foundations are resting on the earth. And the flooring is dependent on the funding for the refurbishment of the building and people's continued interest in keeping community facilities like this alive. There are many, many contributing factors to this table being here on this floor. So the table itself has no table essence in it. And the fact that it's here in this room is contingent on many factors, factors which brought it to be here. Someone made the decision to purchase it. The fact that it's here against this wall for our purposes this weekend, and probably will not be like that after we leave. And then after some time, it will be out of date and it will be disposed of. So this is a transient patterning which we apprehend, which we take hold of with our concept of table. And when we call it a table, we seem to be describing for ourselves something which is self-existing out there, but our mind is putting the table into the table. Without your concept of table, without your habit of operating in relation to tables, it wouldn't be there. There are many countries in the world where people don't have tables because they sit on a carpet on the ground and they eat together as a family off a big brass plate. So they don't need a table. But we are in a table culture. So we are educated to believe in the importance of the table. We are educated to believe in the importance of knives and forks. There are many countries in the world where people don't have knives and forks. They eat with their hands or chopsticks. But we, when we see a knife and fork, they are imbued with that significance. We don't need to have that. These may not have that significance. We feel the meaning is in the object but it's put into the object by our mind. So this is probably something we have to look at again and again and again. We see, oh, the essence is not in the object. The essence of the object is a projection of the mind. Therefore, there is no table apart from my mind. There are no self-existing objects. What we call the table is an experience, which is 
the meeting together of what might be called object side factors and subject side factors. So the subject side factor is that if we're speaking in English, we call it a table. And the object side is that there are this particular shaping which supports the application of the term table. So the concept of table and the shape of the object there come together. This is a table. It seems obvious. It's just a table. Stop talking about the fucking table. It's a table. A table is a table. But it's only a table because we believe it's a table. And that can give you a headache. Because it, what it means is, everywhere I go, and I see cars and dogs and people and children, I'm part of that. My mind is bringing dogness to the dog, childness to the child, motor carness to the motor car. That's what it means to be part of the world. You're not on the outside observing a done deal. But this world, your world, is revealed to you through your capacity for participation. Therefore, if you're filled up with yourself, you get less of the world. And when you're less full of your own worries and concerns, you get more world. And the world is very kind, because even if you're feeling full of stuff, you like you know, walk up from the travel lodge up to the square where the church is. You go past the churchyard, and there's a whole mass of crocuses. You just see the crocuses. Ah! So whatever would be in your mind, oh, there's a little gap. Oh! So something of the world is strong enough or beautiful enough to just interrupt you. There were two robins flying around in the tree that I could see from my window. So I spent quite a lot of time looking at them moving. Oh, there's nothing to think about. It's just movement, shapes and movement. Then you conceptualize it and it becomes more dense. You could say, well, the birds were there and they would be there whether I saw them or not. How would I know? They wouldn't be my birds. So the, the problem with reification, with the condensation of experience into separate real entities, means that you exile yourself from participative belonging, you make yourself alien, you make yourself a refugee from the actual world you live in, and then from your isolation, you're filled with longing. Oh, if only I need, why can't I get exactly what I want? It's already there. You're on the inside. Oh, no, I'm not, because I need, I need. But that's the voice of our own alienation. What are we alienated from? Not from the field of experience, which is always open. It's our own conceptualization which creates inside and outside good and bad, right and wrong, mine and yours. That doesn't mean you can just take somebody's purse out of their bag and say, well, it's non-duality, come on. Clearly, patterns have particular locations, but the ownership of a purse is, is conventional. I own this while I'm alive. And when I'm dead, it will be up for grabs for anybody who might be in my will, or if I don't have a will, the state might take it. It is mine due to causes and conditions. It's my money, I work for it. It's mine for a while, as long as I'm alive, due to causes and conditions. And we know that in the currency market, the value of the pound against the euro and the dollar goes up and down. So... The value is labile. We know that there's inflation. We know that food prices are going up. So my 10 pounds, what it can buy today, is probably quite a bit more than it will buy in a year's time. So 10 pounds, that's something. But what is it? When I was a kid, 10 pounds was big. Now 10 pounds year by year is shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. That's what happens. But it's 10 pounds 
Ten pounds is a sign. It's a name. But what does it signify? You've got to spend it. Then you'll find out what it signifies. You can have an abstract notion of the value of ten pounds, but its concrete value is only revealed when you go to the shop. Then you see what you get. And that is shifting and changing with time. Because if there's a sale on, then maybe you get twice as much for your ten pounds. Then there isn't a sale, and it's, you're getting much less. These are relational values. There is no intrinsic value in a ten-pound note. It's a convention. And there's no intrinsic tableness in the table here. It's a convention. It's a convention which seems true for us because we have been disciplined and trained to believe that this is the case. So the table is a mental event it doesn't mean it's only mental. It's not that we are hallucinating tables, hallucinating motor cars, but the tableness of the table, the fact of it being a table, that is a mental event. Because children could play under this, we could turn it upside down if there was snow outside and you could sit on it and scoot down the hill. There's a lot of different things you can do with this shape. But when you hold it inside the conventional frame, the potential which is there is constellated into a shape. Brexit means Brexit. See, this is, what a stupid, stupid, stupid thing to say. Brexit is only Brexit if you want to define it and fuck other people up with it. That's what it means. Is my definition is the truth, so you, sh you should be silent. It's a, Brexit is Brexit is a statement of control. Well, let's think about what it would mean. What are the implications of this? Is it really a good idea? We don't need to do any of that. Brexit is Brexit. A table is a table. A potato is a potato. No, it's not. No, it's not. So you go to peel the potato and you see, oh, there's a little hole. And then you maybe cut around the side of it and think, oh, somebody's living in there. This is their house, their home. Could I really want to eat someone else's house? <laughs> so I'll put it out in the garden. Have a good winter, my little worm. <laughs> many, many possibilities are there. But we put our blinkers on and it becomes dense and solid. We are the ones that make ourselves stupid. We stupefy ourselves by believing we can know in advance what is the case. So again, we're back to the problems of conceptual knowledge. It's not, it's not that concepts are wrong, but the potential of the field is always bigger than our conceptual interpretation. So we may need to conceptualize a situation as a way of mobilizing resources to make something occur, but that's not the end of the story. There's always possibility. There's always something which can be done. That's why we can mobilize our resources in terms of climate change, in terms of the loneliness of many older people and so on. You can make a decision to visit people or write to them or join in with other people. There are ways in which you can mobilize yourself because it is potential. If everything was a done deal, you know, some apocalyptic drama that's being set out about the end of time and how the earth's going to be burnt up and so on. Then you paralyze yourself. But you think, how is it? How is it? Because if you want to change something, you have to find the point of change. If you just push and push and push and push in a blind, desperate way, it's not going to be very effective. But if, if you find where the hinge is, where the moving edge is, then applying some pressure there will be helpful. Because there's always a moving edge. The table is not inherently a table. It is contextually a table. And if the context changes, you can detable the table. So that's why they say in the Bible, you can beat the swords into plowshares. When the war is over, you can take the uh, implement of killing 
and turn it into something which will help food to grow so that people can be fed. It's not a fixed thing. It's not a done deal. Nothing in life is a done deal. It's always, here is the potential. How am I construing it? Which brings it back to my mind, my tendencies, my proclivities, my hopes, my fears. Maybe time for a bit of spring cleaning. What are the assumptions that I am operating from? Do I need to allow myself to be dominated by these habit formations? Perhaps the world is more open than I think it is. <coughs> so it means l looking outside with fresh eyes to see the, the potential of the field and then observing yourself to see how you close things down, how you prefer the familiar. I know how to do this, so I'll do it again because when I do what I know how to do, I feel competent. So I'm using my self-restriction into a limited functioning as a way of reassuring myself that I really exist and I'm a good, competent, efficient person. Why do I want to be a person? When we read the Dharma text, it says, actually, you're a Buddha. So you could be a person who knows who they are, or a Buddha who's awake and alert and responsive. Mm, person sounds good, actually. <laughs> I know where I am. My mum always thought I was a person. She trained me to be a person, and I love my mum. I couldn't possibly be a Buddha. She'd be very upset. She'd be really upset because you get a bump on the top of your head when you get a, become a Buddha. That's the problem, isn't it? The price of belonging. We, f we want to fit in. We want to be seen as normal. We want to be accepted. But actually, how am I? We are endlessly shifting patterns of formation. So that would be really what we're tr trying to see. How could we have equanimity? How could we be balanced in all circumstances if we continue to be at the mercy of the arising and passing of factors which, in our ego sense of self, we find difficult? Because in being me, there are some things I like and some things I don't like. And therefore, I have to try to get more of what I like and get less of what I don't like. This is just obvious. But the starting point for that is, I'm me. And the function of our practice and our study together is to try to put that into question. Am I assuming things about the, my, myself, my identity, which might not be the case? It's not that I'm nothing at all. That would be one extreme, a nihilistic extreme. But it's also perhaps not the case that I'm just me, I'm always me. That would be a kind of extreme view of eternalism. Maybe how I am arises with circumstances. Therefore, I am a potential which is revealed through my participation. And maybe I could relax a bit more and allow more of my potential to reveal itself. But it's going to reveal itself in the emergent moment, so I cannot know in advance how I'm going to be. I can be ethical and unpredictable. Because how could you be responsive if you were truly predictable? Because if you were really predictable, you'd be like an engine. You just turn around and turn around, and it would always be the same. But we are not engines. We are responsive creatures. This is a problem with the national curriculum. Teachers can't respond to the class and how the children are because they've got the schedule of the teaching schedule that has to be met. Many, many jobs now are absolutely restricted like that. With the additional thing that because of the rise of litigation, if you follow the rules, if you follow the pro forma schedule, even if something goes wrong, you won't be in trouble. That's the case for surgeons. If they're carrying out an operation and there's a clearly defined way of doing things, 
Even if the patient dies, they've done the right procedure. Sometimes people die. But if you go off-piste, if you try something new, because according to your understanding and maybe your great experience, you need to, to be a bit inventive. If something goes wrong, you're much more open to exposure. Therefore, following the rules is safer. More than my job's worth. That's, that's the paranoid feeling which is around. Taking risks exposes you. But actually, life is always risky because it's always a new, fresh formation. No, it isn't. Just put the blinkers on. Don't think so much. Just do what you have to do. Do what you have to do. How will I know what you have to do? Oh, someone will tell you. Don't worry. There'll always be someone who'll tell you what to do. And how will they know? Oh, because there's someone else telling them what to do. It's a great chain. And at the top is Mrs. May, who clearly knows exactly what to do. If only Jean-Claude Juncker would let her. That's the problem, isn't it? She's a good woman, trying her best for Britain. But these damned foreigners, ungrateful after all we've done for them, just the madness, absolute madness, because it's abandoning potential. It's going for a conclusion. This is what has to happen. This will be good. No evidence for it, but if you assert it often enough, it takes hold of people's minds, and we become paralyzed by a dogma. And the one thing about difference between the uh, three Semitic religions and Buddhism is that Buddhism is not dogmatic. It's not saying you have to believe in impermanence. It says, I think impermanence is a fact. Check it out for yourself. It's not saying you are distracted. It means like sit and try and focus your mind. Oh, you notice you're distracted. It's an invitation in, to inquire into what is there. There's almost nothing in Buddhism you have to believe in. Because belief is I believe in this. So you have subject, verb, and object. Belief is a linking between me and something I'm thinking about. Whereas what we're concerned with is to be awake and present in the moment of the showing. So we'll have a, a gap for lunch now. And again, we're in a situation where you have eating and walking and the sunshine. Inhabiting a flow of experience, or in another way, you are inhabited as and by a flow of experience. Life is unfolding, whatever you're doing. So just try to let it reveal itself. You take this image of the mirror. The mirror is not moving. It's not blocking what's arising. It's not choosing to have more or less of this. It's just with this. This is happening. This is happening. So you walk down the street, some things look beautiful, some things look ugly. I'm the mirror. I receive both. Oh, but I, I want to look at that. Oh, what is that? I'm turning towards this and away from that. Maybe just pause for two minutes or one second. Oh, I can see both. I can see the dirt on the street and the beauty of the first buds in the tree. They are together. They are together. This is the quality of our world. It's always complex. Always complex. Everything arises together. So if you take out your scissors and you try and cut a line between the good and the bad, endlessly you're trimming and trimming and trimming and trimming and trimming. It all comes together. So how can I be open? It doesn't mean that I'm at the mercy of ugly, horrible things, but it's here. This is how it is. There's the graffiti, and then there's the children playing. It's together. So this is inclusivity of awareness, which is the profound basis for equanimity. Because if I say, this is all happening, it is happenings. Happening means it's dynamic and moving and changing. It's coming, and then it's going. It's coming, and then it's going. Why do I need to be in there pushing it about? Of course there is a time to be active and to make change. If there is something which really needs to be done, it's not about being just passive receptive all the time. But the key thing is to 
see, oh, my mind contains everything. So my mind is not who I think I am. That the notion of being an individual self is an obscuration to the openness of your mind. And we'll look more in the Dzogchen view uh, in the afternoon and tomorrow morning. But you can start to, to really experience this for yourself. How do you close down? How do you limit yourself? Getting to know, oh, how I restrict myself. Okay, so if we have an hour and a quarter for lunch, we're back at quarter past two. In the explanation of ignorance, uh, after this uh, co-presencing of the openness of the mind and the first sense of there being an entity, something, that leads into the second stage, which is the ignorance of um, identifying everything which is the development of conceptualization, which um, gives names and functions and meanings to whatever it encounters, both on the object side and on the subject side. That is to say, it's a process of making sense. Because the intrinsic meaning or the depth or the truth of the openness of the ground of our being has uh, not been attended to, there arises the question, well, what is it and who am I? And these questions then lead to uh, the elaboration of concepts as answers. This is a dog, this is a frog, I am a man, and so on. So the ego comes into formation through propositions. It is itself a propositional form, I exist. If you say that, it's easy enough to believe it, but what does it mean? When you actually look at how this I is, it's ever-changing in its content. So, I exist, yes, I exist as a sign. I exist as a name. I exist as a concept, that's true. But as a phenomena, the I does not exist. The I is a, is a <clears throat> what we take to be the eye is a kind of wrapper which <clears throat> keeps going round and round each moment as it arises, separating inside from outside, <clears throat> but itself has no enduring internal truth or uh, validation. So the ego is constantly active in continuing to find contents for its empty self. So there's a presence, I, we're all present here, we're here, we're not asleep, we're not dead, I. And in its most naked form, it's just there's nothing in it, it's just, oh, here-ness, if you like. This, or in, Buddhist language, thusness, tatata, thusness. It's like, oh, oh. So I, and then I am. I am male, I am Scottish, I am this, I am that. And with each elaboration, <coughs> it's getting thicker and more dense because something is being massaged into it. Each moment is Give, secreting some excess which is then massaged in as if you were making focaccia or something and you, want, you have to bring the olive oil into the dough. So you might mix it roughly with a bit of water first and then you start to put the olive oil into it. And you have to do it again and again and again until it goes pervading. So every time you have an interaction in the world, you're making this <coughs> densification of the experience, 
so that it seems to be inherent and self-validating. So, I am Scottish. I am Scottish, though I don't want to live in Scotland. I am Scottish because I was born in Scotland. So, being born in Scotland is the happenstance of my parents' relationship and work and so on. So being Scottish is a contingent event. It's contingent on many factors operating. <clears throat> I just happen to have been born in Scotland. If things had been slightly different, I would have been born in India. But my mum didn't want to go to India. because My dad was in the Indian Army, so he gave up being in the Army and went back to working in the bank in Scotland. And so I was born in Scotland. <clears throat> due to causes and events. So th there's a kind of happenstance to the fact of my conception and my birth in Scotland, which makes me Scottish. And Scottishness seems to be something, but what is it? Because there are many, many Scotlands. There's the Highlands, the Islands, the Lowlands, the Central Belt. There's the difference between Edinburgh and Glasgow. In Glasgow, the difference between the West End and the East End and so on and so forth. You've got a million, million locational Scotlands, and you get as many Scotlands as there are people living in Scotland. And you get each of these people having their own Scotland, which changes through time and their mood and the seasons and how the football's going and all the rest of it. So Scotland is a really, really indefinable non-entity. But it's made an entity <clears throat> by the investment of content to support the basic belief that there is such a thing as Scotland. Scotland is an idea. All countries are an idea. Everything is an idea. An idea is a, is a shape or a form which arises in the mind. So, in order to particularize myself, to, to give a contouring to myself, I have to privilege certain features over others. Otherwise, there'd be no specificity. We'd just be people. Like at the time of Mao Zedong in China, everyone's wearing the same blue clothing. And they're just, everyone's then Chinese. Or if you go in France, in the country, all the farmers are wearing, you know, a blue jacket and blue pants. It's a kind of uniform. And there's a standardization, or in Britain in the war, lots of people were in uniform. And uniform is designed to be uniform, that is to say, to smooth out individual differences. But we, as ourselves, we want to <clears throat> manifest our difference from other people, to say, hey, I exist as me. I am. And I'm not you. I am me. And then we fill in the details, but the basic structure is there. I exist as someone. So this is ignorance. What is it ignoring? The fact that moment by moment, <coughs> what we are, what the world is, is revealed to us through its occurrence, through its happening, through its showing, through its unfolding, its revelation. So I went for a walk on the, up to the, an old churchyard up there. It was very beautiful. The sun was shining. And lots of things are happening. You're walking along. And I was walking with Katrin, and we are talking about, oh, how Macclesfield is and how it's different from Germany and so on. So, just as we were describing before lunch, millions and millions of things are being revealed to us, but we are having a friendly commentary, chatting about what's there, and it's so selective and so privileging of certain features. And that's what we do. It is inevitable, if we're wanting to define things, that we operate the law of exclusion. If it's this, it's not that. It's, in fact, this is only this because it's not that. It is the, the extrusion of the other that allows this to be the case. So, for example, if you were doing a diagnosis, whether it's in psychiatry or general medicine, 
there are lots and lots of factors which could be there, and now you can get all kind of tests done. And as you're coming to the formulation of the diagnosis, there are probably other conditions which could mop up most of the gravy. They can cover a lot of that territory. So you're, you're going more precisely into the detail so that you can come to a conclusion, well, if it's this, it's not that. And only when you can be a bit clearer that something is truly the case because you've excluded these other possible identifications, then you have a certainty, okay, this is the actual condition, so what's the treatment plan going to be? So if it's, if it's a <coughs> just a bad case of flu, that's one thing, but if it's bronchitis, it's a bit different. And if it's a chest infection, which might need antibiotics, it's another. So if you're sounding someone's chest, you're really going to be listening for, oh, what, what's the differential, differential evidence here? So this selecting and sifting is very, very helpful for defining situations which highlight, make figural certain aspects and cause the rest to recede into the background. So it's about gestalt formation, a shape which appears to represent something, which appears to have some definitive internal validity. So now we know where we are. There's this, and if it's this, it's not that. Where is all this movement occurring? I'm aware that it's occurring. My mind is moving, thoughts, feelings, memories. It seems lucid in a sense, in the sense that it's, <coughs> it's clear that this is my experience and it's a little bit um, impactful, a little bit bright and shiny. Where is the illumination coming from? Is the illumination coming from the thought, a thought self-illuminating? <clears throat> is it my ego self, my mind? I'm a bright guy, I can see what's going on. Is that the illuminating factor? Or is it the field which is illuminating? So the mirror, <coughs> excuse me, has in its clarity the capacity to reveal a wide, wide range of shapes, colors, and so on without compromising its own openness. The, it's the quality of the glass and the silvering on the back of it, in a functional sense, which allows this clarity to be revealed. So, our mind reveals things. Do I reveal what's in my mind? Or does the clarity of my mind reveal me revealing other things which are in my mind? So this, is, this would be the major distinction that we would be inquiring into. Because if I, as my ego self, am the revealer, then I am the subject and everything that's revealed to me is the object and I, the bright, intelligent subject, illuminate the world on my terms. That's our normal dualistic way of seeing it. But I know that I am in Macclesfield. How bright I am. I know I'm in Macclesfield. Macclesfield is here. I am here in Macclesfield. I know this. I, the subject, know I'm in Macclesfield. But I know that I know I'm in Macclesfield. And I know that I know that I know I'm in Macclesfield with an infinite regression like little Chinese dolls. Who is the one who is actually knowing? When you take knowing to its finest, it's just like the mirror. It's an empty knowing. It's the clarity of the mind which allows what is revealed to be there. Just as in a theater, it's the emptiness of the stage which allows the play or the dance or the orchestra to perform. If the stage wasn't empty, the movement couldn't occur. The subject is a movement of the mind. The object is a movement of the mind. These are both experiences. Neither has inherent existence, but are pattern formations playing together, pulsations of subject, object, subject, object. 
I, as a person, am both subject and object. When you said that to me, I felt upset. You said that to me, I am the object, I am the recipient, you did that to me, and I felt, now I'm a subject. So I'm object to subject, object to subject. And when we have a conversation with someone, and you have a good articulated conversation, you have a pulsation. You are speaking, so you're the subject, I'm the recipient object, you are speaking to me. And then sometimes it goes softer, and we're speaking together, we're speaking with each other, so we have intersubjectivity, but slightly structured as subject to object. Does that seem reasonable? So subject and object are modalities of experience moving within the lucidity of the mind. It's not that we don't exist. It's not that there is no self. It is that there is no self-existing self. It's not that, you know, you have books like the Zen Doctrine of No Mind. Well, you'd be up shit creek if you didn't have a mind. You have to have a mind. But your mind is not yours. It's not that you have a mind. Your mind shows you to you as a content of the mind. So you, or I, me, myself, in the moment of my life, I'm an emergent characteristic of the openness of awareness. Does that make sense? But when I grasp at it and make it solid, yeah, but what about me? Fuck, you said that to me, you bitch. And when you get in a bad mood, it gets dense, doesn't it? It gets thickened. <gasps> Outrage. That's energy. Energy condenses. So you watch the forecast, you see these little uh, lines showing the, the density of what's going on. Or if you go out in the country, you've got a Norden and Survey map. When the lines get close together, that shows it's quite a steep slope. When the lines are further apart, it's going to be a gentle walk up the hill. So density shows intensity. That's what we get when I get angry or sad or jealous or whatever it would be. When I feel more relaxed, it's more spacious. But both are patternings. So there is self, but a self is a pattern of the manifestation of the energy, which is the potential of the mind to show itself. So if we get clearer about that, then... Who is the one who is getting upset? It's a pattern of upsetness which has been evoked. It's not that I have been whacked by something you said, that I have been done to. I have been done to as an interpretation of the nature of the interaction. So if I stay with what's going on, you said this, and I felt that, so I said that, and then you got like that, and then, and then, and then. You get a process description, which is an interweaving of momentary patterns. You said something, I get upset, I say back to you strongly, you say, but I didn't say that. This is what I said. I say, oh, I'm sorry, I must have misunderstood what you said. So my arousal then is deflated, because they think, oh, I was in the wrong. You just let the air out the balloon. Oh. So we, we know what these experiences are like. That misunderstandings lead to concretization. It all becomes locked in. And then, oh, it's not like that anymore. So from this point of view, equanimity is to start to see the truth status, how things truly are, the truth status of subject and object. The subject is not a thing. The object is not a thing. There are no things, fixed entities, inherently defined. What there are are patterns of emergent formation arising due to complexities of factors. And each of these factors is also not self-existing, but they are also relational. So you have an endless interweaving 
all forms, and each moment of arising is a kind of nexus, a kind of meeting place of many different emergent factors, which is endlessly moving and shifting all around us. So it's like uh, if you were standing <coughs> and on a little bridge looking at, down at a pond and you see this, this beautiful, clear, smooth surface and then it starts to rain and there's a drop on the surface and then a little ripple goes out and another drop. And within a few moments, drop after drop after drop, you get centers, ripples, expansion everywhere and the ripples are running over each other and you get this incredible complexity of movement. And each pulsation in hitting the other, they generate a new movement and a new movement. Well, this is what it's like for us to be human beings. It's patternings of interactions of energy. Nothing is established in and of itself and yet manifestation is clear. <clears throat> so in the traditional formulation they say that <coughs> the mind and everything that arises with it is unborn and unceasing. Unborn means it has never come into true existence. The umbilical cord has never been cut. That is to say, when you look in a mirror and you see your face, the reflection is in the mirror. You can't take the mirror, the, the reflection out of the mirror. When the pregnancy comes to term, the baby has to come out of the mother. One way or another, we've got to get the baby out because that's important. The baby comes out, the umbilical cord is cut. Now we have mother and baby. The baby is now a separate being functioning in the world, breathing with its own lungs and so on. Unborn means that it hasn't come out, that there has been no separation, and yet manifestation is ceaseless. So if you imagine you got, if you've got a car, and you're going on a journey, every second, every... Uh, small aspect of a second as you're going along say 30, 40, 50 miles an hour reflection after reflection after reflection is arising in the wing mirror the mirror is empty but it's full the reflection which arises is in the mirror, it's undeniable it's useful, that's why you've got a wing mirror so you can look and see what is currently arising in the, on the road behind you, someone's going to overtake. It's unceasing, ceaseless display of image after image, but they're unborn because they remain inside the mirror. So when we apply this more directly to the mind, the mind itself is unborn, you can't find it. It's not established as something. And the thoughts and feelings and so on which arise in the mind also have no <coughs> independent existence of their own, and yet they ceaselessly display themselves. So this is an endless shimmering movement of experience, wave after wave after wave that's going on through the senses, through memories, ceaseless. But nothing ever comes out of it. It's all within the mind. That this is not an idealistic philosophy. It's not saying everything just is the mind. But what we have access to is experience. So, when you look in the mirror, you see your face. This is undeniable, yeah? That's why you look in the mirror. Except you don't see your face, you see a reflection. Your face is invisible to you. You will never see your own face. All you can ever see of your face is a reflection. You might see a photograph or a movie of it, or you see what's in the mirror, but you never directly see your own face. It's impossible. Unless maybe you somehow you're able to take your eyeballs out and turn them around. <laughs> Which could be... Uh... 
Yeah, interesting. <laughs> so your face for you presents itself as a representation. Your face doesn't directly present itself to you. It presents itself to other people. But you are for you a representation, just as they are for them a representation. But you're a presentation to them, which they make sense of through their mental representations. And the more representation there is going on, the less fresh it is. So if you just see, it's fresh. So in the text it often says, uh, with this you will see your own face. Own face there means your face which is not a representation. The immediacy of your mind. The immediacy of your mind is everything. This world is your face. Other people are your face. It's a little bit metaphorical. Don't want to get too carried away here. But what does it mean? Other people are your face. They're what you see. Your face is, it's you, but it's you facing out. What you get, moment by moment, is the unfolding of your face, which is empty and manifesting. But it's not manifesting as something. So if you look around the room and you think, God, there's all these different people, they can't all be my face. Then you started in the wrong place. Because you started from the assumption there are real separate people. But what we've been trying to look at this morning is that is a set of abstract concepts. Other people, as people, are your idea. Maybe you can remember as a child how awful it is when you hear big people talking about you. We, Jimmy, oh, it's a bit of a handful. God, we not. No, it's horrible, isn't it? People talk about you because you exist as a thing for them, as an object, an object of their thoughts. So what they're doing in talking about you is talking about themselves. They think that they are illuminating who you are, but it's not a photo of you, it's an x-ray of them. That's the first form of freedom. When you realise you can only ever talk about yourself, the whole world is counter-transference. <laughs> <laughs> so these things are very important in terms of meditation because <clears throat> it means that whenever we go into trying to sort things out, we're starting from assumptions that things really exist and have some truth in them, which if only we poke about and investigate enough, we'll get to the heart of the matter to what it really is. But it's not really anything. It's simply patterns. It's simply patterns. Patterns are impactful. If you're driving in the car and you look in the reflection in the mirror, it tells you some drunken bastard's trying to overtake you. That's dangerous. So you want to pull your car over and let them go. Good luck to you. So the fact that something is just a pattern is incredibly important. Everything is just patterns. Patterns without individual essence because we are here. Some people are sitting on seats. Some people are sitting on the floor. You have to be somewhere. You're always somewhere. If we have a break, you go out the door. Some people choose to go outside. Some people stay inside. You have to be somewhere. At the end today, you go off into the evening, you go somewhere. We're all, somewhereness is part of who we are. We exist in terms of location and duration. We're always in a place for a while, in a place for a while. We are contextual creatures. I am not a monad. I'm not an isolated phenomena. I'm interacting all the time. And therefore, my patterning is inseparable from the patterning of other people. So my posture at the moment is a conversation with the chair. These chairs are not great because the seats tilt slightly back. This is designed by an osteopath for their pension plan. (laughs) 
<laughs> it's clear. So, but our body is always in a conversation. Whether you're standing or walking or in the shower or having a bath, your body is in relation to what's around it. What is the natural shape or the neutral shape of your body? How should you be if it weren't for other factors? But you never, ever, ever have a chance not to have other factors. We are conversational or co-emergent. Therefore, where is the entityness of me? I am always me plus. Me plus where I am, sitting on the train or walking or going to the shops talking with some therapists or whatever it would be. And in each context, we emerge in dialogue, expressing, receiving, transforming. So a good conversation, you start in one mood and you end up in a different mood because something touches you and moves you and you are transformed because our formation is not the formation of a fixed essence. The formation, our beginning uh, positioning is like an opening gambit in chess. It's a way of beginning. You say something and then it takes off and it takes on a life of its own and you're in play with what's going on in the world. There is no individual essence. So all the Buddhist texts return to this point again and again and again because it's very difficult for us to get it. You might think, I had a really difficult mum. Who is that person? Where are they? They're in your mind. Outside, that person may have friends. Unlikely as it is, they may have friends someplace. They may have friends whose experience of them is not your experience. Because she's not their mum, she's their friend. But as your mum, uh-oh. Just like that. So what is the truth of that person? There is no truth to people. You will never, ever know anyone, and you will never, ever know yourself. Knowledge is a cul-de-sac, unless you're repairing a car engine, in which case you can have definitive knowledge, and if you're the mechanic, please, please have definitive knowledge. Because you can know about car engines, but you can't know about people, because people change. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? So the conclusions we have about ourselves, I'm stupid or I'm lazy or I'm not very good at this, kind of things I described yesterday that completely imprisoned me when I was a teenager, they felt so real and true, but they were just ideas. But as long as you believe in the idea, it will truly catch you and then you can hardly breathe. Caught by an idea, caught by a thought. Imagine that, to be caught by a thought. Whole nations can be caught by a thought, by a revolution, by a fascistic sloganeering system, and everybody's out marching in the street. We are easily caught by thoughts. But the thought is evanescent. So this is why we, we, when we do the practice, we sit and we relax. <coughs> and we just stay open to what is occurring. Not trying to hang on to things that we deem to be good, not trying to push away things that we deem to be bad, but allowing the free flow of whatever is occurring. This is meditation. It's not what we do when we're out in the world, but what it's doing is clearing the decks, clearing the decks so that we gain access to more of our potential because when you operate in the world with other people, we mobilize our potential in our interaction with them. And if we only have a very restricted neurotic um, portfolio of moves, then we're just going to be a bit obsessional and do more of the same. Um, any neurosis is simply a limitation of patterning possibilities. <clears throat> whether it's due to <coughs> anxiety or depression. It's just a, a, a formation. But we have potential, which is much, much greater. So when we don't interfere with what's arising in the mind, and we start to see these patterns arise and pass, arise and pass, 
the less you interfere, the more space there is for different patterns to arise and pass, and different patterns. And then you really, really be clear, oh, my mind is truly like a mirror. Many reflections, many patterns come and they go and I'm still here as clarity. I'm not a thing, I am clarity. I am the illumination of what's occurring. I'm not a thing. I'm just this presence, the presence of the clarity that reveals the unfolding of everything that arises, whether it looks object or subject. That's what we want to awaken to, because that's how it is. When you keep looking, that's what you see. Everybody ends up seeing the same thing, because that's how it is. The content of your mind will vary for each person in the room. Each person will have their own memories, thoughts, feelings, and so on. But the structure is the same, that none of these patterns is truly definitive of you as an essence. There is no essence. So whether you have a tendency to anxiety or depression or pride or confusion, self-doubt, whether you let other people exploit you, whether you exploit other people, don't try to change it. Just stay present, be with the pattern, and patterns will be self-liberating, that is to say they go free by themselves, but what is more, when you allow the pattern to run freely, the charge that it carries, which is built up maybe in a family nexus, say you had a, <coughs> a, partic <coughs> excuse me, a particularly difficult parent who was always on your case and judging you and putting you down, you carry a charge inside yourself, like a, you know, like if you're static electricity, if you've been combing your hair a lot, you build up this charge inside yourself and it will discharge itself in, in various ways. But the more you allow the thoughts to run freely, they decharge themselves, not as a mobilizing discharge where you find yourself in some habitual response, but the charge just bleeds out. It releases itself like a battery running down. And then you see more clearly how it is, not through the uh, tainted lens of your fears, your hopes, your desire for compensation and so on. So that's the reason for allowing the mind to run free. It's not that we're inviting some total chaos and we're going to get washed away. If the more you allow your mind to run free, the more clarity you will have. And the more you try to manipulate and control your mind, you'll be endlessly busy, endlessly busy. Because, as we know, if I, if I take my right hand as the active one and I push against my left hand, if I don't resist with my left hand, it's just pushed over. So every time you push, you're transferring energy from the pushing mode into the pushed. So when you push on your thoughts, you're charging them up. And that's what a neurotic, a neurotic structure is. People who've got a tendency to anxiety are charging themselves up all the time, going into worrying loops round and round and round, or depressive <coughs> thoughts and ruminations about suicide and so on. They're charging it up, rubbing it in. Just as you rub your hands together, and you feel the warmth. This is friction. This is what we're doing. We're fricative. And we want to separate it. So no charge there at all. So you're just easing back. You don't want to have to separate like that. Because if you got completely separated, you'd just be in your isolated place, not able to operate in the world. So you want to find the op optimum proximity of how you can be without falling into it. You need to be close enough to feel the experience, but not so close that you get entangled. Now, the, in Dzogchen, the focus of this is to awaken to your mind a space, because space lets the cloud in. That's what we looked at in the morning. The clouds come in the sky, but they don't contaminate the sky. They're in the sky and they go through. So 
If you're in awareness, whatever arises is no problem. If you're in the identification with the patterning of your ego self, it does matter. Because the ego self is like blotting paper. It takes on, it saturates itself with the feeling tone of what's around. Which then goes. The object is impermanent and the subject is impermanent. But when you, somebody, send, somebody says something to you and you get upset and you walk home upset, cooking inside, you're chewing on it. You're chewing the cud. You're extracting optimal bile out of the situation. It's gone. But I'm not letting it go. And so, that is so helpful when you realize that. The event is gone. The words they spoke to me took 30 seconds to say. And two days later, it's still cooking in me. I am pulling the past into the present. I am doing this. I am unforgiving. I am a time traveler. I go into the past worrying and thinking what was said. I go into the future planning my revenge or how to avoid them or da da da. I'm so dispersed. How will I have clarity? And everything's jangling me now. I've woven my life like a spider's web so that anything landing on it sets me going. What was that? Why did they do that? Well, thought production's coming all the time. So we think, oh, the mind is like the mirror. Let it come. Where, how does the harm arise? by me being absorbent. The surface of the mirror is clear. It doesn't absorb. So in the Tibetan tradition, or no, in the Indian tradition originally, this is called Vajra. Vajra means indestructible. Indestructible. When you put something really horrible in front of the mirror, say, I don't know, say you pull the eyes out of a child, little three-year-old smiling and laughing, you take a pencil and whack their eyes out. Fuck it, hell. It's in the mirror. It's in the mirror. Does the mirror vomit? You might vomit. Does the mirror vomit? Is the mirror upset? I'm a bothered? Yeah. The mirror's just a mirror. Huh? The mirror is not improved by beautiful things and it's not uh, made ugly or horrified by bad things. So you can read in the Dharma text, in a text I think used to recite here, it's in the big Rigsin text for those who know it, where Rigsin Godem says, <coughs> the, the mind is not improved by the good thoughts of the Buddha and the mind is not defiled by the bad thoughts of sentient beings wandering in samsara. The mind is like a mirror, it's just neutral. It's unborn. If you have that basic clarity, then you see without bias, with equanimity, the various pattern formations, and then you can work with that energy. It's not about being passive like the wallpaper and anything happens to it and it can't move. It's not like that. But it's because it's open and relaxed, it can see clearly, and then when you move into the expression of energy, which arises like a dream within the field of awareness, it's much more precise. So the key thing is to awaken to your mind that you are present whatever the content is there. This is the unvarying presence of awareness, which is present with the varying presence of the ego self. That is to say, our ego identity, how I feel, how I am, what I want to do, is endlessly fluctuating, expanding and contracting and hopeful and despairing and so on. All kind of, is very, very labile, unpredictable. But it's revealed, all these movements are revealed in the clarity of the mind. So you have awareness and what awareness shows which is a field of clarity within which this precise movement. So the way we uh, get close to that is just by doing the basic sitting and being present with whatever occurs. 
And if you find, oh, this isn't working for me, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, that is an idea. So you've fallen in love with an idea. You have believe your idea. So now you're lost. And you're sitting there thinking, but what am I doing? That's a thought. The thought lacks clarity. What's happening to the thought? It's vanishing. In front of you, it's vanishing. But you believe it. If you go to the market and buy something and you take it home and it's crap, you go back to the market, they've closed the market. All the traders have gone. You're not getting your money back. Better to go to the shop. The shop is always there. You can take it back to the shop. Thoughts vanish like the market trader. They put up their stall. I can't meditate. It's all fucking stupid. What am I doing here? This is crap. Oh, I'll buy a big bag of that one. <laughs> By the time you take it home, your bag's empty. What was I thinking? I can't remember. Oh, gone. I'm, I want my money back. It's vanishing. Thoughts vanish. Why would you imagine that a vanishing thought is going to tell you the ultimate truth about who you are? Thoughts are ornaments. In the Tibetan tradition, they're called sky flowers. They're, they're just something beautiful, shining, like a firefly. They move through the space of the mind. But they don't establish anything. They're patterns. It's like listening to music. The music can give you hope or fear, all sorts of things. You listen to Debussy, you get all sorts of lyrical, ooh, ooh, ooh. It's gone. It's uncatchable but impactful. It's just like thought. It's not true, but it's pattern formative. So when you listen to music, it loosens your patterning. You might feel like dancing. When you have certain patterns of thinking, you come into that formation. Okay, so let's, uh, let's sit and do some of the practice. So oh, this kind of practice is uh, different from most kinds of Buddhist practice because most Buddhist practices could be said to be a path or part of a path. A path is going from here to there and therefore if you're on the path your experience is progressive or maybe stalled but somehow it's the, the possibility is to, is to uh, go somewhere different and therefore improvements of some kind should be noticed. So whether you're doing a visualization and counting mantras or doing prostrations, or circumambulations or mindful walking or mindful breathing, it should get better because it is an activity, it is performative. The focus is on the patterning of energy. What we're doing here is not a path to anywhere. It is what it is. It is how it is. So we're just being with the mind as it is. And the mind shows many different forms. Because we are addicted to linearity, that we see a line between the past, the present, and the future, and that there should be progression or movement we think well if I'm doing it I must get better at it but we have to remember that the mind my mind is not mine it's not like a possession if you polish your shoes they will get more shiny you put the shoe polish in and then you rub it you make a difference. You clean your cups and saucers 
and you let them dry and they're cleaner than they were before you did the washing. We're used to these kind of processes. You take the bad things out, you release the good qualities so that they shine forth. This is the basis of most of Buddhism. And in the Tibetan language, the word for Buddha is Sangye. Sang means purified, and Ge means spreading or increasing. You take the impediments away, you take the defilements away, and you allow the good qualities to shine forth. That is, of course, very dualistic in its progression. There are bad things to remove, there are good things to be developed. Here we're looking at the mind itself. So what is arising is the mind. It's very difficult to get close to your mind if you judge your mind. Because if everything comes from the mind, everything has the quality of the mind, which is unborn or emptiness, or in the language of Dzogchen, it's primordial purity. Pure from the very beginning means there is no defilement and no place for defilement because this is not something that can be marked. So <clears throat> even when atom bombs go off, they don't damage the sky. The uh, <coughs> radioactive particles hover in the atmosphere for a while, blown this way and that in the wind, but the wind and the sky are not the same. The wind is a subtle element close to the sky, but the sky itself is empty. The sky is not damaged. There is nothing there to be damaged. The mind itself is like the empty mirror. It doesn't take on any reactivity to what arises. So when we sit in the practice, we don't want to encourage reactivity. As long as you have a prejudicial orientation and you say, this sort of feeling is bad, or this sort of feeling I don't like, you are mobilizing you, a resource of mental habit forming to come to a conclusion about what is occurring. This is unnecessary activity. You think you're helping to clarify what is going on. I want to know how well I'm doing, but the very act of doing that creates obscuration. So we're just sitting with whatever is coming is coming. And you can read in the, the text on uh, meditation problems that they have in Sokshen, mm -hmm. some of which are in this um, text, uh, this, this book, Simply Being, where authors like Nudin Dorji and Pato Rinpoche say, some great meditators come crying and weeping, saying, I've been practicing for many years, but my mind is still full of anger. Great meditators, do not agitate yourself. Just stay relaxed and open with however the mind is. If you stay present with the arising of anger, the anger will go free by itself and you will, your mind will be obvious to you. And they say that with all the different kinds of obscurations. If you actively involve yourself trying to develop it and change it, you will just get caught up in the turbulence. But if you relax and allow it to be, even if it seems awful, even if you're sitting and your mind feels completely dull and stupid and you think, I can't meditate, I don't know what I'm doing, don't merge into that. Don't try to avoid it and change it. Just be with it. I don't know what I'm doing arises and passes. It is a transient phenomena and you are still here. It's gone. But if you think, no, I really can't do this. This is useless. This is rubbish. You have fused into the idea and now the transient limited formation of the thought has become your validation. And it validates you as being invalid, invalid. You're crap. I accept I'm crap. I, don't, I can't do this. I just can't. I can't is a thought. If you believe it, your belief that you can't 
will mean functionally you can't. Don't believe it. Don't disbelieve it. Just stay present with whatever is arising in the mind. And impermanence will clean the whole house without you having to pick up a broom. Nice. <laughs> the mind is self-clearing because it's arising and passing, arising and passing. But when you say, no, no, I want to keep that one. No, get, the, get the, rid of that one. Your involvement is the problem. Because the involvement means two. It takes two to tangle. I am involving myself in this means you are confirming the truth of duality. There is subject and there is object. But when you sit, whatever is arising in the mind, sometimes it looks like an object, that you're aware of something happening to you. Sometimes you're aware of yourself as subject. You feel, oh, this is me. Both of these, if you just quiet, relaxed, open, they vanish. They vanish. Everything goes. Whether it's sensation or feeling or memory or plan, it's gone. So if it's gone, why did I think it was so important? Because it's locking into a habit formation. And if these two lock on, it sets in train the construction of the familiar edifice of yourself. So it says in, in the Dhammapada, this uh, early Buddhist text, the maker of this house is gone. The beams have collapsed. The walls have collapsed. The house of the self has collapsed. We hold our self in place by self-construction. And the process, the functional process of that is selection getting more of what I like, getting less of what I don't like. And that arises from a biased interpretation of what is there. And what we've looked at in some detail now is, when you see this is good and that is bad, these are interpretations projected by you into the object. Because the object is neither good nor bad, it is a potential, and it depends with what you do with it, what the outcome is. You can take a scalpel and stab someone to death, or you can take a scalpel and, and uh, carry out an operation on somebody's body and help them to heal. If everything can be used in many different ways. But the key thing is to realize that if you've got a scalpel in your hand, you don't need to do anything with it. Like you see on the, on the telly, you watch the police dramas. Somebody's got a gun and the police say, put the gun down. If you pull the trigger, you go to jail for a long time. Just put the gun down. That's good advice, isn't it? Saves the taxpayer money as well, so we like it. Don't want to have lots of jails. Very expensive. Put the gun down. So what does the Buddha say? Put the thought down. And in fact, you don't even need to put it down. It's going down. Stop picking the bloody things up. <laughs> hmm. Okay, we do another little sit and then we'll have a break. So whether you are sitting or moving, whatever you're doing, just be aware of the movement of the content of your mind. If you're present, there is this, and then it's gone, and this. It's not that you have to track it, you're not having to analyze it, it's just obvious that when you're sitting, you're not standing, when you're standing, you're not sitting. So as you, as you get up, you feel the change in your muscles and the tension and your balance and so on. This is being revealed and then something else is being revealed and something else is being revealed and something else. And each of these patterns is there while it's there and then gone. And the more we see this, 
then we have these two things. We have the unborn mind, which is unchanging. This is primordial purity, or kata. And we have the ever-changing uh, display of the unfolding of the radiance of the mind or the potential of the mind, which in Tibetan is called hlundrup, which means coming easily or present in an instant or effortlessly arising. It means it's there without effort. So our thoughts come to us. Although we all have many thoughts, in the course of a day we are very rarely thinking. Most of the time you're just flooded with thoughts. To think is when you have maybe a problem to solve or you need to make a decision about what to do. And you sit down, you get a bit of paper and you think about, you itemize the options and you think your way through them and you come to a decision. But that kind of focused thinking is very rare most of the time. A lot of the time we just have thoughts flowing through us. So they become ours as they enter into the space of our mind and then they vanish. They weren't there, they are here and then they're gone. But as they come through, do we say they're mine? When an aeroplane flies from Britain to Poland and it goes across the uh, atmosphere of Germany, it doesn't become a German plane because it's flying through German airspace. So when the thought passes through the space of your mind, it doesn't become your thought unless you make it your thought. I'm thinking this. Eh, no, you didn't make it. You just stole it. You nicked it. You're a thief. You're a thief. Leave it alone. It's not yours. Leave it alone. See what happens. Oh, it's gone. Yeah, it's gone. It wasn't yours in the first place. It was there. Where? In my mind. It's mine. Finders keepers. Mine. Gone. So even if you think it's yours, you can't hang on to it. So why... Why were you grasping at it? Why were you thinking it was yours? It was just going. If you need to mobilize a thought, you can do that. But that's a very different thing from just merging with whatever is passing by makes you completely intoxicated. You're reeling, following this, following that, blown hither and thither, distracted all over the place. Very exhausting. But if you need to develop a thought, there's something to think about. Okay, how will we proceed with this? We've got a budget of this, we need to spend it, spreading it out, should we do this or that? Itemize the options. That's proactive thinking. Channeling the energy of the mind into patterns which uh, illuminate a problem which exists inside another pattern. That's all, it's pattern in relation to pattern. Yeah, you want to? Yes, well, it's exactly, but it's really who, who picked the thought up. So we're sitting in the practice and something is arising. We think, I don't like it. So the, the thing that we don't like is already there. We didn't make it. It's come into the mind, my mind. I don't like it. So this is a reaction. This is a thought commenting on another thought. So the one that's picking up the thought is a thought. It's not a person. But the thought presents itself as if it's me because it formulates itself as, I don't like this. But if we just sit, both thoughts go. But once you identify with the thought that begins with the first person singular, it seems to be me talking about that. So now there is self and other, and the internal uh, dialogue goes on, which winds itself on and on and on. There is no thinker, but there are plenty of thoughts. The thinker is another thought. It's not a person. There are no persons. All the different Buddhist schools say exactly that. If it's the Theravadan school, they, they, their view is called um, Pudgala Anatmadrishti, the, the view of the absence of inherent self-nature in people, in persons. They are the five skandhas that we looked at yesterday. 
or dharma anatma drishti, the absence of inherent existence in phenomena. These are patterns. There's nothing there, yet a lot appears. Appearance is the appearance of nothing. It doesn't mean it doesn't appear just because it's nothing. So, although it's nothing, because it appears, you can't say it's only, only empty. But although it appears, it is actually empty of inherent self-nature, so you can't say that the appearance is truly real. So this is the middle way between nothing at all and this is a reliable entity. So we can go back to the Heart Sutra. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. A particular, that form could be a feeling form, a thought form, the form of the bricks or stones building up a, a building, <coughs> the form of the sound of a car driving very quickly along. You step a bit away from the edge of the pavement. You think, whoa, you've gone a bit fast. So we are interpreting forms all the time. This is thought following thought. It's mind. And it's because this is the movement of the mind that you can have liberation. If the world was made out of concrete things, you would need to solve each problem one at a time but because all these thought formations arise as the display of the open potential of the mind, uh, according to the Tibetan image, and it's also a Theravadan image, if you have a tree, you can try to get rid of the tree by plucking off the leaves, or by cutting the twigs, or cutting the small branches, or cutting the big branches, or cutting the trunk. The tree could still revive, but if you cut the root, then the tree dies. So the tree of samsara, the root of it is ignorance. And ignorance means ignoring the absence of inherent existence, ignoring emptiness, or put it in a, in a sweeter language, ignoring openness, ungraspability, the miraculous way in which everything appears and yet is, un, is ungraspable. It's always the middle way. So if you see that root, if you see, oh, I'm tricking myself into believing that things are truly real, real in themselves, in and of themselves, and it's not true, then we start to cut into the root. Think, I'm doing this to me. Nobody is persecuting me but me. I am self-deluding. So now that I observe that I am self-deluding, just that observation starts to dissolve the, the delusion. If you see the delusion, the delusion vanishes. But you have to see it. So every time you merge into the thought and you believe that the thought is real and true and tells me the truth about me, you thicken the delusion. Every time you catch yourself cheating yourself, hang on a minute, you're getting a bit hot around the collar over nothing. I'm doing this to me. I'm winding myself up. Oh. Then it starts to thin. Okay, let's take a break here and then we'll come back for a final sitting today. So just have a wee look around the room at what you see in the room. Does everything seem to have a shape and a size? Could you measure what you see? Does it have color? Do you have a sense that it came from some place? Do you have a sense of where it is now? Can you imagine that it will go somewhere else at a certain point? So these five questions are very important in Dzogchen practice because when we look at the phenomena in the world, whether it's cars or shops or people or dogs, they have shape. They have a particular 
formation and it has a size. They're big or they're small relative to other objects and they have color. They've come from some place or been constructed out of other materials. They are present here, seemingly existing in this place, and they will experience degeneration and collapse, as we can see with some of the uh, buildings up the alleyway there. They're starting to get damp and crumble. <clears throat> so these five questions are questions that phenomena can answer, or you can answer in terms of any phenomena you meet. You can answer them in terms of your own body. You have a size, a weight, you come from a particular place, you're living here now, then you'll be somewhere else. So these questions help us to get a handle on whatever we encounter. It's a framework whereby we make sense of what is going on. And the question then is, is our mind something which can be given an account of in terms of these five questions? Does your mind have a shape? Does your mind have a size? Does it have a color? Does your mind come from somewhere? Does it stay somewhere? Does it go somewhere? Now, of course, you may have all kind of learnt uh, answers that you could give to these questions. You could say, oh, my mind is uh, a functioning of the brain. That would be an idea. You might say, oh, there's a lot of information supporting that idea. That means that idea has a lot of believers whether we should believe things just because lots of people believe in them, that's another question. So I can have ideas about the brain and the brain as some, in some mysterious way generating the qualia that I take to be my mind. But that then is thoughts about thoughts. Can I be close to my mind itself and bring these questions directly to bear on the phenomena as they reveal themselves. So what we do is we do the practice, we sit in a relaxed open way, and as we're sitting, experiences arising, things, outer, inner, whatever we call them, we are aware of the arising and passing of thoughts and so on. So this awareness or this knowing capacity of our mind, the noetic capacity, does that have a shape? Does it have a color? Does it come from someplace? Is my mind located somewhere? Is it inside my body, outside my body? Does it envelop my body? You can look and see, because you have a mind. If you didn't have a mind, this, none of this would make sense. You have a mind, you are aware. What is this awareness? How is this awareness? Not, sorry, again, not what is it, but how is it? It is here. Without it, you wouldn't be able to hear anything I'm saying. You wouldn't be able to look around and see things. But how is the awareness itself. That is to say, is your mind a thing among things or is it other than things? We know that we've been putting into question the thingness of the phenomena that we see, but even so we can see that they manifest as having qualities. So is the awareness which reveals the manifest qualities of internal arisings and external arisings as we take them to be, is this mind itself a manifestation? Is it part of the unceasing display or is it the ground mind which is not a thing, which is not a manifestation? That is to say, does the mind show itself So if we go, to make it a little easier, if we go back to the metaphor, which is central in the teaching of Sokshen, the mirror, when you look in a mirror, 
Do you see the mirror? What does the mirror look like? Well, you can measure the size of the frame, but the mirror itself, what's in it? When you look for the mirror in the mirror, you find reflections. The mirror shows itself as that which it is not, and yet it is. Because you can't say that the reflection is not the mirror because the reflections are only ever in the mirror, but you can't say that the mirror is the reflection because there are so many different, <coughs> excuse me, so many different reflections. How could any one of them be definitive of the mirror? So it's exactly the same with our mind. We have many, many kinds of experience arise, which I say, this is what's happening for me. So we go into this question, well, who is the me? Who is the, the one who is uh, aware of what is going on? So is that an arising like other arisings or not? So here we have the question, is the mind different from the felt sense of subjectivity? Because I'm talking with you, I look around the room, I see different people's faces, and I'm aware of words coming out of my mouth, so I am talking with you. So, you are something I experience, the shape of your face, the angle of your head in relation to your shoulders, and so on. This is arising for me, I'm experiencing you in this way and I'm experiencing myself talking at the same time. I see my hands doing things. I don't know why, but that's what they do. So I, many things are unfolding in this arena of experience. That's my subjectivity. I, I know that I am talking to you. As a subject, I'm looking at you and I'm talking. Now, is that felt subjectivity which manifest, which seems to have a shape and a form at a particular time, is that the mind? Because ordinarily we take our subjectivity to be our mind. I was thinking, oh, I was wondering what you were saying yesterday, da, da, da. We make all these links and this is me and the reason I'm talking is because, of course I've got a mind. That's how I know I can remember what we were talking about. But from this point of view, that is a patterning of transient manifestation. That is, a sh that is the showing, but showing, as it were, tilted on the object side. It is what is shown, but it doesn't come out of the mirror. It's, it's the showing as showing. But then there's the showing as what's showing. So the mirror is showing, and the reflection is showing itself as the showing of the mirror. But because the mirror is showing itself as the reflection, the mirror hides in the showing. So the mirror never shows itself. It shows itself as what it is and what it isn't simultaneously. Yeah? The, the reflection is the mirror and isn't the mirror. Your thought is your mind and isn't your mind. But if you completely forget about the mirror, you've only got the thought. You've only got the reflection. So I'm me. Here I am. Just me. But who's saying just me? Are you aware that you're just saying that? Yes. So who is the one who is aware? So you can go in the <coughs> reductive line, having a thought about a thought about a thought, or there is the immediate lucidity of the subject and object formations arising together, what I see and the experience of seeing, the experiencing of the experience of seeing, both are movements or disclosures, revelations. What is revealed? Is it the subject and the object? Is it the display of the mind itself? So this is what we have to inquire into. Otherwise, our tendency is to attribute substantial reality to what we take to be the subject. I see you. You are there. I am here. 
you exist, I exist, and it all clunks into its familiar solidity and grinds away. But we're also getting a sense it's, it's, uh, it's lighter, it's more ethereal, it's, you can't get a purchase on it. It's showing, but you can't get something in the showing. You look in the mirror, you see it's there, but you can't get it out. It's an ungraspable showing. So in the mind, a thought arises. It's in my mind. Is it my mind? I was thinking. So we talk of it as if it is the extent of my mind. My mind is delimited by the movement of my thoughts, the arenas of my feelings. But they come and go. So is my mind simply a kind of meta-naming, some overarching signifier which I apply to mop up all the formations of thoughts, feelings, sensations? Or is there a presence there? But the presence of what? Maybe a presence of nothing. But maybe nothing is lucid. It's not just nothing at all. So that's what we want to inquire into. So we're going to sit, do a bit of practice, and as you <coughs> go into the practice and you settle a little bit, in your own time, just very gently take up these questions. So here, something's going on. The revealer or the shower of what is going on the awareness, whatever we call it, it, it's not going to be caught by our naming, but the, the lucidity of the revelation of this, does this lucidity come from someplace? Is it made by somewhere else? Is it imported from somewhere else? Does it abide here? If it's here, where is it? Is it inside what I take to be my body? Is it outside? Does it go anywhere? We know that thoughts go, memories go, but does awareness itself go? And does it have shape and color? So, in whatever sequence you like, you can start to make that inquiry directly. Now, the, the thing is this. If you ask these questions in a very dualistic way, <coughs> you will make no progress because you're starting from the assumption that there is something to inquire into. And so you become the active looker, the investigator, as if you're doing a bit of research, but it's not like that. <coughs> something is there very, very subtle. Very, very subtle. So we want to see the mind is here, otherwise there'd be no understanding or the no showing of what is going on. But I want to let the mind reveal itself because the mind likes to hide. The mirror is always hiding, but the mirror is always naked. The mirror has no covering, otherwise it wouldn't function as a mirror. But it hides in its, in its own showing, although it's not hiding. So we're here, stuff is going on, This awareness or the mind, where is it? Where is it? And whenever you come to a conclusion, <clears throat> just stay with that conclusion and see what kind of a conclusion it is. Because if awareness is continuous and you are in touch with awareness, you should have a continuous illumination. But if the conclusion you've come to is cognitive, if it is a conceptualization and concepts arise and pass away, you will find that your vision of the truth of the world is impermanent. So you will then be like somebody who finds the meaning of life while on LSD. And at the end of the trip, they find they've written some gobbledygook. <laughs> okay, let will try it for a while.
generally <coughs> be recommended to, to do the practice for 10 minutes and then maybe take a short break and go back and do another 10 minutes, but don't extend it too long over time, otherwise uh, you end up <coughs> making too much effort. Key points are always relax, be with what is occurring, and then be aware of how it is to be present with what is coming. And then see, what is this awareness? What is it? How is it? Is it a thing? Because if your mind is not a thing, and you think of yourself as a thing, then you are deluding yourself. So it's not about do Buddhists see the world more clearly than anyone else. It's not a fight for concepts or ideologies or dogmas. It's not about something to believe. It either it is or it isn't. You know, today is Saturday. Well, that's a conventional identification in the English language. So today is not today is not intrinsically Saturday. And what Saturday might mean to us is not going to mean the same if, for example, you're Jewish. So, most of what we are <coughs> concerned with is interpretive. And because you get different interpretations, you can compare and contrast interpretations. And you like one more than the other, or one seems more true than another. That keeps you endlessly in this relative entanglement. Is it this? Is it that? high, low, good, bad, right, wrong, you're moving in these polarities, but it is. How, how is it when it just is? If I don't think about it, if I don't interpret it, if I don't tell myself what I think it is, or remember what other people have told me what the mind is, and all the books I may have read about that, if I just put that on one side and say, I don't want to fill the space with received ideas about something. I want to stay present and see how it is. So, for example, you could, you could study a lot about dance. You could read many books about dance, the history of ballet and so on. Or you could dance and you could be present as dancing and you would you feel the dancing body in that moment there is dancing and dancing shows itself you don't have to think how am I dancing are you dancing better than me maybe I should do what you're doing because you're a better dancer than me all that's just thoughts about dancing but when the body is moving oh it's like this when you're swimming in the sea It's the unfolding of the experience of you and the waves and the tide and the temperature and the wind across your face. All of this is together. So you're receiving the unification or the collaboration between your body moving in the sea. It's a, a showing, an unveiling. And you can think about it. You can try to remember, oh, I used to do old English backstroke. And you turn and you do some unpopular, unfashionable form of swimming. There are many ways to swim in the sea. But now I've affirmed I am swimming. Who is swimming? I am swimming. Whereas if you're just swimming, you have much more harmony between you and the water. Because you're aware that the sea is swimming me that as the sea is, so I swim. Because I don't want to get a mouthful of water, so I'm adjusting the rapidity of my movement to the dynamic of the unfolding of the waves. And of course, waves are not all exactly the same height and in the same way. So I'm collaborating with the water, which means I open myself to the water. And as I meet the water, the water meets me, and together we swim. So you, you're softening the felt sense of internal subject-to-object agency. So a similar thing here, 
with the meditation. We're just allowing the flowing of the thoughts and we're aware of it. Of course there is activity, but if we see, as with the swimming, that my body is, is being swum by the sea because I'm giving my body to the ocean. I'm trusting that if I receive the ocean, she will show me how to respond. In the same way, uh, we give our subjectivity to what is arising and these two forces create the unfolding field of experience which is revealed in awareness. So stay with awareness. It's not an active inquiry. It's the revelation of what is there. So let's do another sitting. So hopefully you can see the, uh, the line that runs through this, <coughs> the impermanence of phenomena, whether they appear outer or inner, our inquiry into whether awareness exists as a thing, and if we can directly see that it is not a thing, then there is nothing to be damaged and nothing to be improved or uh, developed in any way because it is what it is. If the mind is open and empty and doesn't have shape or form or size, it can't be increased or decreased. If it hasn't come from anywhere, it's not compounded, it's not made, it's not created if we can't find out where it is, and yet it's here, then it's not something uh, held in location. Not having arrived from anywhere, it doesn't go anywhere, so it has no duration either. It's outside space and time. This is our mind, it's not some metaphysical construct. It's the actuality of our awareness. So then you see, oh, What's the basis of all my hopes and fears? When I don't want bad things to happen to me, who is the one they would be happening to? What we've been looking at is the impermanence of the content of our self-formation. That so many contents have filled us in the course of just this day, happy, sad, standing in the sun, eating, talking, and so on. Each of these moments were how I am just now, how I am just now. But there is no continuing essence to any of them. So myself is always changing. Some of these changes I say are good, some are not good, some I like, some I, some I don't like, but the fact is our ego self is not a thing, it's a process of unfolding. And our awareness also is not a thing, it's an open uh, <coughs> space of disclosure. The, another word for the mind is the dharma datu, meaning the, the, the space in which all dharmas, all phenomena show themselves. And the mind itself is also called the dharmakaya. Dharmakaya means the the kaya means body, but here it means like the mode, the mode of truth, of how it is. This is called the mind of all the Buddhas. The speech of all the Buddhas manifests as a samboga kaya, the mode of enjoyment. So we're sitting and many, many things are occurring and we're just present with however things display. Now, is that enjoyable? If your mind is dull and heavy, how could that be enjoyable? But it's not me. It's not me. So if I take the content of my mind to be the true revelation of who I am, and my mind is heavy and dull, 
then that's not very pleasant because I don't want to be like that. But if I see this is just a showing. So just like if we walk up the alleyway to the right-hand side and we see this bit of the courtyard full of rubbish, we can think all kind of thoughts about it, that it's disgusting, it should be tidied away and so on. Or we can see just that it's like that. It's like that. That's what it looks like. Nothing to, nothing to do with me. It's just a shape. It's just a composition. It is what it is. Then you can have your opinion, but before you have your opinion, it is what it is. And what is it? Can't say. Because if you say, you make an opinion. What is it before I speak? What is it before I think? How could you say? Because your speaking and your thinking requires thoughts. So in the Zen tradition, they talk about what was your face before you were born. It means how is your mind before you conceptualize it? Your mind is born when you start to think about it. When you say, oh, when I was at school, I wasn't very good at languages, but I was quite good at mathematics. I'm quite good at this kind of thing, but that's more difficult for me. You start kind of palpating your felt sense of who you are and your capacities and qualities and so on. You're talking about it. But what is it? Is it the same as what you're talking about? Is it just a, simply a stream of signifiers? Is your existence simply a narrative, the way people in narrative therapy schools would believe? No, there isn't an immediacy. It's happy and sad are not the same. It's life is not in the blender. There's all kind of movements, wow, and empty. Wow and emptiness. Ooh. Richness, colors. The air gets a bit chill in the evening, so there's the warmth of the afternoon, and then you feel that. Oh, you see what it does to your body, to your breathing. We are in ceaseless dialogue or co-emergence with the factors around us. We are in-worlded. This is the Sambhogakaya. This is the, the possibility of enjoying everything because I'm not defined by anything. I am beyond definition, although I can show precise forms. In the third aspect, the, what's called the Nirmanakaya, or the uh, mode of uh, the apparition, is that we, we, we manifest as appearances in, in different ways, like magical appearances. So, you're walking up the hill, and your breathing changes because of the angle of the hill and then you come to an open vista and your breathing changes. How you manifest is determined by the context. So it's a showing, but who, who is showing what? Am I showing myself? Or do I find myself being disclosed to myself by the event? So the world is the revealer of my potential in this moment. And I appear like this, but I'm not really like this because I'm not enduringly like this. I'm only situationally like this. So it is as if this is how I am due to these causes and conditions, which will never be repeated quite the same. So I am a million, million, trillion me's. Each one like a magical fantasy. How amazing. And we have this heavy, clunky self-narrative that becomes some sort of sticky bedrock to who we are. But actually, we are different, moment by moment. And our difference emerges in our relation with the environment. When, at lunchtime, when I went with Katrin up and we came around a big church with <coughs> there's a long walkway up the main entrance to the old church 
and there are white crocuses all along it on both sides. And just when you see this, oh. oh. And in that moment, you're crocused. You become full of crocuses. The crucifixion of me. Whoa. That's all there is. And then our conversation went on. We're looking at different things. Some sad stories, some happy stories. So there's expansion and contraction. And each of these is just what I am or rather just how I am in that moment. Nothing else, only this. But it's ungraspable, and that's why it's like an apparition. Apparition doesn't mean it's like a ghost that doesn't exist at all. It means it's an ungraspable form which is true within the parameter of just being this. And there's nothing to take away. There is no essence to be found inside it. I show many different forms. Now, that can be mediated through my concern for my ego identity. So, if I'm desperate that you like me, I'm going to try to mold myself in ways that I think, according to my interpretation of how your mind and your feelings work, I shall be the person that I think you would like. That's a lot of cooking. That's a lot of business, isn't it? round and round and round because I don't know what's in your mind and in fact you don't even know what's in your mind because that's always changing. So when we try to develop an identity, a personality, a persona, a mask that shows itself, we end up falsifying our existence because if I want to be free, I have to let you be free. I have to say, you have your mind that's yours. And what you think of me belongs to you. It doesn't belong to me. So you can think whatever you like about me, that's your world. My world is me. Because if I want to get you to think about me the way I want you to think about me, I've lost myself. Because I am not a thought. So whether you like me or don't like me, what has that got to do with me? Where will I put your thoughts? Will I pin them like medals on a soldier? What will I do with your thoughts? You like me? For a while, because of your karma. What has your liking me got to do with me? That's weird. That's weird, isn't it? We like things out of ourselves. Something has a resonance for us. It tells us no definite truth about the qualities of the object. Otherwise, everybody would dress in exactly the same clothes. One person likes this sweater, everyone should have it because it's the best sweater for that person. We are the kings and queens of our domain. And if you want to find the extent of your domain, you take a pencil and you tie a, a, draw a little circle around your feet. And if within that terrain, you are the ruler. And once you step outside that circle, it's up for grabs. So freedom is let other people be the way they are. If you stop controlling others, manipulating them, seducing them, trying to fabricate them, oh, you relax. Be as you are. And then now I can start to be as I am. And if we like each other for a while and it goes okay, that's what's happening. It doesn't really get any better than that. Because how I am is not in the palm of my hand in terms of manifestation. How I am as the open lucidity of my mind, because it's unchanging, it's always there. So that's why in the tradition they say the Dharmakaya, the mind itself, is for you. You awaken to your own mind which is the lucidity, the unborn lucidity of awareness, and the other two forms, together called the, the, <coughs> the rupakaya, or the, the showing forms, the sambhogakaya and the nirmanakaya, they are for the other. We, so wisdom is to awaken to, the, to how your mind actually is, its emptiness, and compassion is how this manifests, how your world manifests. And your world is what you attend to. 
So if you have a lot of fixity and selectivity in your perception, if you're walking along the street looking for particular items or caught up in your own concerns, you have abandoned the world. And if you've abandoned the world, how will you access it? And if you don't access it, how will you enjoy it? But the reason I don't access the world is because some of it's horrible. Who says it's horrible? <coughs> I say it's horrible. It's horrible for me. Well, all you have to do is stop looking at the world as yourself. Yourself is a veil, a, a, a perverting crystal, a, a distorting apparatus which doesn't let you see things as they are. When you see things as they are, they are the empty luminosity of the mind. It is what it is. Then the thought comes, but I don't like it. That's a thought. That's a thought. We hear the tail of the dog banging. <laughs> this is a very good dog. <laughs> <laughs> because the dog is wagging its tail the tail is not wagging the dog your thoughts are the tail if your thoughts are wagging you if you're being shaken about by your thoughts this is not good you're ungrounded and lost four feet on the ground dogs are quite stable and the tail is wagging but they're not falling over. Thoughts, feelings, sensations arise. You don't have to block them. They are the movement. But the movement is non-definitional. It can be enjoyed. That's the meaning of the Sambhogakaya. Enjoy all the different experiences. But if you start, but I'm me, and I know what I like, and I like what I know, then you bring prejudice. So our topic this weekend is equanimity, which means non-bias, non-prejudice. It means being calm and clear and open and without any prefiguring of intention or desire. How is it? We have to receive it. I remain balanced however it is. This is not because I'm kind of <coughs> schizoid or psychopathic because I'm, I'm not cut off in a world of my own. It also doesn't mean that I'm indifferent, that I don't care. It means all the different forms of the world, the diversity, arises in my discernment. I see the different colors and shapes and people's faces and so on. But it is what it is. It's a revelation. There's no essence in it. So if there's no essence in different people, how would you say this person is better than that person? The question then is, how will I relate to this person? And that will be as is possible under the circumstances. It will reveal itself. So here again we're relaxing the egoic intentionality as the agent. I am the one who will make things happen to experiencing how it happens. And in that middle way, we're neither the victim, nor are we the controller, we're not the servant, we're not the master, but we're participants. And then we're alive, and when you participate, you get very pliable, very flexible, it's very nice, because you're moved around by the world. Rigidity is very bad news for the muscles for the spine, the spine that can move is gorgeous. That's what we want. The mind that can move and respond, that you have all your chakras open, that you have your feeling tonal response operating. This is life. This is rather nice. This is good, delicious. So how do we get that? By relaxing fixation. By not taking up a fixed position. So that's what equanimity means in this Dzogchen tradition. That we stop striving and we allow the world to show us how to be. 
if you're going to swim in the sea, you cannot try to dominate the waves. You have to work with the waves. If you fight the sea, you will drown. The sea is very, very powerful. I used to swim in the sea a lot up in Scotland. And you get these tidal currents. I would swim across this big bay. I was quite good at swimming. And in the middle of it, you feel these currents coming in. And you have to think, OK, I'm going to swim with this. So you're swimming for five miles longer. But you're going to get to the shore eventually. And if you struggle against it and try to dominate the tide, you're fucked. So that's how life is. If you always want to be the master, that would be terrible. Because then you think, if I'm not the master, I'm the slave. And I'm damned if I'm going to be the slave. Crazy. The middle way. Sometimes we exert more expansion and determination of the patterning. And sometimes we relax and we allow ourselves to be carried in these different ways. And that's all possible if you don't start with a definition of this is who I am, this is how I'm going to be, this is how it should be. So that's again the the practice we can bring and it will lead into more about compassion and being in the world. So tomorrow we can look more, do more meditation together, get more clarity about how our mind actually is and then look at the implications of how we bring this to being into being in the world with others. How do we collaborate with other people? The middle way, not dominating them, not going under the power of other people, but finding our balance in a flexible, easy way. And usually that's done by not coming to strong conclusions. As the political situation gets more intense, it's very easy to get into strong definitions that politicians are horrible or stupid or useless or dangerous, which they may well be. But to hold that strongly in your mind brings you into prejudice. And if you, in prejudice, you've already come to a definite knowledge about who the other person is, which means you have cut them off from their potential in your mind. Everyone has Buddha nature. Everyone has infinite Buddha potential. But due to ignorance, they don't see that potential. And if we now come to a fixed conclusion about them, we are absolutely forgetting that they have any such potential. We put them in a box, and now we relate to them only in terms of our own definition. So we paralyze ourselves in relation to them. So that's part of what equanimity can do allow us to stay on that balance midpoint, which of course is dynamic. It's, it's always tilting and shifting, but basically it remains balanced. It doesn't fall to either side, but it's, it's, it's dynamic. And so we engage with the world. So that's tomorrow morning's exciting agenda. So have a very good evening. See you then. So we begin just with some sitting. Sitting in whichever way you are familiar with. You can keep your attention on the breath. You can then take your attention and do some body scanning. Or you can just sit in a relaxed, open way, allowing whatever occurs to come and go. The main theme we've been looking at is uh, equanimity, especially how to maintain that in a time when there's a lot of turbulence, outer turbulence and inner turbulence. So, 
when we sit, we notice uh, that the mind is moving. Thoughts, feelings, sensations are always occurring. But there is some continuity. So there's movement and stillness, a sense of something remaining. And our, what we were looking at yesterday is what is it that seems to remain? We can identify it in some way, but that very process of identification is another form of movement. So, in the first uh, turning of the wheel of Dharma by the Buddha, it said that he talks about the three marks of conditioned existence. That there is uh, dissatisfaction, that things are never quite right, that, that comes around because everything is compounded, is put together, is constructed, and it never quite fits. Even good moments turn sour, sour moments improve. Because of movement, one never arrives at a, a peaceful stability. Secondly, it describes impermanence, where outer phenomena change, the inner phenomena change, our body changes, our body is in fact nothing but change. It's a communication system with the blood, the hormones and so on. And the third factor is the absence of inherent self-nature in, in people, so that although we apply names to people and we think we know them, the actuality of how they manifest, the, the, the phenomenal quality of them, is changing according to circumstances. And so what we think we know is a kind of veneer which we project onto the person, because they are in the middle of the flux of their experience. Then in the second turning of the wheel, uh, it's marked by three uh, insights. It's called the three doors of liberation. And uh, the first of these is uh, signlessness. That is to say, uh, whatever signs you apply to phenomena in the world, whatever identifications you put. These are something that you put, that you make sense of the world by your interpretation, and you have to believe, if you're going to function in an ordinary sense, you have to believe that your interpretation is somehow accurate and fits onto the object itself. But the realm of signs and the realm of phenomena, they, they're close, but they're not identical. And as we looked yesterday like with the table, the tableness of the table is our concept of the table because the parts that make up the table could be used for other purposes. The, 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 the object that we see as a table is not inherently a table. It's conventionally a table, situationally used as a table, so that when we apply the sign, this is a table, we appear to have arrived at something. But what we've arrived at is our own construction. The table is a mental experience. What is there could be anything. It could be a toy, it could be a weapon. It can function in many different ways. But as long as we maintain our conviction that this is indeed truly a table, intrinsically a table, then the tableness of the table seems to be established even before we know it's a table. So again, that's the idea that phenomena arise from essences, that the essence guarantees what things are. So actually, the, the play of signs, the, the semiotic web, all that we develop through grammar, vocabulary, conceptualization, is, is a, a world of a particular kind of experience which brings us into a position where by naming we can manipulate phenomena, but without actually experiencing what phenomena are. So we're always working with our idea of the world, so we have the dominance of the idea, and it is as if the idea is the truth of what is appearing, rather than the idea is held close to the appearance but not, cannot actually be fused into it. 
So that's a very interesting thing that we can pursue as we, as we uh, go around um, whatever we look at. We, as we were looking yesterday, we can try to receive this in terms of light and color. And then we experience that we are naming it, that we are putting it into a category of identification. And that, that when you can uh, take hold of something and keep it in its category, it gives you a sense of knowledge and power. So we're using signs to consolidate ourselves. And as we touched on, this is uh, in the tradition is described as the second level of ignorance. That the ignorance which uh, identifies everything. And through that identification, the ego self is empowered as the one who knows. But we know ourselves as the one who knows by applying interpretation to that. That is to say, if I say, I know how to get to the train station, that's a statement in language made up of linguistic signs put into a pattern which appears to be giving me some definite knowledge about myself and so I rest on that so I go out of the building go down the street turn left and keep walking and then on the right hand side the railway station will appear but as we looked yesterday that is an abstract construction what I will actually encounter as I walk down the street, I cannot know until I go there. That the world reveals itself through our participation, not just in terms of who will happen to be walking on the pavement as I go past them, but what will my mood be if I feel I might be late for the train, I'll be rushing, if I've got time, I dawdle and look around a bit more, I see the architecture. What will be revealed has me involved. It's not something out there. There isn't a true street that is just there because with the angle of the sun at this time of the year, the shadows change, the illumination of the buildings change in the course of the day. So depending on when I'm walking down the street, the bricks will take on a particular coloration, whether they're getting more or less sun. So the actual revealed world is ungraspable because there's so much detail in it but when I rest in the sign, I know how to get to the station. Oh, I feel valid. I'm confirming myself. And so from Buddha's point of view, that's one of the things that we do with knowledge. We use knowledge as a way of reassuring the self, which has no fixity of its own, that it is indeed competent, efficient, and so on. The second uh, door to liberation is... Uh, the absence of uh, hope, which might not sound very good, but hope here means the projection of one's plans into the future. Because when you have hope, I mean, it might keep your spirits up, you might feel a bit more valid because you think, oh, things will work out well. But again, that's a mental construction. And when you're wrapped in a mental construction, it's very difficult to see the evidence. And it's very difficult to get the evidence when we go towards the field of inquiry with hope. This is why so much research is invalid, particularly mental health research, because people start with a bigoted opinion. So we have a lot of research, for example, in cognitive behavioral therapy, because there was a coup in the Royal College of Psychiatrists in which the people interested in CBT got the power, bumped out the analysts, and there's very little research money available. And when the bids go in, people support the people who they like. So it's not without prejudice. There are many, many kinds of psychotherapy now six, seven hundred different kinds and almost none of them have any research basis. And then if you want to have something operating in the NHS, you have to get through the nice guidelines. And so you get more of the same and more of the same. Now there's a, you know, ASDA and uh, Sainsbury's are wanting to merge. And so there's a consideration of whether this will be good because people say, well, you should have more choice, but you don't have much choice when 
very few forms of therapy get research and then we say, well, they're invalid. Why are they invalid? Because we haven't done the research. Why have we not done the research? Because there's no bloody money. Because it's already held by a little caucus who are very interested in developing their own particular orientation. So that's a hope, isn't it? People have hope. I hope if I can prove this, I'll get a professorship. That's what drives a lot of research. It's naked ambition. Uh, and why not? People need to have food, they want to have holidays, they want to get a bigger house. We can understand that. But hope here is, means the, the intention which has a situational validity but is also blind into the wider context. If we keep privileging certain aspects, then we'll see uh, what we are focused on seeing and the rest goes into the background. So we're always in this uh, figure ground formation. And the more you hope for something, the more you orientate yourself in one direction, that will become figural for you and other things will go into the background. And so, although we have the capacity for a relaxed open panoramic vision and we have the capacity, well, we have the potential to uh, mobilize our skills and knowledge and warmth as human beings in many different directions, if we develop a fixation, we will blind ourselves to ourselves and to the world. So, some people are very enthusiastic to champion certain things. Um, that Brexit without a, a deal would be fine, we'll manage. That's a kind of hope formation. There's plenty of evidence that that might not be valid, but if people are convinced by it, they will talk as if they have the truth. And then you hear that and think, oh, we have to weigh it up. So this is one position, that's another position. But both positions don't have the same amount of accurate information behind them. Fantasies propounded by people who are articulate are not necessarily valid. So that's the danger of hope or aspiration because it means uh, that there is a, a particularization of one's focus which is coming with you before the event. So you have an idea of what is important before you arrive in the situation. So you're not actually absorbing the, uh, the wider sense of how the field that you live your life in, you have a selective attention. <gasps> Now, in general, of course, you have to survive a selective attention. You need it if you're going shopping. You need to have a sense of what fruit or vegetables, whatever you, you want to buy. So it's very quick to know, I never eat this, so I don't, I don't need to look in that counter because that's not for me. So that selective attention simplifies life. But for meditators, if I simplify my life in that way, what I'm doing is relying on habit formation to tell me about m my relation to the world. As I was yesterday, so I am today, and so I will be tomorrow, therefore I don't need to think about these things. It's sorted. But if this world is impermanent, and if the potential of this day, this moment, is emerging, why would I not want to open myself to it? Well, too much is going on. How could I possibly make sense of it? I can't compute all this detail all the time. I'm going to get exhausted. So I have a very intelligent form of stupidity. I know what I like and I like what I know. And I'm me. So I'm getting on with my life on my terms. And that's generally how we operate in samsara. It's a, it's a reassuring kind of blindness, an elective blindness. But if we're interested in meditation, we want to see. We want to see how it is. And in particular, can we find a way of seeing which will not be overwhelmed by complexity? Because usually we, we lose our groundedness and our equanimity when things get to us. We think, this is a bit much. Oy, oy, back off with that, a bit more of that. And so we go into micro-adjustments of external, external phenomena and our internal sensations and feelings in order to maintain our balance. So it's a permanent work of adjustment. And that's happening because we have an agenda. 
And the more we can observe how thoughts and feelings and sensations arise, and we see the patterns that they have, and we allow ourselves to open to other people and see the patterns that they have, we see that their patterns are not our patterns. When you get a job and you start to meet your colleagues and you find out how they behave, you're thinking, okay, well, I wouldn't do it that way, but they do it that way. And they don't die and they don't fall over. There are many ways to do it. So that's the very helpful basis of ethics in which we realize the relativity of our position. It feels complete and total for me. This is what I'm on about. This is how I am. But you're not like me. So we, if we hold that seriously, the fact that you live your life in a way different from mine means that what I'm choosing is just the choices of happenstance, of my background, where I've come from, gender, age, education, and so on. Due to circumstances, these patterns have become familiar, largely habitual for me. Oh, I am a habitual formation. That's what I am. I maintain the seeming integrity of my sense of self by maintaining these patterns. Other people maintain other patterns, and that's why I'm not you and you're not me, because we have different pattern formations. But what is the truth of this pattern? Well, it's just how I am. Yeah, but why are you like that? Well, I don't know. My child, when you go to psychotherapy, talk with someone and blether away and find out all kind of ideas about why you're particularly constructed in this way. But the key point for, for the purpose of meditation is to see, oh, there is no inherent truth in this formation. Arising due to causes and conditions, it is how I am. So if you have a tendency to negative thoughts, if you are often very critical of yourself, profoundly dissatisfied with yourself, feeling guilty and blaming yourself, or if you go in the other way, if you've got a tendency to blame other people and always see that all the troubles in your life are caused by the actions of others, and see, oh, this is a tendency. And when I adopt this tendency, what is revealed to me is the world mediated through this habitual orientation. So if you look for faults, you can find faults. If you look for an easy, relaxed acceptance of how things are, you have a very different mood. So the modality of your perception helps to generate a mood in you, and that mood reinforces the orientation that keeps you maintaining that particular mode of perception. So you get a, a maintaining cycle going on. But that's how I am, and that's how the world is. If you saw the world through my eyes, then you'd understand. Okay, but then I see the world through everyone's eyes. I realize the world is interpreted. It's a field of interpretation, which means it's a mental event. So my fantasy that there is an object of reality out there that my subjectivity can get so close to that it can apprehend it, I can take hold of it, I can really see how things are, the more we look, we start to say, maybe that's not quite true. That what, the, what arises is a, a potential within which our habits of construal move, generating the specific, the unique specificity of our own experience moment by moment. Does that make sense? You can check that out for yourself. You know, this is not a, a kind of thing that you have to believe. It's something to, to look and see. Oh, I delude myself by imagining that there is a truly existing world that I can take hold of. Because if that was the case, we would all agree on many, many things, which we don't. So we have diversity, and that's not because everyone's stupid except me, it's because the world is not a fixed thing, it's a potential which emerges in its particular patterning in this moment according to our participation. 
I'm not somebody outside looking at a done deal, something that's already prefigured. By my participation, according to the mood, the intensity, the kind of thoughts, feelings, sense of smell, all, all the attributes which can arise uh, within my sense of self, with this in its particular emergent pattern in this moment, with the phenomena around me, this is what's happening now. This is my experience and my experience and my experience. So I cannot know in advance what it is. So there we can see why this uh, freedom from aspiration or hope, maybe hope's not quite the right word, let's say aspiration, this freedom from the, the fact that the, the, the mind itself, the door of liberation, is the absence of that aspiration. It doesn't mean that you're kind of hopelessly at the mercy of everything that's happening. It means if you don't bring the projected coloration of your aspiration onto the situation, then the situation as it is, is more likely to be amenable to you. But of course, it's always going to be as it is with you. It's not as it is already done out there. So the more clarity you have, the more you will have access to the moving field of the potential of the world, and you will find a way of doing it. Because you have to see what is the potential. I remember one of the people I worked with, um, Jim Watson, who was professor of psychiatry at Guy's, when he was interviewing uh, people who were wanting to, to work in psychiatry and they were having to choose a specialization, halfway through the interview he would get down on the floor and say come on let's do something here and the people who were a bit startled by that say don't work with children so that's a very quick and easy way isn't it if you've got a kind of oh, I'm a serious person go and see big serious adults but you have to be a bit adaptable and flexible if you're going to be working with unhappy young people so we can see that that the world of the child is not going to be revealed to you if you have to sit in a very formal way. So, if you want the child to be free to show how they are, you have to have a way of being with them that will not be experienced by them as dominating or controlling or having a fixed agenda. You have to be more open. So that's, that's a very uh, outer example, but we can see for ourselves that our coloration mediates the, the kind of experience that we have of the world. And the third of these uh, doors to liberation is uh, emptiness or shunyata, it, which is just in a sense the same as the absence of inherent self-nature. But it's, it's seeing more precisely that because everything, all appearances, including ourselves, are not generated by fixed internal essences, Appearance, and including the appearance of ourselves, is like an illusion. It's something which appears but has no solid substance to itself. It's, and that's why it's always changing. It moves very easily. You know, if I bang the table, it makes a noise, but nothing, it doesn't really move. But if I was to shake the vase with the flowers in it, the water in it would really vibrate because the water would carry that because that's the quality of water. It's different from the quality of earth. Earth tends to hold the vibration inside it and the water moves more easily with it. And the air around us, if we wave our hand, we feel the air starts to flutter. So we are moving creatures. So the stillness that we have is difficult to establish when most of our being in the world is like the moving elements, water, fire, and air. At, on either side of these, we've got uh, stabilized elements. One is earth and the other is space. Space never changes. Uh, I mean, this is a metaphorical system. So it's just a way of helping us to get a sense of, of, of how one might consider one's situation. So earth is, is more fixed 
and in that sense reliable because it seems to have durability, continuity through time. So when we experience the instability of ourselves and we find ourselves being anxious about that, we tend to want to stabilize it. So you can have a routine, you can eat regularly, go to sleep regularly, it's sort of advice any health professional would give. Because by maintaining that kind of rhythm, the body can settle itself. It's a whole discussion, isn't it, about feeding babies, whether you should do it on demand or you should have a time-based system. There are many ways of thinking about that because the baby requires a kind of object constancy or a rhythmic constancy in which because they're not being held in a, in a state of unknowing, somatic unknowing as well, oh, they can settle. Oh, this will be okay, this will be okay. And so there's a predictive quality. So the earth element promotes prediction. But of course prediction is then an abstraction. <coughs> <coughs> and it has to be maintained. So mum could be reliable and reliable and reliable and then get bad flu or get a bit of depression or the mother might die and then there's a lot of upset and the baby's going to feel this because the availability that was there in a very fine-tuned way is no longer available. And that creates disturbances in the bonding. But the other aspect is space. Space, like the sky, is open. We know what space is. We move through space all the time. As we walk through the room, the, the air around us is, is affected by the displacement. But the air is moving in the space. The space facilitates movement. So when we start to investigate the emptiness of phenomena, we can see that they're all like a, like a rainbow in the sky. These are movements within space. And what is this space? It's the openness of the mind which has a luminosity. Like the sun shines and fills the sky with light, so our clarity or our awareness illuminates the space of experience within which these different phenomena are moving. Now, this is why when we do the meditation practice, we're not trying to manipulate our thoughts, we're not trying to visualize something or make a vow to do something different or to control our uh, experience. When we do Dzogchen meditation, we just sit open and let things come as they come. As they come and go, there's maybe some background response which arises in us. I don't like this. Ooh, this isn't very good. Da, da, da. There's some commentary going on. Now, if you identify with the commentary, you take up a position vis-a-vis -vis what's happening to you. <clears throat> but if you allow the commentary just to keep moving, so you have a sensation in your body, or you're aware someone in the room is moving, and then some thought about that arises, this is different kinds of movement, but it's all movement. So if you just let the movement move, it goes by. When we give ourselves into the movement, when we identify it and we think this thought is telling me the truth about the situation, then by that fusion into it, you are now located, this is what I feel is going on. So you've both got a adherence onto the situation that you've got your opinion about and you've got a separation at the same time. So I know what you're like because I'm sitting over here and I'm not you and I see you but I'm now binding myself into my image of you which I then take to be the truth of you why, why do people do that? why am I like that? God I can't meditate, this is useless and stupid people, you know, all kind of negative thoughts can arise and then they're gone why would you believe it? Or that's an, maybe not a very helpful question more useful is, how do I believe it? What is it that occurs when we get distracted in meditation? We decide I'm going to sit, relax and open and just let everything flow, but I don't. I get caught.
caught up in it. I get pulled into it. So what's happening in that moment? That's what you can look for yourself. There's no point in me telling you a lot about my experience of it. You yourself have to sit and see, oh, this is lostness. And the, the difficulty is that when I get lost, I'm found at the same time. I find myself thinking. I find myself feeling. I find myself like this. So I'm not lost because I find myself thinking about the summer because the weather's quite nice and maybe it'll get cold again but maybe imagine if global warming was going to give us this through every winter this blah, 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 blah. so there are many many thoughts can mushroom out which came to me but I'm merging into them and so I am the thinker of the thought perhaps I'm certainly the experiencer of the thought whether I myself am making the thought come I don't know. So again, I'm speaking just now. I can hear my voice coming out. So I know I'm speaking. But where do the words come from? There isn't a little homunculus inside, some little diminutive inner me, some essence of James that's pumping the words out. There isn't a James word factory. And this factory can produce many kinds of discourse. Now we're doing Dharma discourse. So I put the production system onto Dharma discourse. But of course, like it says on the packets, this, these biscuits have been made in a facility where they also have peanuts, so you have to be careful. So my Dharma discourse might be mixed in with some other little biases about Brexit and da-da-da, <laughs> CBT, <laughs> getting a little... <laughs> So where do the words come from? As we've been touching on, they come from our connectivity. So it's easy to say, oh, James is talking, but that doesn't mean that there's some Jamesness inside that does the talking. Words flow out in connectivity. So we know the different kinds of conversations we have, that teachers have, bank managers have, doctors have, and so on. And then you have with a, with a lover or with children, the context and the person gives rise to the modality of speaking. And if it doesn't do that, then we start to think, ooh, that person's not doing too well. So if you're assessing patients in a psychiatric setting, how the patient can respond to the setting is, is very important because some people don't get it. They don't get where they are. And then they have a whole agenda which is not really fitting to the context. And that's a sign that they're not here, that they're speaking into a world of themselves. And then they're truly lost. You have to help them come back to the fact that they're sitting in a room with you. And what do you want to say to me? Can you see my face? Have I got a nose? Oh, okay. So you've got two eyes and you see my nose. Now we're kind of here together. Something's happening. But if you're just drowning me in your monologic discourse, that's going to take you far away because we speak with people. Speaking at people is not so helpful. It dislocates us. So <clears throat> emptiness is the sense that as we look around, our participation is truly <coughs> co-generative or co-emergent with the field of experience. That's really what emptiness means. It means it's never a done deal. It's never there already. It's always dynamic and in this moment. And therefore, change is possible. Because it's not fixed, it's not sealed in place by any essence. It can be changed. So, again, with Brexit, such an interesting area. Some people say, oh, we can change our minds. And other people say, no, we mustn't change our minds. We have to fulfill our promise, regardless of circumstances. So, a, you see what happens when people take up a very rigid point of view. Research and thinking and evaluation is not necessary because we have already decided, and this is what we're going to do. 
What are we going to do? This. So don't think about anything else. Be with me. We stand together with my idea. You don't need to have a mind. My mind is sufficient. I am the leader. You know, these fascist structures are very, very popular, where you align yourself with the great mind and you make a vacuum inside yourself. But if you have your own thoughts, then you have differences of opinions. And if it's differences of opinions, how could it be a done deal? We have to, let's see, let's try, let's think about it. Then it's, but we're going to lose the shape of it. We have an agreement. So we return to the fixed shape. So if you want to have a, an existence which is fresh and harmonious and connective, then you have to have intuition. You have to have a, a rapid way of working with whatever is arising. But you can't do that if you're formulaic. So the idea that the mind is like space means it's not filled with stuff. It's not cluttered. Of course, we have many thoughts and feelings, but as they arise, do we need to activate them? You only have a choice if you can say no. If you have to say yes, you don't have a choice. So if you find yourself committed to yourself as you take yourself to be, then you're a prisoner of your own conceptualization, your own habit formation. Which is why in the practice, we just sit in an open way, let experience come, whether it's sensation in the body or memories or sounds, light, whatever it is, it comes and goes. I don't need to do anything with it. I can be completely relaxed and open. Oh, now I have choice. Because if I now activate something, if I now move in this particular direction, I am truly choosing to do it. Whereas, whereas if a habit formation takes me, I am, it's a kind of setup, isn't it? It's preordained that I'm going to go with this one, whether it's a habitual negative thought or having a need to smoke a cigarette and so you get your packet and you have a roll up or whatever and you find yourself smoking because the thought and the sensation in the body says I need a fag so then you're smoking and it's as if that thought is telling you the truth about yourself oh I need a cigarette well that's a thought which bit of you needs a cigarette which bit of you is in a hurry to get cancer okay I don't need a cigarette but I want a cigarette now why do you want a cigarette because I've been smoking for a while. Oh, so the addictive power of the nicotine and the other chemicals in the tobacco is uh, it's getting to you. That's good. You want to encourage your enthraldom to something which is detrimental for your health. So that's what happens to us, isn't it? That we become wrapped into habit formations. Now, the habit formation could be being a helpful person. Oh, I'll stack the chairs. Oh, I'll clean up in the kitchen. That's also a habit. It's very good for kind-hearted, helpful people to sit on their hands and let other people work. Oh, what? No, no, let me help. No. But then you say, oh, this is a habit formation. Am I really helping because I want to help these people or am I doing it to confirm the patterning that I take to be I, me, myself. So that's why the meditation is quite difficult because we find ourselves succumbing to the ego syntonic, the ego affirming, ego harmonic patterning. So that's why I merge with that thought because that thought is me. <clears throat> now the corollary of that would be Okay, if that thought is me, I am a thought. Hang on a minute. I must be more than a thought. Really? Do we see walking down the road? We get caught up in our thought production, the movement of the mind, ratiocination. Thoughts go round and round and round. I am thinking my existence. I'm thinking my life away. 
I'm weaving a net of dreams in which to go from birth to death. And where am I? Oh, I'm in Macclesfield. Where is that? Oh, it's in England. Really? Where are you? Are you here? Of course I'm here. So what's it like to be here? And then we wrap it on with another story. If you didn't tell me the story of being here, what would it be to be here? How, what is hereness? How is hereness? How is nowness? So that's why we meditate to start to see that if I merge into thoughts, it brings a particular coloration or a particular flavor, a particular modality of experience which is familiar, but it may not be the whole show and it may not be the optimal way to spend one's life. That actually if I have less adhering, merging into thoughts, feelings and sensations, if I allow them their free movement, I start to become aware that perhaps I'm a bit more relaxed and spacious and more can come to mind and I see more and I feel more and I'm less and less constrained so I can relate in different ways to different people. So I have the freedom to see that my unformed potential will come into quite, <coughs> excuse me, quite fitting uh, alignment with other people's emergent formation. And I can just let it happen. I don't need to plan in advance. That worry and anxiety fill the space of experience and block the receptivity of the actuality of how another person is so that instead of them helping me to come into formation with them according to how I perceive their face, whether they're interested or not, I'm trying to work it all out inside myself, which is a very lonely task and a very hopeless kind of task. Because how could I ever know what you need unless I ask you? Or even if I don't ask you, if I let your body show me that whether you're available for a chat or a hug or going for a walk or whatever, you're, you will not be revealing yourself to me. But I will be interpreting you through my matrix of interpretation. So as we've looked before, what I will get of you is a projection of me. So I'll never really meet you. And if I want to meet you, I have to have a space to receive you. Because there's a lot of you. You have so many moods, so many modes, so many aspects. So the more empty I am, the more I'll have of you. And the more I have of you, how you are will evoke more of me. So emptiness having nothing or being nothing, being not anything in particular as a fixed identity, allows me not to be someone, but if I can be no one, then in a sense I have access to everyone. And therefore I also become multiple. And what we know is that the mind is truly multiple, that we are all multiple. We, most people hear voices of some kind, we all are labile, we have uh, fluctuations of our mood and healthy functioning in the world is actually to be multiple. If you, if you can't speak differently to a child as you would to a grandparent, then you're pretty lost as a person. So we tune in to people and we find ourselves responding if we let them lead us, that we are responsive. So rather than having my agenda to pump onto you, if I let you take the lead, then I will find more of me and more of you. So that would take us again in this direction of equanimity. Because to be equanimous means to be without bias, to be without sight, to, to be settled with whatever is happening. So the more I sit in the practice and I allow my different kinds of thoughts and feelings to arise, maybe I'm bored with myself, maybe some jealous pattern arises, some desireful 
pattern arise, maybe the mind's just dull. However my mind is, if I'm tolerant of myself, this is what's happening, this is what's happening, it's just neutral, this is how it is. No need for further commentary, no need to take sides for it or against it, no need to try to have more of this happy stuff and less of this sad stuff, because the happy comes and goes and the sad comes and goes. It's just movement, it's just movement. And here I am. I am a relaxed yet alert space of illumination of the infinite variety of experience which arises. And in that moment there's no strong distinction of subject on the inside and object on the outside. So you have the non-duality or the non-separatedness in the field of experience. That is to say, connectivity is intrinsic, disconnection arises from the isolation that comes from self-referential thought reliance. So I'm inside me trying to work out who you are and what you like and is this interesting for you or not. How would I manage that? Be impossible. But in the room there's a flavor and the flavor allows me to keep blethering away with you because that's, <laughs> that's what it is. We are mood-oriented creatures and if we receive the mood and we respond to the mood, that helps the mood to have richness, which then promotes more, continu more continuity of contact. Contact is life. Contact is life. When a baby's born, what it needs is contact. It needs somebody keeping an eye on it and attending to whether it needs cleaning or feeding, whether it needs singing to whether it's being chafed by wet nappies and it needs some cream. All of these things require contact. You have to be available. Life is availability. When you go for a walk, you will receive more if you're available. If you're preoccupied, you will get less. So that's where we see what habit formation is. It's preoccupation. If I'm maintaining my sense of self by my ongoing ruminations, which will have their um, limiting tinge, their neurotic edge, then the price of me maintaining this sense of who I am is actually very, very high because I'm losing the world. That's tragic. So if, if I want to have more of the world, if I want to have more of you, if I want to have more actual experience of my children or my friends or be more present in the workplace, I have to be available. Who is stopping me being available? My own opinions and judgments. Oh, I don't want to talk to this person. Da, da, da. Not going to talk to them. So now I am putting a limit on me. Why don't you want to talk to that person? Oh, I don't like them. What is it you don't like about them? I don't know, I just don't like them. This is how we behave. It's a kind of madness. We know in advance of the experience. And very often if we don't like someone or we've avoided them due to certain circumstances, you might find yourself sitting next to them and you start chatting away and it's okay. Because how they can reveal themselves is not going to be paralleled by what you thought they were like. Because they're not like anything. This is like that. Apples are a bit like a pear. Apples are more like pears than they are oranges, comparing and contrasting. In order to do that, you have to have a sense of the apple and the pear. John is like this. I prefer Bob. It's easier to be with Bob. <coughs> so what's the Bobness of Bob? The Bobness of Bob is the Bob that you get. And why is Bob difficult when you're talking with him? Because Bob finds you bloody difficult too. It's not all Bob, it's you as well. It takes two to tangle. So then you can think, well, what is it that gets cathected? What gets linked here when I meet Bob? There's some grinding of our pattern of communication. Does that tell me about who Bob really is? No, 
that's in the middle. It's not. I never reach Bob. Bob is a site of disclosure of the potential that Bob can avail himself to out of the open ground awareness and me too. So our potential gets restricted when we start to get a bit wary of each other. Because I need to remember these things about you because you're a bit like that. And it all gets very tight. So it's very difficult then to relax and open and see what will happen. Well, I know what, what will happen because I know what Bob's like. Is Bob like that for everyone? I don't think so. But Bob's just like that for you. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're cooking Bob the wrong way. Don't boil Bob. Because it's so interesting. And that's what we can observe, how we diminish our world. We shrink ourselves, we shrink other people in our idea of them, and then it all gets a bit grindy and becomes fricative. You know, it heats up and then you cool it down by, because you want a gap. Oh my God, I don't want to be with them. <laughs> but this is ideas, ideas about ideas about ideas. If you breathe out, then you start to experience how it is. So the function of meditation is to allow us to gradually dissolve the glue which binds us into our habit formations. Because that's where our prejudice resides, that we like this and we don't like that. And even the process of liking and not liking is maybe not so relevant because if we don't like something, we blind ourselves to it. We don't want to attend to it through the senses in any way. We don't even want to think about it. But what is it? How will I know? But I know I don't like it. So your thought, that is to say the furniture in your mind, becomes the limit of the world. Because I'm not going there. I, I just don't want it. I'm limiting myself. And I'm, the part of the reason I limit myself is because it's reassuring for me to be me. Who would I be if I didn't like some things and not like others? The ego is a, is a nexus of choice. I become myself through my choices. I wear these kind of clothes, I talk about these kind of things, I go to these kind of places. I am defining and refining the profile of myself every minute of the day as I make choices. So instead of the choice being a purely pragmatic one about what's possible in this situation with me as me and you as you, if the hidden agenda is the maintenance of my particularity, my difference, my separation, then part of rejecting is the affirmation of me. I don't like that. I don't like that. It looks as if I'm talking about that which is out there, but really the self-reflexive edge in that is I don't like that. I am confirmed as the one who doesn't like that. Oh, I love that. Talking about something out there, someone else can look at it and say, oh, I love it too. But when I say, I love it, I love it. I am the one that loves it. This is me. So the main function of these prejudices and discriminations are not about the object, it's about the subject. I am defining myself through my choices. Why do I need to be defined? Because I am empty like a mirage, like a rainbow. I am a potential, and the potential will reveal itself in the patterning of each moment. There is no continuity of the self. But I don't like that idea. I don't want to be a Buddhist. I want to be me. So we go back then to trying to confirm and consolidate what I know about myself. What I know about myself is how to limit myself. But at least I know who I am. 
So you have a sort of circular solipsistic logic that goes here. So the function of the meditation is to give us a space in which we can see the construction of ourself moment by moment. And that we don't need to do the construction. And that if we just relax and open, we are awake, we are lucid, we don't become stupid, our mind becomes more bright, and then we can engage as required in the situation. It becomes exactly empirical, pragmatic, not theoretical, not abstracted, not intentional, but with the world. And then we experience co-emergence. So then we're not lonely anymore because we're part of what's going on. Whether it's smelling a flower, a flower or looking at the sunlight through the winter trees before the buds come, there are so many things which are just themselves. And in the moment of being just with what's there, we are just here. We're just here. There's no need for any commentary about it. I don't need to say the trees are lovely. Who needs that? If anyone looking at the tree think, well, they're lovely for me. Enough. So you have the experience. You don't need the wrapper. So in the Buddhist text, when, especially in Sokshen, it talks about naked awareness. Naked awareness means unclothed. So you can observe your mind. How do you clothe your mind? What cladding do you put around it? It's usually our habit formations, our opinions, our judgments. Because we give a commentary on the world. I don't know if you've ever tried listening to a cricket commentary on the radio. You can't see the cricket match. And kind of boring. Why would you listen to that? So imagine what your own commentary is. You're commenting on a self which doesn't exist. I'm like this. I'm like that. I want to do this. I want to do that. I don't understand why they said that. Why don't they do that? Oh, oh, oh. All day long, all day long, all day long, maybe even in your dreams. <coughs> is this adding any value? Or is it restricting you? Is it a kind of muffler? So that's what we, we, that's what we can see. It's not that you have to believe in a thing. This is not a, a belief system. It's an encouragement to inquiry, to give yourself the freedom to look and to see and then you might realize that many of the things you believe in are not actually functionally true and that it's better to stay with the naked awareness, the uncovered, un unwrapped in belief systems, cultural assumptions and so on. We see, oh, the freshness of the mind. And the freshness of the mind is the freshness of the world. Because when we're relaxed and open, we receive more. Okay, let's have a short break, 20 minutes, say, and then we'll come back and do some practice. <coughs> in the uh, Nyingmapa school in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, there's a focus on the nine yanas or nine vehicles which are nine uh, ways of uh, engaging with the possibilities uh, held in the Buddha's words. And each of these can be understood in terms of view, meditation, activity, and result. And each has its own logic to it. So when we're particularly focusing on Sokshen, we have to see that uh, everything in this approach has its own flavor. It fits together and it's different from others. So, for example, in Sokshen, generally, uh, the uh, encouragement is not to try hard. Don't make effort. Now, this is very unusual because there are many kinds of meditation where you have to make effort. If you don't make any effort, you won't get anywhere. So why in Dzogchen would they say, don't make effort? Because you don't want to get anywhere. You want to be here. You're already here. Where are you? You're here. So how do you get to be here? 
by not going anywhere else. Because you are here, if you make effort, you'll go somewhere else. So don't make effort, be here. And that's why when we're sitting in the practice, although these thoughts and feelings come, we don't edit them, we don't control them, we don't try to generate more of what might be called good thoughts and reduce the number of bad thoughts. There are many meditations where that's done. That is the main focus of many Dharma paths is to cultivate virtue by diminishing the number of negative thoughts you have and increasing the number of positive thoughts. But that's not what we do in this path because the view is that from the very beginning, our mind as it is, which is an awareness, a presence, is completely pure. That is to say, it's not mixed with anything else. It's not contaminated or sullied or uh, containing residues of anything. It's just pure. Pure means it's, it's open. Um, it doesn't need to be cleaned. And this mind is fresh. Isn't it? Each moment it's completely here. We're completely available. Mind doesn't, awareness doesn't get tired. Our consciousness can get tired. Our ego self, our body can get tired. But awareness itself is always available. And as we looked before, it's naked. It's not covered with anything. Uh, if you meet someone and they say, oh, you know, tell me about yourself, then we start to give them the wrappers of ourselves. We tell them where we're from, what our hobbies are, what kind of work we do, and so on. We, we give a narrative construction. But the mind itself has no need of narrative. It is, it just is. The ego is a construct, and so it's always having to be fabricated, to be developed and given more uh, body, more kind of uh, sense of its... Uh, having a true existence. But in Sukhsin, we our focus is awareness. And this awareness has a clarity, and the clarity is what reveals everything. That's why we go outside and we see everything. Everything comes all, all at once, all at once, all the time. The world is always appearing at once. Inside that, we make our choices. So... The, the view is to uh, experience directly the integrity of the openness of the mind and the clarity of the mind and the movement of the energy within the field of clarity, which is our precise uh, shaping as this person at this time. So we find ourselves walking or talking in particular ways within the situation. That is to say, we are evoked, we're called into being in this particular form by the situation. So rather than having a sense of this is who I am and therefore this is what I have to do in order to be harmonious with the essence of me, by seeing that the ground of what I take to be me is open and empty, but not nothing at all, it's, it's unborn as we looked yesterday. It's nothing has come into existence and yet the display of experience is unceasing, which is what we experience in, the, in our clarity. And then within that, we find ourselves doing this and that. And if our activity is arising as part of the field, which is empty, it is intrinsically ethical. Because what would be the basis of harming others? When you find yourself pulled to be manipulative or me first or lying or cheating or all the many uh, limiting behaviors that people do, we see I have to have an advantage. So equanimity is not just that I'm uh, even in my attention to everyone out there, to everyone else, I'm also even in myself in relation to others. That is to say, win some, lose some. <coughs> sometimes I can be directing things, sometimes I'm directed by others. I'm not taking up a position that I have to win or I have to be dominant. What I want to is 
not to lose my presence, not to collapse into the current moment of construction, so that I'm so absorbed into it that I go into reactivity to the, the feeling tone impact, and I lose the clarity of the field that I'm in, and I lose the sense of the open emptiness where there's more potential. On Friday night, I went out with a couple of people to a restaurant, uh, quite an old-fashioned, but smart restaurant. It was very peaceful when we went in. Then a bunch of people arrived, and, and they were having a lot of cocktails, and a lot of wine, and the volume of these people started to increase. I'm thinking, where are you? They were completely oblivious to the other people in the room. They're just having a good time. Loud cackling and... What is this? Decontextualizing. We're having a good time. But what is the impact on that and other people? So that's, that's what we see with the ego, is that it's often blind to the situation. And if you have kids, you spend a lot of time reminding them that they're in the world with other people. And that you can't do that because... You're disturbing other people. But I want to do it. I know you want to do it, but you can't do it now because that will annoy them. But why, why, why do I always have to do things for others? Social being with others. So the ethics, when you start from the position of the individual who wants to assert themselves, then you have to put lots of rules and regulations in to constrain their whatever whatever we call it, narcissistic indulgence or me first desire. I want to live life on my terms. To waken them up to, hang on, you're in a, in a field, a field of experience with, that you share with others. So if you <clears throat> start with the Zokshin view, it's the openness of the mind. And in the openness of the mind, everything is arising at once. And I'm on the inside of this everythingness. So I'm starting with belonging. I, my, my starting point is, I'm here with you. Therefore, this is about us. And a subset of us is me. And a subset of us is you. But the main mood, the main modality is, <coughs> excuse me, us. So we have togetherness or integration or collaboration, and inside this collaboration we act, but we act in a collaborative field, which means as I act, as I speak, as I walk, I'm in relation to others. So what does this do? It keeps me pliable, it keeps me fresh and attentive and able to move and to respond. So these, this is called the three bodies of the Buddha. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. The relaxed, open mind, <coughs> which is empty, <coughs> is the mind of the Buddha. The field of experience is the body of enjoyment, the Sambhogakaya, in which everything is arising and is partaken of because of open access. And then moment by moment, the Nimanakaya, the uh, body of compassion, the body of linking, is that our movement is always already linked with other people. And we can see in these times of hyper-individualism and isolationism that people have more and more disregard for other people. The streets of London are filthy. People just throw their rubbish anywhere. I mean, they took away many of the dustbins because of the IRA bombing some years ago, but they haven't been replaced. And if you want to hide a bomb, there are many other places in a dustbin. So, but people just, they don't care. They just don't care. Just, nothing to do with me. I'm not going to pick it up. Someone in, lives in the street that I live in, brings his dog out for a walk, and he always makes sure that the dog shits exactly in the middle of the pavement. It's his pleasure. And he's a big scowly guy, and he looks at you. You want to fuck with me, eh? eh? dog. <laughs> so, this is just naked aggression. I don't care. And you're upset. That's good. I don't care. Fuck you. 
There's a lot of that in the way people walk down the street looking at their phones or go with the, pull their trolley baggage behind them without having a thought, this could trip someone up. So they're wandering about, waving their thing. This is inconsideration is because I'm just me. I'm just me. So there's no belonging. There's no sense that this is a shared field and it's my field because it's our field. So that's one. Again, we go back to the meditation. When we meditate in this style, we do it with our eyes open. We let the gaze rest in the space in front of us, about two arms lengths, and we hear the sounds that are around. We see people moving. Everything is included. I'm not meditating going into myself to try to sort myself out and then come back out, oh, hello world. That is not very helpful because what it does, it may make me a bit more calm, but it means <clears throat> the re-entry into the world might well be a bumpy ride and it's confirming to myself that I'm separate from you. So I'm going to sort myself out and it's up to you if you want to sort yourself out. Whereas if we're attentive to the field, I need to be relaxed and open whatever is happening. That's why doing a bit of meditation on the bus or the train or sitting in a cafe is useful. Just relax in the out breath. Here you are. The bustle's going on. Let it come. Let it go. You find you become more tolerant. I don't need to have a judgment about other people. It's just like this. So we can observe things. We can observe people being noisy in the restaurant. They don't need to get upset. It's just, oh, this is the land of the barbarians. This is how it is. So how will I be with that? I can go into reactivity. I can go into my sort of super ego position and wave the rule book at them. But the fact is, everyone's got their own rule book. And many people have burnt theirs. Or it only has one thing on it, me first. So the idea that there is a social agreement on how to behave is vanishing. When I was a child, anyone could tell me to pick something up that I had dropped. I wouldn't dare say that to a child in London. As a white man getting on in time, in years, I wouldn't dare say, you have to pick that up. What's my right? I think I'm a pedophile. Leave children alone. So children wander in this abandoned aloneness in case somebody does something harmful to them. And most of the people who would actually be quite supportive to children are kind of not allowed to intervene. So that's a very strange set of relations. So if our social formation is saying we're just these monadic, isolated individuals moving like moles down our own little tunnels of life, there's all the more reason to, to enter into this kind of practice. Because although you may not have social permission to engage with other people, if you have the sense of belonging, then you are always connected. And so you bring warmth and goodwill to the people that you meet. And you don't see them as strangers and enemies or in a paranoid way people are going to judge you or do you down or cheat you. So in that way, you keep the warmth of your sense of belonging. And if there are opportunities to connect and relate, then you can do that. So <coughs> our, our basic view <coughs> then shows us <coughs> the, the function of the meditation is to relax into the open awareness, which is inseparable from emptiness, and in that uh, optimal opening, stay with receptivity to whatever is arising. And then from that, move in the shared field of experience. So sometimes we can be very dull. Sometimes we can be stuck with some obsessional thought. Whatever is occurring in the mind, don't apply any antidote. Of course, there are many antidotes. You can say prayers, you can say mantras, you can do prostrations, you could light butter lamps. There are many things <clears throat> that you can do to shift your mood. But again, I am shifting my mood. It's, 
It's a, it's a dualistic operation. <coughs> so I'm sitting and <coughs> I feel dull. I don't know what's going on. The instruction is always simply stay present with the one who doesn't know what's going on. Wherever you find yourself located in the practice, whether you're angry about something or almost vanished or very excited or leaping into the future or the past, don't try to change it. Just be present with whatever is occurring. But I don't like it. But it seems stupid. Is this really meditation? All sorts of thoughts can arise at that time which are subtle ways of getting you to do something. Because what you're doing is you're expressing an opinion about it. So the, the, the key word in Sokshen is always direct, immediate, unmediated. Once you start thinking about things, you're mediating your experience through your conceptual framework. And so you get more elaboration of thoughts and you come to rely on thoughts as the vehicle of truth. And what we've looked at already is that thoughts are in the house of compassion. They're not in the house of wisdom. You don't find wisdom through thinking. Thinking is linking. It links you into how to be with other people. But if you want to find how you actually are yourself, thinking will not take you there. You cannot think your way to enlightenment or awakening or finding who you are because you're already here. We're here. When we sit, we're, we're sitting as ourselves. So what I need to do is to attend to myself, to allow myself to show itself. So if I keep moving... How will I be able to see something which is subtle and ungraspable? How will I get the flavor of it? I can't apprehend it because awareness in being empty in that way and open and devoid of its own contact, content is unapprehendable. You cannot get it as something. You can get your ego. You can have all kind of formulations about who you are and how you would like to be and things you'd like to change about yourself. When you're thinking about yourself, you're in the purpose of, you're in the project of ego development or criticism because you've got something to attend to because the ego formation is a conceptual structure and concepts linked to concepts and that you can think about thoughts. But awareness is not a thought and it can't be reached by thought. So... If you mobilize thoughts in order to get close to awareness, you're on a high road to nowhere. That's why we just sit. Even though the mind seems terrible, we don't know what we're doing, we're just sitting, is this really it? But if you just, again and again, very gently bring your presence here, I'm here. And then a thought comes in, yeah, but what is this? This is, why is that? That's a thought. Stay with the thought. Don't merge into it, because if you fuse into it, it will, as the thought moves, it will carry you, and you will experience yourself moving in a field of thoughts. But don't push, don't step away from it. Don't try to get rid of it. You're just present with it. So this is why we have this uh, traditional example of the mirror. The mirror is able to show all kinds of reflections, and it's not contaminated by the reflections. The reflections don't leave any trace in the mirror. And so the purity of the mirror is undefiled, even with horrible images, and it's not improved even with pleasant images. The mirror is just a mirror. The mirror is the potential for revelation and the reflection is the revelation. So in the same way, when the thoughts are arising in your mind, and it's a series of horrible thoughts, or stupid thoughts, if you pick that up 
as the truth, as the truth about you, then you're in the position of believing that the reflection is telling you the true value of the mirror. So if you put something very ugly and horrible in front of a mirror, it's now a bad mirror. You'd have to say, hang on a minute. No, come on, that's just a reflection. The reflection tells you about what it's reflecting. It doesn't tell you about the mirror. What the mirror does is offer this infinite hospitality to whatever is placed in front of it so that it can show these reflections. So in the same way, when we sit in the practice and we don't think we're making any progress or it seems awful and difficult, what's this telling you about? What's well, telling me about me? I can't meditate. Oh, but where's the mirror? Where's your mind? So as soon as you go into judgments about your meditation practice, this is a thought referring to a thought. And with that, feelings come up about feelings and so on. And so you start weaving more and more narrative about yourself, which thickens this buffer that keeps you away from your own fresh awareness, which is what is showing you the whole shebang anyway. The luminosity of the mind, the illuminating power of the mind is from awareness. It's not from thought. Thoughts and the structure of the ego are like the moon. The moon has no light of her own. The light of the sun shines on the moon, and because of that, the moon is bright. But the moon is not intrinsically bright in itself. It's the clarity of the mind which gives the seeming brightness of the thought. That's why they say, in the traditional example, that the sun is, is the image for rigpa, for awareness. And that light goes out in all directions. But if you only look at the moon, <coughs> and you think that the moon has her own light, you don't need to think about the sun. So that's how our ego functions. I'm, I'm a bright person, I can do this, I can do that, I can do that. How are you? Da, 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 da. So this is like moonlight just reflecting and reflecting and reflecting. But where does it, what's the source of the light? The source of the light is empty open awareness. How can that be? Well, look and see. It's not something you can solve as, a, as an intellectual puzzle. It's not a problem to be solved. It is a mystery that we have to live. And if we live it, we find, oh, yeah, it's like that. Just like the Buddha said, it's just like that. But you can't, you can't say it. So although when we meet together like this, you know, I talk a lot and try to explain many different things, this is uh, always a kind of a sort of preparatory easing. I'm trying to kind of massage your mind a little bit, to soften it and loosen it so that you can be kinder to yourself and be more open and trust, I can live without knowing. I don't need to always have conceptual clarity, which is moon clarity. I can have direct clarity, which is sun clarity, but I never find the sun. Just as it's not a good idea to look directly at the sun, you can't look directly at awareness. Awareness is not an object to be seen. It's a sight of the unfolding of the illumination of emptiness. So this is why we do the meditation the way we do it. It's easy enough to manipulate your mind and change the content of your mind. You can say prayers, you can say, make aspirations, may all beings be happy and have the root of happiness and so on. You can fill your mind with healthy, happy thoughts and that's nice. And they'll be there for a while. And then they'll vanish, because all, always thoughts are impermanent. But if you want to find an awakening which continues by itself, you have to go to that which is already awake. So from this point of view of the Dzogchen path, you're not moving towards Buddhahood. You're not trying to uh, develop your enlightened self. The light is already on. The light of the mind is the light that illuminates every aspect of our existence. We're always in the light of the Buddha mind, but we don't see that. That's why it's called ignorance, ignoring. We ignore how it is and imagine 
how it is not, but we imagine how it is not is how it is. And if you imagine that something is false, is true, then how will you ever work out what is true? Because you've already deceived yourself. You're living a lie. So, the moon is very bright. The moon gives so much light. Yeah, that's because she nicks it from her brother, the sun. It's not hers. She's passing it on. It's easy to give things that don't belong to you. It doesn't cost her anything. The sun's burning itself up. <laughs> and the moon's just, hi, hi. <laughs> so, we have to look. What is the source? What is the ground? So in Dzogchen, there are a lot, a lot of uh, writing about the ground. The ground is emptiness. And, but it's not empty, empty. It's not a nihilistic nothing, nothing. It's the emptiness which is the potential of everything and that everything is revealed through our awareness. Only awareness reveals the open potential. The ego cannot do that. The ego reveals the karmic potential that we have constellated in this life, encouraged by our family, our age, the kind of school we went to and so on. It's a very small bit of who we are. And if you stay inside the ego domain, you remain limited and small. But the more you relax and you allow things to happen, you're being opened up and opened up and opened up. And you think, oh, everything comes. I am us. I am us. I'm not me. I am me, but I'm me as part of us. Usness, belonging, openness, connectivity is how it is. Not isolation and being locked in oneself. Okay, let's do a little more sitting. <laughs>
So one of the, the things that we should always try to do is to avoid hubris, to inv- avoid an inflated notion of who we are, and to stay humble and connected. Because if you inflate yourself and you rise above the situation and you start to believe in your mastery or the complete value of your unique perception, you are alienating yourself from the field. It's, ethics is in the field. It's our connectivity. And in that, the more finely attuned we are and the less preoccupied we are, probably our spontaneity and intuition will be on the pulse. We'll, we'll be there in, in that. But if it's a bit off, we can say that. No moment is the final moment. It's unceasing, unborn and unceasing. So, oh, why did I do that? Due to causes and conditions. It doesn't mean that you let yourself off the hook and say, well, anything goes, but punishing yourself is not going to help. Apologizing is better than punishing yourself. Blaming yourself, what do you learn from that? You can sit down and review, how did this occur? Oh, we'll probably find it was because I was distracted and preoccupied. And the more, that's then an encouragement to relax and open and receive and respond, receive and respond. So if we want to maintain equanimity, we have to be kind and tender to ourselves and kind and tender to other people. When we looked at that uh, term in the door to liberation, being without hope, it also means like without expectations. Because if you have expectations, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. So a lot of the time, well, you need to, well, I'm going to go for the train and I expect the train should come roughly on time, which is, that's a reasonable kind of uh, expectation. But to expect people to be in a particular way or to respond to what we want to do in a particular way is unrealistic. It's out of kilter with how things actually come. So when you have an expectation, if you, if you observe this in yourself, you, what you're doing is you're having a pre-formation. You're coming into a formation ahead of the event. You're taking up a position because this is what should be happening. You probably have very little power to enforce your notion of what should be happening. And so you have a reaction against the world because the world is rebuffing your wonderful plan or your reasonable idea about how things should be. So if we relax expectation and we bring our attention to the phenomena, not our idea about the phenomena, but the phenomena themselves, then we have to cook quick and fresh into the moment. There is no freezer. The freezer is where your karma is kept. You've been storing it up for a long time. In the moment, in connection with others, you have fresh ingredients. So if you link into the world, this is how it is. This is what I have to work with. So you're connected and you're fresh and activity is, is flowing through you. This is the nirmanakaya, the flow of energy into the world. In the manner of a dream. The Tibetan word for nimanakaya is uh, trupiku, and trupa is a, a word which links to words of, of magic, of illusory nature. We are apparitional. So when we take ourselves very seriously and we have a consolidated sense of ourselves, we are going for the security of the earth element. But what Sokshem would encourage us to do is go the other way and find the stability of space so that we are relaxed and open. And then from that space, the moving elements go come through, and from time to time, things will be just this. The the absolute precision of the moment, that its unique specificity of being this and not that, that's the earth element. It's concrete. We use concrete for buildings, but when we say, describe something as being concrete, we mean it is this and not that. It is uniquely this. So moment by moment, they have a formation and then dissolving, and formation and dissolving, formation and dissolving. And this is happening in space. So if we want to come into the alignment with what's occurring, we have to be there. And if we've leapt into the future, we're not here. 
And if we're worried about the past, we're not here. This Buddhist and Hindu notion of karma <coughs> excuse me, is uh, it's clearly linked to activity. The word karma means action. But in particular, it means action within the reified field. I am going to do this. I want to help you or I want to harm you. You exist, I exist, and I'm going to adapt, uh, adopt rather, a, a mobilization pattern towards you on the basis of my desire. So the basis of all karma is ignorance. It arises from the dualistic notion, self and other are separate, and therefore I can act to benefit you or to harm you. I have these two possibilities. I can see you as a friend or an enemy. And we go back to the four immeasurable thoughts. You know, may we all develop the equanimity which is free of bias in favor of friends and against enemies. So if we want to maintain this even attitude to everything, conceptualizing other people, developing mental formations about them, obscures the possibility of the moment. The, the moment is emergent. How you will be, if we ever meet again, how you will be is something I can't know and you can't know. If I come back here, some people may have been in hospital, some people may have been on a world cruise. All kind of things could be happening. Some people might become grandparents and be happy. Some people might be getting a shitty diagnosis. All kind of things can be happening. How you will be is how you will be. That's how it will be. So moment by moment, it's how it is, how it is, how it is. So if we want to be in touch with that, which would be the true ethics, of me not covering you in my imagination about you, but allowing you to reveal yourself to me so that I can respond to you, my mind being relaxed would be better. So karma begins when you don't have that relaxed openness, but you have the dualistic perception of I'm here and you're there, and I want to get this from you, or I want to give this to you. Then I plan the action, I carry out the action, and then I review it and think, I'm glad I did that. Then you have the four factors of karma operating there, which means I have identified myself as an isolated individual. I have acted on the environment around me, and I'm happy with the result, or I'm at one with the result. So what that does is it consolidates the delusion of being a separate entity and being an agent, one who acts, one who acts on truly existing beings other than yourself. So there's a solidification in there of the pattern. You have pattern densification. It becomes more opaque, more fixed, especially with the conclusion. I'm glad I stole that from you. I'm really glad. is now something quite solid. So spending my whole life behaving in these solidified relations of winning and losing, always checking out what's my advantage, what's my disadvantage, leads me into a particular perception of the world. We know that being born in the human body, as with many other creatures, we have these root orientations uh, which are sex and death, sex and killing. Well, that's what preoccupies most uh, animals. Uh, the wish for uh, copulation, the wish for closeness to another, so for, pre for creativity, and the wish to eat something else, to destroy it for my own purposes. So we have eros and thanatos, life and death. Life and death is like winning and losing, gaining, and losing. When we lose, a bit of us dies because my hopes are not being fulfilled. If we want to relax out of that and the field of karma, 
simply spending a lot of time regretting what you've done is a very slow path to doing that. There are many, many different kinds of purification through Vajrasattva. You can do pilgrimages, you can make reparation in the world, you can decide to dedicate your life to benefiting others. But the key point is the first starting point of karma is the perception of the inherent existence of self and other. I'm here, you're there, I'm me, and you are you. And on the basis of that, we, we get the arising of desire and aversion, the, the, the reification, the solidification is the first point because that's the, the mental darkness, the uh, stupidity or the dullness which doesn't realize that I am the emergence of the radiance of emptiness instead of which I'm me and I want what you've got so I'm going to take that. So as soon as you have duality, the, the urge for winning and losing for the eight worldly concerns, gain and loss, fame and notoriety and so on, is very, very strong. It happens instantly. We're just carried away by something. So if we want to stop the flow of karma, the key thing is to not enter into this solidification of subject and object. So we relax and open, and then subject and object arise in the manner of a dream, like waves on the surface of the ocean, going up and down, ever pulsating and moving and pulsating and moving. This is why the manifestation of the Buddha into the world is like an apparition. It's arising like this according to circumstances. It's not driven by an internal defined essence, because the essence of all things is emptiness. And because everything shares the essence of emptiness, they, there is no individual essence. And if there's no individual essence, then what is, what is the special meanness of me that requires that I have to have victory over you, that I have to win, me first? So if everything's arising, whether it's you first or me first, if, if we're in some kind of reasonable exchange, it will move. Like in a conversation, I speak, you speak, I speak, you speak. It just goes on and on and on. And that's a, a healthy pulsation. We give and we receive. We breathe in, we breathe out. The heart systolic, diastolic. Boom, 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 boom. Everything is pulsing in that way. And when the pulsation is reasonably balanced, then the breathing is okay and the heart is in a healthy condition. But when you take up a position, me first, then you break the pulsation, the, the responsive connectivity between people. This, this one here has to be privileged over you guys, because I'm me. So if we want to step out of that, the key thing is to do the practice. Don't struggle with yourself, don't try to improve yourself, but enter into the practice, relax and release. Relax and release. Release your involvement in the thought. Release your sense that your template that you use for evaluation, for the attribution of worth as a basis for decision making, release that template. It's just something you picked up in your family, in your school. If you were born in a different time, you would have a different frame of reference. It's just a transient set of values which is culturally determined, it has no intrinsic truth. So we just relax that. Okay, so how will I make sense of what's going on? Don't make sense of what's going on. But how will if I know if I'm making any progress? Where are you going to? You want to go somewhere and you don't even know where you are. We're here. Let's be here. If you're here and you really think, this is shit, I want to go somewhere else, fair enough. But if you don't know where you are here, how are you going to get there? I want to buy a ticket for London. Where are you? I don't know. Well, I can't sell you a ticket. <laughs> You've got to be where you are. So that's the whole purpose of the practice. Being here, relaxing, opening, and then gradually the constraints, the, the karmic patterns, the, the formations that feel like me, we start to see as ingredients. They're just like ingredients on the shelf. We don't have to pop them into every meal. You add marjoram if you need marjoram. If you don't need it, you don't add it. So nice to have marjoram in the kitchen, as required. 
So instead of having a fixed repertoire that you enact in order to maintain your own identity, you become aware of the portfolio of your possibilities and you allow them to arise in interaction within the field of emergence. Then life becomes easy. Okay, we're almost at our time, so we do a final sitting. The circle of us is limitless. It includes all sentient beings, all the beings in the different realms. So whatever merit has come from our study and practice together, we share with all beings. Now our time together comes to an end. So due to Gareth and Charles, we have recordings available. If you want to listen to any of it again or invite your friends or any people you know to listen. And uh, so our study and practice continues. It's our way of being, our way of being alive. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you. The People in the background who organize the events do it so sweetly and charmingly, uh, without effort, without any politics, as far as I can tell anyway. <laughs> but it's, it's a very lovely experience to be here. So thank you for coming and your participation, because the quality of your engagement facilitates whatever it is that I'm doing. So perhaps we meet again, perhaps not.